tragic alert for you right now. An incredible plane crash into the World Trade Center here at the uh, lower tip of Manhattan. It's believed a 737 has crashed into this speculation at this point, but at least three floors taken out, crashed into the side of the building. Joining us right now, uh, one of the producers with Fox Report, Owen Mugan on the scene. Owen, what do you know? What do you see? Where are you? Yeah, Brian, I'm on the roof of my building, which is about five blocks to the south of the World Trade Center. I'm looking, I'm looking right now at the World Trade Center. There's a massive gaping hole uh, on the second tower. It's about uh, about 15 stories from the roof. Uh, it's it's just unbelievable to look at. There's a right. massive hole. There, in it, it looks like something out of a movie. There is a huge Hello. hole in the side of Tower Number One. Tower uh, One. Owen, your your apartment is just a few blocks from it. Did you hear anything? I was lying in bed. Uh, all of a sudden, I heard what sounded like. Uh, a plane or something coming extremely low, and then we just heard this shattering explosion. I ran up to the roof and confronted by this right. horror. There's a gaping hole. I can see the south face, and uh, there are flames. There are papers flying out of the windows, black flames. There are, there are uh, flames coming out of multiple floors. Did it, did it sound like a, uh, there is one report on one news channel here in New York City that perhaps it was a jet, perhaps a 737. When you heard the noise, did it sound like a, a prop job or a jet? It, it sounded like a jet, but from, from where I was, uh, I just couldn't tell. All I know is that there was something flying through the air, and then this massive impact was oh, prop, oh. whether it was a jet, I just don't know. Listening to you right now, I hear a lot of, uh, a lot of sirens. Is that what you're hearing right now? I mean, yeah, is I'm going to move to the, uh, to the front of my which will... Uh, yeah, you can just see it right now. You can see uh, emergency vehicles tearing mm -hmm. south on the west side highway it's heading towards the scene. Uh, there are tons of people in the streets. There's, there are papers, things fluttering out. Uh, I can't see any evidence of what it was that could have crashed. Uh, well, all I can see is just this massive gaping hole with tons of black smoke going out, falling out of the building. Owen, we, yeah. we, we have a satellite picture right, right now. There. That is that is it. Oh, a live it, picture. As you can see, you e, this is different. This is a different perspective than we saw earlier. The plane obviously went in on one side and came out the other. There's debris all over the Early's ground broke down through below. On part. Yeah, exactly. And as you can see, uh, it affects perhaps 10 floors yes. of the uh, World Trade Center building. It is uh, over 100 stories tall. It is the tallest structure in New York City. It is near the flight path for uh, Newark. Right. And many times, whenever people for Newark, Kennedy, or or LaGuardia, uh, when those when those planes are put into uh, rotation as they're waiting for landing, they circle around this area, which is right near the Statue of Liberty. Um, it is almost nine o'clock here on the East Coast, and let me tell you, folks are in that building early, and without a doubt, there are many people who were impacted by this. It's speculated that the plane is as big as a 737. It looked originally like it, it just hit three floors. As I see from this angle, it seems like more than three floors, and perhaps what's oh, most yeah. disturbing, Edie, I think, is the time of day. This this time of morning is when people pour fall. into that building, and yeah. it, it, it's usually next to full. Well, you got to also remember, this is uh, near the financial district uh, on the tip of Manhattan. There are so many people at this hour who are in that neighborhood. And uh, aside from the people who are in the building, remember, this is a huge structure, 10.5 million square feet the World Trade Center's uh, take up. And as you can see from perspective, there goes a helicopter right by it. And uh, it obviously impacted one side and uh, wound up uh, affecting perhaps the other side. We do know there is debris all over the floor, down uh, the, the pavement down below. As uh, and crews are, uh, they've got uh, all the police and the fire department and the emergency technicians are headed to that area. This is horrible. And also, when you think about what happened to the World Trade Center before, uh, the, with the bombing there and the chaos that surrounded it, this is a much different challenge, right. just as grave. And, and also, uh, from one of our perspectives, we can see that not only uh, are there gaping holes, but uh, debris continues to fall down below at this hour. As you can see, this is a story of, uh, enor of, of, of enormous magnitude. Oh, my gosh. And uh, you, we will have all the latest right here on Fox News. Right now, let's hand it over to John Scott. John. All right, Steve Ducey, thanks very much. We will, we will continue to keep an eye on this developing story. All we can do is stare aghast at these pictures at this point.
You are looking at the uh, north building of the Twin Towers of the World Trade Center in Manhattan. These are coming to you live now. Debris raining down from 110 floors up, the, the uppermost floor, 110 floors up. There are reports that a twin engine plane slammed into the side of the World Trade Center. Now, something like this has happened before. Back in World War II, an army bomber lost in the fog slammed into the upper floors of the Empire State Building. The crew of that plane was killed, but that was an accident. It happened in fog. As you can see, this is a clear blue sky day in Manhattan. If this was an accident, it would be a needle in a haystack kind of accident. Uh, one has to believe that this was deliberate, although as we are uh, just looking at these pictures, um, the investigation is, is not even beginning yet. They are right now uh, trying to get the, um, the injured people uh, evacuated from those upper floors. But you can imagine this is a, a chaotic scene. Remember the bombing uh, back in 1989 of the World Trade Center. That was in a more or less subterranean garage. That was an attempt. Again, we're talking about 1989 now. That was an attempt to bring down the building by knocking out the support pillars. What was intended here is anyone's guess at this point. It may have been simply a suicidal pilot who wanted to make a, a point. We don't know. But uh, you can see that uh, the upper floors of the North Tower of the World Trade Center, once the tallest building in the world, very much involved in smoke and flame after a report, a report of a plane crashing into the side of the building. We have on the phone with us Dr. Vernon Gross. He's a former investigator with the National Transportation Safety Board. Uh, Dr. Gross, have you ever seen anything like this? Well, I haven't, but I'm old enough to have remembered the B-25 crashing into the Empire State Building, you know, in uh, World War II. That, as we've said, was a, a fog. That was an accident, wasn't it? Uh, fog it, uh, obscured the pilot's vision? Yes, it was uh, definitely an accident. Can you think of any reason for a pilot to slam into a building of this height on a day like today if it wasn't intentional? Well, it could have been uh, some inattention. I, I wouldn't rule that out. In other words, he might have had difficulty, he might have had engine failure, he might have been with his head down in the cockpit instead of looking where he was going. And it depends also on the angle of the sun, for example. Uh, was he flying east when he hit? I don't know because I can't see the pictures. Even for light planes, there is a traffic way up the Hudson River, not very far uh, from, from these buildings, isn't there? Oh, yes. Uh, the buildings are close to the river. And furthermore, if you've got three major airports in the area, LaGuardia, Newark, and JFK, and it's the busiest air corridor in the world from that point of view. So he, he could have been confused. And there are some height limitations. In other words, the, the planes that fly by there, I'm talking about personal aircraft, light aircraft, and even some, I guess, commercial aircraft. I know that I've returned to the city from time to time and come in uh, at about, uh, uh, at a height about level with the top of the building there. Well, certainly, and you have a lot of helicopter operations uh, in that area down at that low altitude. So is it, is it in your view, um, this could have been an accident. It, it, we're not necessarily talking about a deliberate, a deliberate act here. I wouldn't think so immediately at all. Uh, you've got to find out why he crashed. And if, obviously, if it's a deliberate terrorist act, then there'll be a message probably from somebody taking credit for it. But right now, it sounds as though the early morning sun, we've had drivers and, and cars get blinded, you know, by the sun. You could have aircraft trouble. Um, so he, he could be distracted. Uh, there's a number of reasons why the, the aircraft might hit the building. Eyewitnesses are saying it was a small commuter plane. Um, again, these early uh, reports are just coming in now from the wire services. A small commuter plane apparently hitting the side of the World Trade Center. Uh, happened, oh, just a, just a few minutes ago, but you can see the smoke. Uh, the smoke tower is growing. Uh, there is uh, quite a bit of flame inside the building. Uh, the two towers are um, home, at least during the day, to upwards of 50,000 workers.
yes, in I those 220 that. floors. Right. Um, I am reminded of a couple of things that happened recently, Dr. Gross. Not long ago, uh, just a couple of, within the last couple of weeks, in fact, uh, there was a pilot who flew. There was another one. We just saw, we just saw another one. We just saw another one apparently go, another plane just flew what? into the second tower. This raises, this has to be deliberate, folks. Well, that would begin to say that, yeah. We just saw on live television as a second plane flew into the second tower of the World Trade Center. Now, given what has been going on around the world, um, some, of the, some of the key suspects come to mind, Osama bin Laden, who knows, who knows what? Eric Sean is with us. Eric, I know you have a lot of sources at the FBI and other agencies like that. What can you tell us? Well, first, I apologize for being out of breath because I was walking down Fifth Avenue, uh, which is close to our studios, and I heard a, uh, a jet, uh, perhaps a 737 or a small Airbus, uh, flying low, unusually low over Fifth Avenue, making a right. I'm not going to say, that I don't know, I don't have any reports on what type of plane hit the World Trade Center, but people looked up and it made a, a right toward the, uh, toward the building. John, what we just saw, though, obviously, uh, if that indeed was a second aircraft that hit the, uh, the uh, southern tower of the World Trade Center, that obviously raises the specter of, uh, of an intentional uh, terrorist attack uh, here, if, we're, if that is indeed what we are looking at. Uh, I don't know what the reports say of what type of plane hit, hit the, uh, the tower, but I did see a, a jet airliner that was fairly low. It was unusual, although not unusual in air traffic patterns, because airplanes uh, that fly to LaGuardia often are vectored down south straight over Manhattan, but of course at uh, an altitude that is uh, far above uh, the buildings, clearly, and that the avenue, if you look down Fifth Avenue, oftentimes you see planes, especially the ones from the north, uh, coming down before they vector on a, uh, on a left turn to go up into uh, uh, 13 to 31 or 422, the uh, two runways uh, up at LaGuardia. But clearly this is tremendously disturbing if indeed that explosion that we just saw on television is indeed a, 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 another airplane. This raises the possibility that is this an intentional attack, uh, a terrorist attack. As we know, the uh, World Trade Center was bombed in the garage back in the uh, in the early 90s. We're, we're going to cut away from the live pictures for just a moment to replay uh, what just happened. And I thought when, when it first happened, I thought it was a replay, but in fact, we saw this live perhaps two minutes ago. Look at that. A jet plane, clearly a jet plane, a good-sized airplane slamming into the second tower of the World Trade Center. This after a report of another plane slamming into the North Tower both towers now in flames. We have reports of at least six people killed, 1,000 injured, and clearly those numbers are going to go up. Bill Stokes is on the phone with us. He is an eyewitness to what happened. Bill, we just saw the video of the, uh, the plane hitting the second tower. What did you see? Well, I got to correct you and say I wasn't exactly an eyewitness. However, I was an ear witness. Um, I live on Thompson Street in the village, which looks directly down to the two towers. I was sitting at my desk by the window here working and heard an abnormally low flying plane come right down the street practically and then followed by a loud bang. People rushed from the apartments onto the street. I've never seen anything like it. Um, everybody's a little freaked out here. With good reason. And. Uh, uh, there's a sanitation worker that was picking up garbage that, that actually saw the plane fly down that street over Soho, and he saw it hit. And my question to him immediately was, thinking that this could be a missile, I said, was it a plane or a, was it a small missile? He said, no, it was definitely a plane, and it seemed like a large plane. Well, we, uh, s we saw a large plane hit the second tower. Um, minutes after the, the first tower was engulfed in flames. We're going to look at it again. This, look at the lower part of your screen. There is clearly a jet, a twin-engine jet, slamming into one side, and then the, the fireball, the debris, raining out the far side of the south tower of the World Trade Center. Now, Erica, I am reminded again of what 
happened back in 1989, the intent, the intent of those terrorists back then was to actually bring down the tower, wasn't it? Yes, and I would obviously think if anyone is in there, they've got to get out immediately, I would imagine. Uh, what we just saw was a twin engine, it appeared to be a twin engine jetliner. You've got several makes. It could be a, uh, a 737, uh, perhaps it, it looked it's kind of large, so it could be a 737-800, which is the newest generation of uh, airliners. I think the question is, where does that airliner come from? They're expensive. Was it hijacked? Uh, do we know where it came from? Uh, were there any markings? Were they, uh, are these intentional pilots uh, who are uh, kamikaze pilots uh, executing this kamikaze attack into the World Trade Center? Were they stolen? Are they small Airbuses? Those are flown by U.S. Air. Uh, the uh, 737-800s are flown by the Delta shuttle that goes from LaGuardia to New York. Uh, you've got the one that I saw going down Fifth Avenue before it made a turn looked very white. Now that could theoretically indicate it would be a Delta shuttle. I'm not saying it is, folks. I don't want to alarm people. Also, Air Canada flies uh, those t uh, uh, twin engine uh, air small, smaller Airbuses down from uh, Montreal and down from Toronto. So I think one of the first things investigators have got to start to uh, do right now is find out where these planes are from, who is flying them, are there any more coming, uh, and what can they do to any intercept any others if there are. I imagine that there has got to be a, uh, a ground hold right now at all the airports in the New York area, as well as a freeze in the air traffic center of all the uh, aircraft are around the New York metropolitan area. And if there, is a, if there are any other air airplanes coming, uh, perhaps uh, the Air National Guard or others uh, will have to start dealing with this and in the air. Maybe they've already scrambled uh, uh, at the moment as we speak. So I think clearly, judging by the pictures that we've seen, sadly, horribly, uh, what we've uh, long feared and many have worried about and thought could never happen would be a terrorist attack, uh, a deliberate terrorist attack on the World Trade Center, uh, as we are witnessing right now. Not obviously the accident that happened with the Empire State Building uh, back in the 1940s, 1945, a, a B-7, a B-24. B-25. Uh, it, yeah, 25, hit the Empire State Building by accident when he had descended through clouds trying to go to Newark. Uh, this that, is clearly that, deliberate. That chilling, chilling, horrible scene that we just saw, uh, I think, is attack, uh, not just in the World Trade Center, but at the very soul and the very heart uh, of our nation, John. Kai, Kai Simonson is in the WNYW chopper and has perhaps the best view of this. Let's listen into Kai's narration now. If it indeed were two planes, we did see one. How did they manage? to get into the area and, and to, to you just You wonder, the these, uh, like these are all they the things the that we're going to have to be, that are going to have to be answered. How could, uh, how could two mm. uh, large planes uh, just that quickly uh, get out of, uh, out of uh, control from our local world? Presumably commercial aircraft. Now we can't speak to the first one, but that second aircraft that- To, to answer that question like that is being raised, how could two aircraft get in there so close well if uh, if two pilots want to take their planes anywhere uh you know it's it's a free country and uh we don't have anti-aircraft guns on our skyscrapers i mean it it's a matter of seconds literally for a jetliner to get from newark airport to the world trade center a jetliner at fu at full speed could cover that distance in a minute or two so a couple of uh, a couple of pilots bent on destruction and clearly these were could do something like this now again folks we have to remind you fifty thousand people work in these buildings each and every day it happened right at nine a m a good number of those folks were already at their desks uh... the death toll is certainly going to be tremendous in this uh, tragedy here and that's all that we can say about it it is a tragedy it is abhorrent it is disgusting, but John, I, you have to, I, I, I'm, you know, wondering: Are these pilots terrorists themselves? Uh, are they? Uh, are, is, are there terrorists in the cockpit who are holding guns to a pilot's head? Did they? Uh, I, I shoot can't the imagine. You can, you can speculate uh, completely about how this happens, because obviously it takes uh, a lot of training and expertise to fly a uh, complicated, sophisticated uh, aircraft, whether it's a Boeing 737 or a smaller Airbus. These are not uh, little Cessnas and little Pipers. So uh, there is a, you have, have to wonder and raise the, what possibility there is with the type of scenario that was going on in the cockpit. All right, they, they are intent, whether it's the pilots or if they're hijackers, uh, it, intentionally doing this. A lot of questions still to be answered. Let's listen in again to right, Kai Simonson from the Fox 5 running. Chopper. Uh, the fire department and emergency services can handle both in that confined space. 
uh, without a tremendous no death matter toll. how much you set in place, how much you try to prepare for, until it actually happens, it's just not the same thing. Again, you're looking at a live picture of the World Trade Center, where uh, shortly before 9 o'clock, shortly before 9 o'clock this morning, and then shortly after 9 o'clock, uh, planes apparently deliberately crashed into the uh, buildings. Alani, DeVito, are you there? Alani, DeVito, are you there? I understand we have uh, another eyewitness uh, uh, to this catastrophe. Uh, Lonnie DeVito, are you there? Uh, apparently, uh, we lost Lonnie, this, but again... This may be confusing to some people, because in a sense, it is a little confusing to me. We, every now and then, see what looks like, I don't know if it's the bottom of a chopper that is swinging back and oh, forth. That would, is be, that? that would be our... That our, is ours. That would be okay. uh, the, uh, the rudders mm -hmm. from, uh, from our chopper oh, every once in a while. Hey, Jim. Lonnie DeVito, I, are you there? I am here. Can you hear me? Yes, I can, Lonnie. Thank Hi. you. This is Jim Ryan in the in the studio. Can you tell us what you heard and saw when the when the um, blast took place? Right now, I was actually talking my, to, talking to my brother on the phone about what happened. I I was on my roof and I saw something. From where I am, I really can't see what it is. I saw something go into into the other building because from where I am, I could see the World Trade Center. I co I run downstairs and I see on the news that it, it looks like another fighter jet is what it looks like. And from my house, I can see all the smoke that's into into Diker Heights. I can see all of that. It's ridiculous. I can't believe all of this is happening, honestly. You say you're in Di Diker Heights, yes. uh, Lonnie? Yes. Okay. And could you hear the blast from where you were? No, I couldn't hear the blast, but I, I saw something, and it didn't look pretty. <laughs> exactly how I can, I can explain it in any other way. I'm in shock right now. All right, you are looking at uh, live pictures, folks. This is coming to you from the southern end of Manhattan, the World Trade Center, both towers in flames, apparently hit by two separate jetliners. The FBI is now checking out reports of a hijacking just before uh, this uh, terrible, terrible incident occurred. It happened. The first one uh, was hit just before 9 this morning. The second one hit uh, a couple of minutes after nine. Uh, John Hires is an eyewitness to all of this, is on the phone with us. John, what did you see? John Hires. John, are you with us? All right, we lost John Hires. Uh, we have another view now of that plane slamming into the second building. Look at it, it's coming in from the side, coming low, hitting the building about in the middle folks uh, you see the pictures it looks like Hollywood but this is real uh, the reports are again these are very unconfirmed we're trying to be responsible with what we bring you here but the reports of a hijacking of a plane coming into the FBI a hijacking of a plane shortly before this incident took place now you can imagine if a couple of trained pilots and this would not be beyond the reach of uh, many terrorist organizations around the world. A couple of plane, uh, trained pilots were to take control of one of these sophisticated jetliners. Once they're in the air, folks, they are easy to fly. And uh, you disengage the autopilot, you can take that plane anywhere you want to go. 50,000 people or so working in those two buildings, and both now have been struck by airliners. Our Wendell Gohler is at the White House, uh, rather, make that Sarasota. He is traveling with the president. Wendell Gohler, what's the reaction uh, from uh, the president? John, the president is here uh, promoting a reading initiative on the uh, second day of a two-day trip to Florida. He just finished uh, reading to some children at the Emma Booker Elementary School and was asked uh, about the incident. He said he was aware of it and that he... Uh, uh, would have something to say about it later. His aides have been scrambling for the past 15 or 20 minutes, uh, uh, both to find out what is happening and to keep the president briefed as well. Mr. Bush is scheduled to address the school here and then return to the White House later in the day uh, for uh, a congressional barbecue at the White House. Uh, one must imagine uh, that he may be going home a little earlier than scheduled and that the, the barbecue, if it is held, will be a very somber affair. 
Uh, Secret Service agents are, are also watching the, the video uh, on, on Fox and other television networks. Uh, all uh, sense that this may well be a, a terrorist uh, incident of some kind and something that will uh, certainly uh, uh, draw the president's involvement. We've got a, a report from the FBI that uh, a 737 was hijacked uh, very shortly before the, uh, the second plane uh, uh, flew into the, uh, the other uh, World uh, Trade Center tower. And uh, as you can aware, the president uh, uh, who travels with uh, secure communication uh, to his national security staff uh, is being briefed of, uh, about this uh, even as we speak. John? All right, Wendell Gohler, thanks very much. Uh... Again, the, uh, the reports are preliminary, uh, and they are as awful as the pictures that you are seeing there on your screen, perhaps even more so, because it raises the prospect. Uh, take a look now. This tape is from earlier, as you see the second jetliner, and we don't have an identification on that jetliner yet, but you see that jetliner slamming into the second tower of the World Trade Center about a couple of minutes after nine o'clock. The New York Stock Exchange is being evacuated. This is going to cause a great deal of chaos in financial markets worldwide, uh, to say nothing of the, the absolutely certain loss of life. Uh, we have a report of, of six people dead and a thousand injured, but those numbers are certainly going to go up. The, 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 alf, the also um, awful part of this is if there was in fact a hijacking one doesn't know how many people may have been on board one or both planes if in fact they were hijacked eric the question is perhaps were they in the air and hijacked or did they come from canada i want to just uh point out that there was a the, the plane that we just saw that crashed into a, into the world trade center uh, it could be a 737 it could be a, one of the smaller airbuses that are twin engines that are flown by air canada and uh, they they obviously came down from the north uh, does that mean they came from Canada? No. But uh, let me just start raising some speculation uh, as responsibly as I possibly can. Uh, you know, we don't know what the security arrangements are in, in every airport around the country. Uh, were these planes that happened to be uh, parked on the tarmac? Were they in maintenance? Were they uh, already uh, on the ground in a taxiway in some uh, airport uh, before they, they hit? I did see one plane go down Fifth Avenue very low before it banked right toward the World Trade Center. That plane, what my initial thought was that it was a, uh, a smaller Airbus, but uh, uh, definitely a commercial plane, just like the one, the second one that we just saw hit the World Trade Center in that video. Technique. Mark Burnback, a Fox employee, is on the phone with us. Uh, Mark uh, witnessed this from what we understand. Mark, were you close enough to be able to see any markings on, on the airplane? Uh, hi, gentlemen. How are you doing? Yeah, there was, um, there was definitely a blue logo. It was like a circular logo on the front of the plane uh, towards the, uh, yeah, definitely towards the front. Um, it definitely did not look like a commercial plane. I didn't see any windows on the sides. And as far as I knew, when I saw it coming down, I was like, well, LaGuardia is pretty far away, and that plane is really slow and uh, definitely very low. And um, I'm completely panicked. I'm <laughs> you're freaking out. I can't well, believe what I just saw. We are all shaken by this. We are uh, watching the video now back live. Uh, but the upper floors of the World Trade Center in Manhattan in flames now after apparently two large airplanes, we're talking about jet, jet liners here, slammed into the sides right around 9 o'clock this morning. Mark, if what you say is true, those could be cargo planes or something like that. You said you didn't see any windows in the side? I didn't see any windows in the sides. I saw the plane flying low. I was probably like a block away from the subway in Brooklyn, and that plane came down very low. And again, there was, it, it was not a normal flight that I've ever seen at an airport. It was a plane that had a blue uh, logo on the front, and it just it did not look like it belonged in this area, to be All frankly right. about it. I mean, that's not an accident, keep in my in, personal opinion. Keep in, keep, all right, let's, uh, let's bring in uh, David Lee Miller, our correspondent. Uh, he has uh, an eyewitness with him. David Lee, what can you tell us? Good morning, John. I'm a few blocks from the World Trade Center right now. As you would expect, all the roadways are pretty much cut off. The only way to get near the buildings is on foot right now. Uh, the scene is absolutely a horrific one. You have people streaming out of the area. You've got people literally in tears and shock. People that just worked in the nearby buildings that cannot believe what has happened. Still many of them remember the uh, terrorist attack years ago on the World Trade Center. And for many of them, this is just an ugly reminder of that, although the details of what happened here are 
not certain. As I was walking downtown in lower Manhattan, making my way to the uh, World Trade Centers, I stopped to speak to Sylvia Fuentes. She's with me right now. We're a few blocks away from the building. She works in lower Manhattan. She used to work in the Trade Center. And uh, I'm going to actually hand her the telephone right now, and she's going to describe for us what she saw this morning as uh, she was arriving at work. Sylvia? Mitch, Hi, yes. Sean. Hi, Sylvia. Yes, Sylvia, I, go ahead. Can you hear I me? was at the deli on Fulton Street, and I heard a loud rumbling. And when I walked out of the deli on Fulton Street, I looked up in the air, and there was an airplane actually going into the World Trade Center, and flames were coming out, and smoke was just billowing in the air, and tons of people were running down Fulton Street, just running each other over. And I made my way back to my office on Water Street, and when I got upstairs, I looked out my window to see what was going on, and the Second World Trade Center just went into flames just at, from one minute to the next. Sylvia, thanks for that eyewitness report. And uh, once again, David Lee Miller is uh, on the phone with us. David? I'm sorry, Joe, I didn't hear you. Well, I just wanted to, I wanted to thank you for that uh, report and for that eyewitness uh, account you know, of what happened. John, I think it's important to, to keep in mind this morning that in just getting information out is a difficult thing at this time because there are people running through the streets with their cell phones in hand, many like myself, who are unable to actually uh, get through on the cell system. It is overloaded, and the only way for most people to communicate right now is to, is to find a, a regular telephone line because they're, they're just literally thousands of people streaming through the streets, all of them uh, not knowing what to do or what has happened here. Right. All right, David Lee Miller, thanks very much. I want to bring into the discussion William Daly. He is a former FBI agent. Uh, Bill, there are reports uh, that the FBI is looking into the possibility of a plane hijacking. Um, when you look at these buildings, these buildings are the symbols of capitalism to enemies of America, aren't they? Absolutely, John. I mean, these, have, as, as we know, were the target of the terrorist attack uh, in this last decade. And uh, uh, by comparison, uh, that explosion, as horrific as it was, uh, certainly pales in, in respect to what we see happening here today. Uh, just the thought that, uh, when I first heard the reports, by the way, and I heard that a plane had, had uh, hit the top of the World Trade Center, I thought perhaps it was something that uh, was gone awry, a small plane lost control. Uh, certainly the worst fears of, of anyone in law enforcement and security is, is someone directly uh, going after a building, particularly the World Trade Center. Then just a few minutes later, another plane uh, intentionally flying into the World Trade Center just dramatizes the fact that we have a serious, I believe, a terrorist incident here. And I believe that uh, something has happened that... Uh, uh, has caused these planes to uh, be taken or be commandeered. We all, sh we all shared in that hope, Bill, in the early going. In fact, uh, one of our early guests from the a former National Transportation Safety Board investigator was saying, hey, this could have been a pilot who was temporarily disoriented, maybe blinded by the morning sun. It has happened before. A skyscraper, the uh, Empire State Building, was, was hit back in 1945 by an Army bomber. Uh, but that was in the fog. This was on a bright, clear morning. And when we saw that second plane slam into the second tower intentionally, quite clearly, uh, you, you got to believe this is a terrorist attack. It doesn't seem like uh, there would be two suicidal pilots out there who just wanted to, you know, uh, fly their planes into these buildings for um, whatever, whatever reason a suicidal person might want to do that. Hey, John, Harvey, you... Harvey Kushner is on the line with us. He's a frequent guest of ours and a terrorism expert. Uh, Harvey, is it too early to speculate about suspects? I, I don't uh, want to bring up uh, uh, memories of the Oklahoma City bombing when uh, people were talking about Middle Eastern terrorists. Yeah, obviously it's, it's too early to bring that up. Who might be responsible if in fact it is terrorism? I mean, you know, look, John, I, I couldn't conjure up a story like this. I couldn't if, if I wrote a script like this with two planes, I believe there were two, we'll go into the Trade Center on a clear day like this, uh, you know, somebody laugh at me and say this is beyond bizarre. So one thinks only that this could be the most horrifically planned incident, you know, in the annals of terrorism against the United States. Uh, think about it. I mean, uh, uh, you look outside the Fox Studios. Look how clear it is. I mean, how could you miss the the, the true the trade towers? I right. Mean, not not just one, but two planes. Well, and 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 it brings to mind, you know, everybody hates those metal detectors at airports, and everybody <laughs> makes uh, uh, passing through them almost a joke these days. 
but clearly uh, it seems that something is going to change. I guess there are many questions left to be answered about these two planes. It is certainly possible that uh, some terrorist group somewhere bought a couple of small, uh, relatively for them inexpensive um, jet transport planes for a few million bucks apiece. If you can make this kind of a statement and and kill as many people as are likely to be dead in this kind of scenario. Yeah, you know, John, uh, you know, we're talking about terrorism. No matter wh how this turns out, uh, this is going to be a day that's going to live in infamy. And, you know, it's going to cause changes in terms of if it turns out to terrorism, in terms of security like this country has never seen before. And if it just happens to be an accident, it's going to change FAA and NTSB and, and the whole airline industry and flight patterns over New York, especially if it's a small craft involved or if it's a 7 well, it, It's I think it's way beyond uh, calling this an accident at this point, Harvey. But uh, Well, I'm, try I'm, try I'm trying to be incendiary, you know. Right. Uh, I, I, I recall I'm old enough. Unfortunately, to recall the incidents in which uh, people from Middle Eastern descent were blamed for the Oklahoma City right up front. You remember that, right? I do, and, and certainly, and we you know, the stay panic away from that. which occurred with the uh, TWA uh, 800 as well. Right. But but to me, as I said to you, I couldn't conjure up uh, a, a story like this, John. And I'm sure you've covered news That's throughout right. the world. This is something this that is, is just this is it, absolutely it's literally horrific. put goosebumps for a terrorism guy like myself. It's put goosebumps on my body. We're, oh, we're all in that same situation. Shot. Harvey, thanks very much. Harvey Kushner is a terrorism expert. We want to go to Dr. Peter Salgo. Peter Salgo. He is not only an eyewitness, but he's now at Presbyterian Hospital working triage. Uh, Dr. Salgo, in human terms, what are we looking at here? How many injuries have you seen? We haven't seen anybody yet. Uh, this is all so new that uh, we're all trying to, to figure out exactly what the response needs to be here. I know that uh, there are meetings going on now to find out whether we should go ahead with the operating room schedule or not, uh, what we're going to need to do if there are casualties that get up to Presbyterian Hospital with regard to uh, the ICUs, with regard to the recovery room status. Uh, every hospital in this city uh, has a disaster plan. And uh, with communications a bit disrupted, the question is really, who needs to initiate the disaster plan? Where are the uh, victims going to be transported? Uh, we're pretty far away from the World Trade Center. We're up by the George Washington Dr. Bridge, which Salgo, is several miles north. Dr. Salgo, let me interrupt you for just a moment. President Bush is about to speak. He's in Florida at was what was supposed to be a joyous event at an elementary school. Let's listen in. A difficult moment for America. I, um, unfortunately, will be going back to Washington after my remarks. Secretary Rod Page and Lieutenant Governor <clears throat> will take the podium and discuss education. I do want to thank the folks here at, uh, at uh, Booker Elementary School for their hospitality. Uh, today we've had a national tragedy. Uh, two airplanes have crashed into the World Trade Center in an apparent terrorist attack on our country. I have spoken to the Vice President, to the Governor of New York, to the Director of the FBI, and have ordered that the full resources of the federal government uh, go to help the victims and their families and, the f and to conduct a full-scale investigation to hunt down and to find those folks who committed this act. Terrorism against our nation will not stand. And now if you join me in a moment of silence. May God bless the victims, their families, and America. Thank you very much. Clearly a shaken President Bush, jettisoning what were intended to be uh, his remarks on education. Um, perhaps uh, a little more education worldwide would prevent this kind of thing in, in the future. But uh, we are we are going to be looking at an enormous death toll. Fifty thousand people work in those two buildings. They have been slammed into by airplanes. You're looking at the footage of one of the planes coming in earlier. This is the second plane, a, a jet aircraft, hitting the World Trade Center about two minutes after nine, perhaps five minutes after nine this morning. Rita Cosby is on the phone with us, and Rita, I understand you have a lot of new information. Yeah, John, I have just been told from a U.S. law enforcement official that. They are saying it is evident that this is a terrorist-related attack. 
And uh, among the key targets, key people that they're looking at is Osama bin Laden. It was just last Friday that the U.S. State Department put out a worldwide caution to American citizens traveling abroad and also to U.S. government facilities. And they said that terrorism knows no limits, whether it's on U.S. soil or outside. So they're certainly looking at that as a possibility. What I'm also hearing from my uh, officials at FAA, at the Federal Aviation Administration, is that they believe the first plane may have been an American Airlines plane, a commercial jet, either a 737 or 757, and that it was a hijacked plane. This is what they believe. They're still trying to get this verified, but they did get some reports that there was an American Airlines plane that was hijacked en route from Boston to Los Angeles this morning. And they're saying that there is a strong possibility that that first plane that crashed into one of the towers, which does appear to be commercial and looking at the video, they're saying it appears to be either a 737 or 757, that that apparently might have been the hijacked plane. In terms of what the second plane is, they said that that does appear, as you've been reporting, John, to be a jet plane, probably a 737, a twin-engine jet airplane. Um, and those are the two things that are being looked at. They said at this point, there was no direct threat that they were aware of, of as any specific threat in terms of targeting the Twin Towers there in New York, but that they did have specific threats against Americans and American facilities around the world, and that's why they issued that worldwide caution. We also know that the FBI rapid response team has been deployed. It is en route. Several FBI agents are already on the scene there at the Twin Towers, but they are definitely looking at this as a terrorist-related act, looking uh, at this point not knowing who is behind it, but looking at the strong possibility that it may be Osama bin Laden, the mastermind behind the uh, East African embassy bombings uh, several years ago. Back to you, John. All right, Rita Cosby, thanks very much. I want to bring into the conversation William Daly. Uh, Bill, I know that Osama bin Laden likes airplanes, and again, um, we are not attributing this act to his organization, but he was implicated in a plot to blow up something like 13 airliners in 13 days or eight in eight days, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that back in the Philippines back in the 1980s, I believe. Exactly. Um, it has, it, airplanes have been uh, his terrorist weapon of choice in the past. They have because they, they hold for, for someone like a bin Laden or other, other terrorists. Uh, the fact that you could take a plane and with an, just the number of people on the, on the plane commits such a horrendous act at one time, makes an impact to the world. Uh, combine that with, an, with what we see in front of our eyes today at the World Trade Center, and you, you certainly conjure up the worst possible scenario that a, uh, certainly law enforcement could think of what a terrorist might do. Um, the, before we get on to, you know, possibly bin Laden, there are certainly other, other terrorist groups around the world that uh, would like to do things like this. The question would be, who might be able to actually carry out such an incident, whether uh, by sheer manpower, training, uh, or, or some other device. So um, although he's certainly our poster boy for, uh, literally, for, for terrorism worldwide, uh, there are other groups out there that certainly have also ill intent against the United States. Um, but what we see before us today is, uh, as I mentioned before, is something that uh, in, in planning scenarios gets, gets almost into the catastrophic where it's, uh, to, to prevent something like this from happening. Planes fly by, John, as you may know, and I know, having traveled in and out of the city, come up and down the East River by the, by the hundreds each day, by the thousands each week, and passing by the Trade Center. At, at rooftop level. Look down and you see the antenna, you see the windows. So this is something that, uh, even on a bad day, uh, they fly up and down that route. Today was a perfectly clear day in New York. E I, even I even the, if uh, some air, air traffic controllers saw those airplanes, and certainly they would have been in view of air traffic control, it might not have looked all that unusual. The first plane, uh, which I, uh, from my appearance, I saw it over Fifth Avenue heading south uh, when I was coming to work, appeared to be a 737, or as I said, a smaller Airbus. Uh, that could fit with what Rita just reported, that her sources are saying that uh, perhaps it was a plane hijacked from Boston, uh, uh, which obviously is north, that is a used air route down through Manhattan before planes make a left into LaGuardia. So clearly, uh, uh, perhaps, there may not have been an indication that something was wrong at that time. I just want to remind our viewers that the world, uh, the uh, NASDAQ and the New York Stock Exchange have not opened for the day for obvious reasons. This catastrophic terrorist attack on the World Trade Center right there in the Wall Street area. Uh, the two markets have not opened for the day. No word yet on will, when they will open, but clearly 
uh, given this kind of turmoil, you don't want to throw the financial markets into a complete panic. John Fund from the Wall Street Journal is on the phone with us. Uh, John, were you in the area when the planes hit? I was across the street in my office building. What did you see? What did you hear? I heard, it, I heard an incredible sonic boom and uh, looked up and there were already much smoke and flames pouring out of the building. And about 15 minutes later, of course, a second sonic boom, which of course would have been the second tower and the second plane. What about well, injuries, John? Well, Can you tell most, us? The most terrible and heart-rending thing about this is about 15 minutes ago, bodies started dropping from the top floors of the uh, tower closest to the highway, about at least five or six, and uh, it, was, it was absolutely terrible. Obviously, they had two choices, to be burned into f in flames or to uh, leap and end it all. It was quite tragic. So these are people who apparently survived the initial explosion and fire and then found themselves engulfed in smoke. Yes, and they obviously had no alternatives at that point. Uh, John, did you, I guess you just heard the explosions. You didn't get a chance to see the planes involved. No, I did not, but I, I mean, looked up immediately afterwards, and of course the flames were everywhere. There's an enormous jagged hole in the first tower. The second hole in the second tower is much less extensive and much less dramatic. Uh, but there's flames out of that, too. And, of course, there are flames burning in the parking lot across the street from the World Trade Center because of debris that has fallen down. And, of course, there's complete pandemonium here. And every building in the neighborhood is being evacuated or yeah. has been evacuated. Yeah, and that's the prudent thing to do, certainly. When we are looking at video of uh, the second plane hitting the World Trade Center. Uh, when we saw it happen on live television, as we were talking about, what at that point were only rumors of a plane hitting the first tower, then that second one came into view. And it became pretty clear what's going on here. Um, Bill, Bill Daly, well, l let me bring into the conversation David Asman, uh, my colleague. Yes, John Scott. David, what I, can you tell I us? I just want to uh, give you some late-breaking information. Perhaps one of the things that is of greatest fear is that there is yet another terrorist attack since those, since those two plane crashes happened within 20 minutes of each other. Well, all of Manhattan has been sealed off. This is probably unprecedented. Of course, all of this is unprecedented in this dastardly, dastardly occasion. But Manhattan has been sealed off. Uh, the Hudson River bridges and the tunnels have been sealed. Uh, clearly, there is an attempt right now to thwart any further act of terrorism, act of violence against the people of Manhattan. So Manhattan is in a lockdown. We've heard that phrase used. And, in school shootings, we've heard that phrase used in, in jail breaks. I can't recall ever having that her phrase used uh, with regard to a city the size of Manhattan. But Manhattan is in a lockdown. It is sealed off. The Hudson River bridges, the tunnels, the east side, the west side, the north, the south, of course, we are an island here in Manhattan, has been sealed off. Uh, one can only guess that, uh, that the U.S. Armed Forces is now in a state of high alert to prevent any planes or any other vehicular travel, uh, vehicular traffic in the air uh, from impacting anywhere in Manhattan on civilian targets. Uh, we are a city under siege right now, and the United States of America is, is warding off any further terrorist threats on the city of Manhattan. John? All right, David, uh, we'll be checking with the Air Force to find out uh, and also with the FAA to find out what's going on with the airspace in and around Manhattan. Uh, clearly, it has happened with two planes to this point, and, uh, well, you just got to wonder what reaction happens next. Let's find out from a former special agent of the FBI. This is Joseph Contamessa, New York Special Operations. He's joining us by telephone now. Uh, uh, Joseph, uh, how do you proceed from here? Well, clearly, uh, uh, when this particular uh, tragedy and criminal act uh, became clear, uh, the FBI, as well as all of the other uh, national security resources, are going to be pulled immediately to identify, is there any other immediate threat? Right now, I think uh, the city is probably taking its best uh, effort now to do a lockdown of sorts. If the intention of these terrorists is clearly to disrupt the American public, well, they have, in fact, succeeded. Yeah, clearly, um, a lot of people are terrified. There are going to be scores, perhaps hundreds of, of dead in those two buildings, to say nothing of the uh, 
to say nothing of the people who, who may have been on board uh, one of the airliners. Again, the report, one report is that a hijacked airliner, there, the FBI is looking uh, at a report of a hijacked airliner that may have been the first one to slam into the uh, North Tower of the World Trade Center uh, a couple of minutes before 9 this morning. Uh, Agent Contamessa, w what about the airspace? Can the, are there plans in place in a situation like this? Can the federal government simply shut down the airspace and keep all uh, airplanes on the ground? Well, of course, uh, any legitimate aircraft can be controlled totally through the FAA and the various uh, control centers and towers. However, a hijacked aircraft uh, that is under control of... I want to uh, interrupt you for just a minute. The White House is being evacuated. That comes to us from one of our uh, Fox producers in Washington. The White House is being evacuated. The Pentagon as well. It should be noted that there are sharpshooters on the roof of the White House who have anti-aircraft missiles for just this kind of situation, but the White House is being evacuated. Now, you know that President Bush is not there. He is at this moment in Florida, perhaps boarding Air Force One to prepare to return to the nation's capital. I don't want to incite any undue panic, but there is a report, a report only, of another aircraft that has crashed on Interstate 395, one of the main routes in Washington, D.C. Now, that is only a report at this point. But given the pictures you're seeing on your screen right now, anything is possible. David Asman is joining us from Fox Central. David, what do you have? John, we, we are hearing right now of another explosion that have ta has taken place at the Pentagon. We have the heart of the financial district of America being attacked. Now we understand that there is an explosion. There has been an explosion in the Pentagon, the heart of the military uh, command center of the United States of America, John. It can't get much worse than this. Let's hope. Let's hope. David Asman. Uh, that would be right next to Interstate 395. So that report, the Pentagon uh, is next to I-395, one of the main commuter uh, highways in and out of Washington, D.C. So, David, that would fit in with this report that we had earlier. We must, as we've said before, uh, not only have we not heard that uh, a, a city is under a lockdown, but we must say we've seen uh, schools under siege. We must say now that we are a nation under siege. Right now, we are a nation under siege. There is a terrorist attack, as you can see, at the heart of the financial capital of the world, and now one at the heart of the military command center of the United States of America, the Pentagon. Apparently, there has been an explosion. We have no further details. We don't know the extent of that, but we do have word that there's been an explosion at the Pentagon as and well. And there, there are some uh, smoke uh, clouds um, that we can see uh, in, in, that is the Washington, D.C. area. So you're looking at, I think that's the, uh, obviously, the old executive office building. Uh, in the foreground, uh, perhaps uh, looking out over uh, with the White House uh, to the left. Uh, now we're back looking at the World Trade Center. Uh, this obviously the most public type of attack. Uh, these, uh, this video shown across the world, you have to wonder uh, if the uh, terrorists who uh, are responsible for this horrible act are now watching these very same pictures that we are. Well, I, I, have, a feeling, I have a feeling they are. Brian Wilson, our Washington correspondent, is on Capitol Hill. Brian, uh, what can you tell us? Well, I can tell you that there was no uh, increased security around the Capitol as I made my way into the building, but in the last few minutes, we have seen a great deal of action around the city. There is smoke just across the river from the White House, not that far. And as you know, in the last few minutes, there are reports that the Pentagon has been evacuated and the White House is being evacuated. Clearly, you're seeing now these pictures from Washington, D.C., as we try to determine exactly what has happened there, but there was an early report of a plane perhaps going down in that area. These are early reports, and we are still struggling to confirm the information. But we can tell you that they're taking things very seriously in Washington in that they are apparently evacuating the White House and the Pentagon. Here at Capitol Hill, Laura Bush is now speaking with Ted Kennedy. Uh, a hearing that was scheduled uh, for her to appear at has been canceled. Uh, we would uh, be watching very carefully to see whether she is also asked to leave the Capitol and go to a safe place. Yeah, Brian Wilson, the Capitol is being evacuated, we're told, and uh, clearly that, that shot that uh, we have on our screen now, this is the Pentagon just across the river from Washington, D.C. 
you got to believe that uh, it has happened again. Another large airliner, perhaps hijacked, perhaps part of some uh, widespread plan, apparently slamming into at least the area around the Pentagon, along with uh, the World Trade Center in Manhattan, the Twin Towers of the World Trade Center in Manhattan. The Sears Tower in Chicago is being evacuated. Uh, clearly, authorities all over the country are, are trying to be prudent uh, in this unbelievable catastrophe. Two towers of the World Trade Center, uh, 50,000 people who work in those buildings on fire, the fire out of control. Firefighters are going to take days, perhaps, to get this under control, but the, the Twin Towers on fire as uh, after being slammed into by two jetliners earlier this morning. Bill, Bill Daly, let me bring you into the conversation. Actually, yeah. Bill, let me interrupt for just a second. Molly Falconer has some updated information for us. Molly? Molly Falconer, are you with us? All right, Bill Daly, let me go back to you for a minute. Clearly a coordinated strike. Uh, my heart is pounding. I'm sure yours is as well. Uh, what does the FBI do at this point? What does the nation's military do? Well, certainly the nation's military will be put on, on alert. Uh, this is no doubt about it. Is that, you know, when in the, in the gaming of looking at, at potential terrorist events, it's always the concern, as David Asman mentioned earlier, that there'll be some type of diversionary incident uh, and there'll be several others. And I think clearly this is what we're seeing here. The, uh, the concern is that. Uh, when a terrorist strikes like this is that they're going to want to do as much as they can as quick as they can because before you know it they'll be um, everything will be locked down as David said and we will be on a high state of alert so their chance of doing something more anytime soon will be very uh, will be nil with the, uh, the opportunity to do that. I'm also just speaking from personal perspective um, having worked down in the area of the World Trade Center having been down there as recently as yesterday um, I can tell you that logistically um, to get people in and out of there, people who are wounded, uh, fire rescue people, is a, a monumental effort even on a good day with traffic, with pedestrians in the area. We have the World Financial Center just literally across the street, which I'm sure has, has probably incurred some uh, debris shattering upon it. Uh, it's, a, it's a tremendous logistical, uh, I would say at this point, challenge and nightmare for uh, people who are trying to rescue, put out the fires that are being, I'm sure, fueled by the, the, the jet fuel as well as uh, the interior of the building. We now understand that the Federal Aviation Administration is shutting down all airport airline takeoffs nationwide. All airliners nationwide are being, are, there will be no more takeoffs and I imagine uh, that the planes that are in the air right now are going to be diverted to the closest airport as soon as possible because in a situation like this the authorities don't know where the next one might come from the next rogue aircraft we have seen the world trade center both towers hit by jetliners we've seen the pentagon apparently hit by a jetliner uh, authorities want to take every precaution they can and so all aircraft takeoffs nationwide have been stopped You've got to think that that is an indication, that that is an indication one would suspect that this was a hijacking, or at least one of them was a hijacking, because that would indicate that they don't know if there is another plane would be coming from. And one way to prevent a uh, repeat, whether it be a fourth attack, if, the, if that's indeed what happened out of the Pentagon. Well, and uh, we are looking at like pictures of the, the Pentagon area now, Eric, and it, it's quite clear from the smoke cloud that uh, some enormous explosion hit there. Is the, uh, would the Pentagon be protected by uh, anti-aircraft uh, missiles such as uh, are at the White House, believed to be at the White House roof? Perhaps this plane, that if it was a plane uh, at the Pentagon, was heading toward the Pentagon, could it have been shot down by our military before it got there? Uh, because that appears to be uh, smoke uh, from jet fuel a little bit away, away uh, from the Pentagon, not on the building, actual building itself. Uh, as we look at this. But let me again say the plane that I saw was heading in, here in Manhattan. The first plane that I believe was heading south. It was uh, above Fifth Avenue at a low altitude, which, is very, which was rare, but it, was, it is a uh, usual jet route from planes, especially planes that are vectored down from the north, uh, whether it be from Canada or whether it be uh, from Boston. Uh, as uh, Rita Cosby, our colleague, had reported, uh, there are sources telling her that perhaps it was a uh, 
One, one of the planes was a hijacked plane from uh, Boston. We have witnesses at the Pentagon who say that a helicopter was near uh, the Pentagon and then there was an explosion. So uh, again, uh, folks, stay with us. This is all coming into us. Uh, breaking news. You can imagine uh, the catastrophe that we're trying to deal with here, but uh, clearly three explosions, two at the World Trade Center, uh, one outside or very near the Pentagon. Molly Falconer is at one of the New York area hospitals and has some updated information on uh, the number of injuries. Molly? Hi, John. I'm coming to you live from downtown Manhattan, where St. Vincent's Hospital basically looks like it is under siege. There are flares out forming a block perimeter around this hospital. I watched one victim come out of an ambulance go in on a stretcher. They look uh, exceedingly injured, and right now there are hospital beds lined up on the street right outside the hospital, waiting with paramedics right next to them for the waves of injuries. They are obviously expecting to come in here. There's uh, yet another one. I don't know if you can hear the sirens coming in now. Uh, New York City police officers have uh, locked this place down with wooden barricades. More coming in on trucks right now. I'm watching lit flares get put in the asphalt here. Um, there are hundreds of people lined up all around this hospital and lines and lines of people trying to get on pay phones and hard lines just to get out to call into the hospital or call their loved ones. Um, nothing works down here. Our cell phones are down. All we can watch now are just the sirens and the paramedics on standby. Um, the entire hospital staff. All right, we have lost Molly Falconer's connection. That would not be unusual given the fact that the World Trade Center is a hub of communications in this city, uh, as well as being a, a, a nationwide financial link. Uh, folks, it just bears repeating here, uh, this is a tremendous tragedy, yes, but we are still the most powerful nation on Earth. Uh, we perhaps will one day find who is responsible and, uh, and appropriate steps will be taken. They have not struck at America uh, they have struck at some individual places in America, uh, but uh, uh, this country will go on. Let's go on to David Asman in Fox Central. David? John, as we've mentioned before, our job right now, the job of the armed forces of the United States is to prevent any further terrorist attack. As a result of that, not only is the city of New York in a lockdown status, all entrances to New York have been closed, all airports nationwide have been closed. But indeed, the White House has been evacuated. The Pentagon, of course, having been struck uh, by some terrorist act. We're not sure whether it was an aircraft, what kind of an aircraft, but clearly the devastation is visible on the right hand of your screen. Uh, the Pentagon is in flames, is engulfed in smoke, as is the World Trade Centers. Uh, the Sears Tower in Chicago has been evacuated. Again, no specific information about whether there was a a threatened attack on that, but no one is taking chances at the moment. The White House has been threatened as well. This is a shot earlier of that second attack. You see that jet aircraft bursting into flames as it crashes into the World Trade Center within 20 minutes of the other Trade Center tower having been attacked as well. Uh, once again, uh, the nation, as we speak, is under lockdown. Our armed forces are taking all necessary precautions to prevent another attack. Those include closing all United States airports as a result of this attack, as you see there, one that occurred about an hour ago, and an attack in the Pentagon as well. Uh, we are a nation in lock under lockdown, and once again, we are prepared for the worst, but we are prepared. John? All right. David Asman, thanks very much. I want to go to our Washington managing editor, Britt Hume, who has uh, the outlook from the nation's capital. Britt, this raises all kinds of questions about America's response, and I guess that a response is not going to be immediate, is it? Well, whether it is immediate or not, the one thing I think we are seeing, John, is this uh, series of evacuations from various uh, buildings around Washington. And I think it's important to say that we don't know and have no reason to believe that the White House, for example, was uh, facing any immediate or imminent threat. The same is true on Capitol Hill, where it appears they will be evacuating uh, the building up here soon. No, uh, nothing has happened at either of those places. Obviously, if you put your yourself in the position of officials with responsibility for any of these places, the safe move uh, in light of what we've seen is to evacuate places, just as the safe move was for the... Uh, uh, for the authorities to close the airports to keep uh, any new planes uh, out of the sky. So 
Uh, I think uh, we have a blend here of things that have really happened which are chilling in themselves and things that are happening out of precaution that may or may not denote any particular threat. So it's worth, uh, worth keeping all that in mind. As for whether there'll be any retaliatory action by the United States, obviously that's uh, days away and we're, you know, if not longer, we may, uh, it may be a long time before we know exactly how this was orchestrated, organized, by whom, and so on. Uh, this, of course, though, John, I think this is one of these days where we can say that things will not again be the same in the United States of America. This is the kind of terrorist attack that is the nightmare that uh, experts and others have warned about, uh, but some of us may have thought really could not happen on such a scale. This is quite remarkable. It is that. Uh, Britt Hume in Washington, thanks very much. And uh, I think when the investigation is all over, uh, we will find that this was perhaps somewhat easy to pull off, but uh, that is yet to come. Jim Angle is joining us now from Washington. Uh, Jim, what can you tell us about that fire outside the Pentagon? Jim Angle, are you with us? Uh, I can tell you first that the roads around the White House, the streets around the White House, were blocked seconds ago. Uh, members of the Uniform Division of the Secret Service ran out to intersections and started diverting traffic. There are emergency vehicles on almost every block around the White House. The road south of the White House has also been blocked. And as you know, the White House is being evacuated. Federal employees are standing on the street corners in and around the White House, uh, having left the building for fear of another attack. As you come into Washington from Virginia, about two miles from the Pentagon, you can see the smoke billowing up from the building, huge clouds of smoke, so much so that uh, commuters coming into town have pulled over to the side of a busy freeway, what is ordinarily a busy freeway, and are sitting watching in amazement as the symbol of the United States Defense Establishment uh, goes up in smoke. So there is an amazement all over Washington. Uh, people are not sure what to think. Uh, you've got a lot of federal employees standing around in this area watching as the streets are blocked off and emergency vehicles rush to and fro. We're not sure uh, what they are up to, uh, but clearly there is concern about the safety of the White House and the surrounding buildings. John. Uh, Jim, do you know anything about uh, what kind of uh, plane or helicopter uh, is involved in that Pentagon incident? I do not, but I can tell you uh, whatever it is, it caused substantial uh, damage and fire. Uh, I can't tell you how large the smoke plumes are coming from the Pentagon. Uh, it Folks, is, it, Jim, it let is, me interrupt it, you. Uh, we are looking at live pictures of the World Trade Center literally starting to crumble. It is, it is falling apart as, uh, as we watch these pictures live. The World Trade Center, 110 stories, literally starting to fall. Bill Daly, let me bring you into the conversation. I know this was the goal of the terrorist strike back in 1993. Yeah, John, it, it was, and uh, they thought they could do it by putting charges down in the basement and, uh, and damaging the, the understructure. Um, as much as these buildings were, were built to withstand uh, a, a certain large hit, including some aircraft, apparently uh, the structural integrity appears, from what we can see here, uh, to be faltering to some degree. They were not designed perhaps to take a direct strike from something the size of a 737 or perhaps uh, an Airbus, perhaps fully loaded with fuel. Steel will melt and uh, that... All right, uh, David Lee Miller is, uh, is still with us. Uh, David, what can you tell us? <laughs> David Lee Miller, can you tell us uh, what happened there? All right, David Lee Miller, who has seen his share of horrors around the world in trouble spots in the Middle East and elsewhere, is in that area uh, reporting on what we think we can see. I, I want to stress it's, it's tough to... Hello? Yeah, David Lee, what can you tell us? John, uh, the scene is horrific. One of the two towers literally collapsed. I was making my way to the foot of the World Trade Center suddenly while talking to an officer was questioning me about my press credentials. We heard a very loud blast, an explosion. We looked up, and the uh, building literally began to collapse before us. There was uh, debris falling, uh, I'd say, at least three-quarters oh the height of the building. People within uh, the entire perimeter 
began, literally, including myself, which is why I'm out of breath, to run for our lives. And I am now standing uh, in a black cloud of, of, of smoke left over from the debris, debris there, soot. It's difficult to breathe. People ran into nearby office buildings once they got out of the danger zone just to be able to breathe. I'm on a payphone on the street right now, and I literally cannot see more than a quarter block away. That's how thick the smoke is. I'm on Murray Street and West Broadway, for those who know Lower Manhattan. Not clear now is why this uh, explosion took place. Was uh, it because of the, uh, the planes that uh, two planes dual attacked this morning? Or was there some other attack which there has been talk of here on the street? But I can tell you this, that uh, the police have moved people back and it's gonna be a long time. Yeah, David, uh, we are looking at the replay of what happened that you're describing. It happened just moments ago. It sure appears that the building simply collapsed Hello? based... Yeah, David, if you're, if you're still with us, please keep on the line. It, it appears that the building simply collapsed of its own weight, that there was so much damage uh, from the heat of the fire. Uh, as I said, steel will melt. The, the second... That was the, the, the building that was hit by the second plane. The, the plane that we actually saw hit the building live during our coverage. Uh, that is the building that has just collapsed. Now, it, it bears noting that that plane seemed to come in at a lower altitude. It hit the building lower down, and there was that tremendous fireball. So the damage to the building uh, came at a point where there is much more weight on top of it, and those steel girders, strong as they are, had a lot of weight to support, and apparently, I'm, just, uh, I'm not a structural engineer, but I'm, I'm just guessing now that they gave way. The loss of life here is going to be enormous. May, may uh, God help those who are there and the victims and their families uh, and all the souls that are lost today. Yeah. I think it's safe to say that virtually every family in America is going to be touched by this, uh, by this disaster. This is what the uh, terrorists back in 1993 tried to accomplish when they uh, drove a uh, van laden full of bombs into the garage. Uh, and apparently they were successful. John? Let me bring in the former governor of New York, Mario Cuomo. He's with us by telephone now. Governor, what's your reaction? That's the only thing I can ask you. It's the same as everyone else's. Uh, everybody now is, is holding their breath and measuring the extent of the tragedy as it grows from moment to moment. And that will be the story, I'm sure, for the next uh, 24 hours is how much damage was done. I think the, the longer range story is even more terrible. The longer range story is who did it and why. And if it were a nation, it would be easy to deal with, but it's not a nation. It'll be individual Excuse terrorists. Excuse me, a governor, can you hold, hold on for just a second? From the tower, from right to left, I guess, west to east, and it just, everything just all of a sudden just imploded. I ran as fast as I could, went inside of a building about a block away. I stood in the building for a couple of seconds, and then all of a sudden the building started falling out, filling up with smoke. I was with a bunch of law enforcement officers. We couldn't get out of the building because everything was locked up. And then I came out, and everything was filled with ash, and it looks like I'm, looks like I'm in a surreal movie. Do you, do you know if it was an explosion or if it was a building collapse? To me, it sounded like, it, it, to me it sounded like an explosion, then, then the building, the rolling sound sounded like the building collapsed. Were, were there other people? There must have been a lot of people on the ground nearby when it happened. Oh, mo where that happened, there was mostly law enforcement. I don't think there were many uh, there were civilians there. I don't know. Don't move, Pat. How, ma These... how many people would you say were on the ground when the, uh, when the building exploded or collapsed? Law enforcement, there were, I don't I, Over on that corner there, I don't know. There might have been... There might have been 100, 150, I don't know. What's your, what's your full name, officer? Police officer Gronowski. All right, thanks a lot. Good luck. Folks, you're, you're looking at live pictures on the left of your screen. On the right of your screen, the uh, tower, one of the twin towers of the World Trade Center. There's, there's thick ash on the ground, lots of it. Pandemonium here a short time ago. When the building did collapse or whatever it was that happened, it was a huge explosion, a huge rumbling cloud of smoke and fire came across Church Street and then started billowing this way. And all we saw was, was people, were people running in this direction. Everyone, law enforcement people, a woman pushing a baby carriage. This is actually, a, we believe, debris from one of the planes that hit one of the towers on the World Trade Center. The FBI is here, as you can see. They had roped this area off. They were taking photographs and securing this area. 
just prior to that huge explosion that we all heard and felt. We, uh, we'll try and talk to some of these guys. Can you tell me what you saw, what you heard? So nothing. You all right? All right, thank you. Where were, where were you, sir, when that happened? Right on the street. <laughs> what did you see? What did you hear? It felt like another plane coming. Everybody took cover to run. We ran down the subway, but the dust followed us down there. Were there, there a lot of people in the subway? Uh, no, not that many, because they already had evacuated before. Did you see people, anyone in danger, anyone getting hit when this? Not back there, yeah, but I was running. I mean, there was nothing you can do because you just saw the thing coming right over. Have you seen, were you able to see the tower after? No. What do you, what do you mean, since it happened now? Since oh, the fire? Look at this guy, look at this guy. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. The streets have been shut down. Uh, there was very little traffic on the streets except for emergency vehicles going one way or the other. So there was not a lot of vehicle traffic in this area. But there were a lot of pedestrians on almost every single corner taking photographs and, and just looking at the building, which was still smoking and still on fire. A lot of police there officers at the back. officials up there that were right near the building. Where were you when the explosion occurred, when the plane hit the building? I was, uh, I saw it from my office, as a matter of fact, down the Lower East Side. So you came here? Yes. To, to check it out? Help. No. What, what do you mean? To see if we can help. But this is... Uh, yeah. This poor woman. Wow. Rick Leventhal is the one reporting on the, the ground. He's not able to hear me at this moment. Uh, but Rick... Just the, just the sound of a plane. Star jets, star jets. Star jets. All right. What, what are you guys doing right now? What's your... What's your assignment what's your sign help people are there a lot of injured the uh the, the dust is still thick in the air with what that guy is covered with is, is this stuff that's all over the street just thick soot ash just came roaring down here in a huge cloud from the world trade center you see just the, the survivors, if you will. Are you able to talk? Can we just have, talk to you about what happened? I was back there when we exploded. You were right there at the building? Yes, there's a lot of people trapped. You're right, come here. A lot of people trapped. EMT. This guy needs help. Rick Leventhal is not able to hear me, but from his vantage point on the ground, I think it's not clear to him What's fairly clear I mean, to us, like here. our vantage point from the helicopter, that the to top to of like Tower here. 1, One World Trade Center, has literally here. crumbled. How I can't guess right? how many floors, perhaps 30, perhaps 40. Stuff is, what, I think 107 stories tall, Tower 1 and Tower 2, uh, one in the south end, one in the uh, north end. Uh, it appears that the plane, the first plane that hit, hit the one in the north end, uh, that has the uh, the restaurant, Windows in the World upstairs, and then the South Towers appears to be the one that was hit uh, the second time. That has the observation deck. Uh, that is a uh, is a obviously popular tourist attraction uh, for, for for people. So clearly, as we see, a pandemonium. But uh, you know, the uh, John, the uh, FBI, and the uh, New York City Police Department have the Joint Terrorist Task Force. They have uh, obviously experience with this. They were able to solve. Uh, the others, and I'm confident, and we should be confident that. Let, let's go to Brian Wilson now. He is, he's at the, uh, in Washington. Brian, is there a report of, about the Pentagon? Well, I can't tell you about that, but I was just here in front of the Capitol, which, by the way, has been evacuated, and back toward the Supreme Court area, we just heard a low, muffled thud. It sounded like a small explosion. Sirens are going off around this city like you cannot believe. And just overhead a moment ago, something I have never seen in Washington in the 16 years I've been here, military jets are, uh, are now patrolling the skies over Washington, D.C. We'll try to find out more about that explosion, but it was a low thud, and I'm now seeing that there is a great deal of activity over toward the direction of the Supreme Court. All right. Back to you, John. Britt Hume is with us. Britt? 
uh, John, I'm looking now uh, on one of our remote uh, uh, cameras here at a picture of the scene at the Pentagon. This is a picture uh, looking down Interstate 395, which is, you probably know, John, is a major thoroughfare in and out of Washington that is commuted, used for, by commuters every day in large numbers. And we're getting a sense that uh, from a reporter out there at the scene has just said that there's been another loud bang out there, whether that is an, a further explosion uh, initiated in an attack or whether it is simply a secondary uh, blast, the result of the continuing fire. But uh, the situation there at the Pentagon continues to evolve. We'll keep you posted. All right. Britt Hume in Washington, thank you. Our Rick Leventhal is on the ground in lower Manhattan where these scenes of chaos and utter confusion are just mind-numbing. Rick, uh, go ahead. Rick is not able to hear me, but this is the scene in Lower Manhattan where, where the upper Again, floors of the World the Trade Rock Center, Church Tower Street. One, apparently have completely four collapsed. Five blocks from the World Trade Center, and and we were standing here when, when there was some sort of collapse or explosion, and everyone started running in this direction. Police officers, pedestrians, EMTs, everybody came running this way. I saw a woman pushing a, a baby carriage, running for her life, and right behind them was a huge cloud of billowing smoke and ash and debris coming this way. Uh, the smoke has obviously cleared somewhat. Ma'am, she's with DCPI. Can you talk to us for just a second? Bring us up to speed. Obviously, people have their hands full out here. It's not easy getting anyone to talk. Okay, Rick. Yeah, tell me where you were, what happened, what did you okay. see, what did you hear? First I went on Canal Street, I saw the fire. I saw the two buildings, I'm thinking it was, a, it was a bomb because it's two of them. Anyway, when I got there, I tried to save people because I'm a doctor. When I tried to save people, in the moment we heard a big explosion coming down. Everything just went black. Everything came down, glass started popping. People got hurt, stuff went on top of them. And it was a big explosion and everything got dark, real dark, like snow. You can see behind me, all oh, this is not snow, it's, this is all from the building. It was a terrible nightmare. Where exactly were you standing when this happened? I was standing right in front of the World Trade Center. So you were down the block here? And right you came there, in the middle. This way? Right, yeah. Everything. Did you get hurt at all? No, not me. Did you see anyone around you getting caught up in it? Yeah, we was, I was with the firemen. We, all, we got hurt, we all went inside to this dark. We was inside the building where everything happened. But we came out alive. What's the, your name? My name is Dr. Angel. Were you able to, to assist anyone before this happened? Yes, I did. I, I, help, I help a lot of patients, a lot of them. Well, there are a lot more people that need help they now. Need help, so if, yeah. you're, if you're capable, maybe you should... Uh... Um, yes, I'm going to go back. I lost my ID, but I try to go back. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks a lot for All talking right. to us. Thank you. All right. Uh, we, uh, that's, that's what Rick Leventhal has for us down in lower Manhattan, where chaos and utter confusion reigns. This is clearly a national catastrophe. There will be some response from the White House. Let's go to Wendell Goler, who was traveling with the president in uh, Sarasota, Florida, and find out what the latest is there. Wendell? John, the president left Sarasota, Florida. Air Force One uh, took off just a short while ago. Mr. Bush returning to Washington to convene a meeting of his national security advisors, including the vice president, the heads of the CIA, the National Security Agency, and the FBI, and also New York Governor Pataki. It is unclear now whether that meeting will be held at the White House or elsewhere, given the explosion uh, just a, a short distance away from the White House on the other side of the old executive office building and the evacuation of the White House itself. Mr. Bush cut short a, a two-day trip here in Florida that was focused on education after the two attacks uh, on, on the Twin Towers in New York. He was briefed by his national security advisor, uh, Condoleezza Rice, who phoned him after the first attack. Mr. Bush was actually reading to some children when uh, the second attack occurred. Chief of Staff Andy Card interrupted him, told him about the attack. It was clear at that point we were dealing with terrorists. Mr. Bush cut short his uh, trip and flew back to Washington. John? All right, Wendell Goler, thank you. Just wanted to update you that some of the hospitals in New York are already at capacity, not accepting any new patients. There could be tens of thousands of injuries. Let's listen into what uh, Rick Leventhal is learning down in Lower Manhattan. We're lying down, and then I looked up, and I saw the and I saw this huge plume of smoke, and the tower just crumbling, and it and it just turned into a huge plume of smoke. And next thing you know, there's smoke in one tower, and that's what we're seeing right here. 
So, and obviously there's plenty, uh, the people are worried about the, the press agents and everybody else that went the other way is everybody wants to look this way. When you saw this collapse taking place, could you see if there were a lot of people on the ground near the building as it no, was happening? I was, I was further north than you were, but I was dead looking at 6th Avenue. The view you see of both towers as you come right. down 6th Avenue. Right. So, and right. most of this fallout stops about four blocks back. Give him a look down this way, Pat. Uh, you know, it does sort of look like beyond a few blocks down, it, it looks almost clear. But it's anything but over here. I live at 25 Lone Street, a couple of blocks from here. I'm all the time, I hang out in the corner on the liquor store this morning. I saw the plane coming this way in the spot. It was factory directly to the building. Was this the was, first plane or the second plane? This was the first plane. The second plane, this no second plane. It was a bomb. Bomb in another building, not second plane. That was a bomb. Right. Who said the second plane? That's what we're told, the second plane. No, we saw it on I television. Saw everything. All right. Well, thanks a lot. Check, I, this is... In case you're just joining us, uh, this is the aftermath of a horrific event that began unfolding about an hour and 20 minutes ago. A jet plane slammed into the side of uh, Tower 2 of the World Trade Center. Then a few minutes later, another jet slammed into Tower 1. The second to Tower 1, I should say, the upper floors have collapsed. They're absolutely gone. Uh, I, was, I was in the restroom. There was a, a, a big shaking. Some of the ceilings collapsed. Looks like there was a fire in the elevator shafts. And... Um, uh, just they they brought everyone down and started bringing everybody down the stairs. So you came down from the 77th floor. 77th floor down you the came stairs. Down the stairs. Yes. What, what was happening around you? Was people screaming? No, or? no. People were pretty calm. <clears throat> when we got down to sixth floor, there was like another shake or another explosion. Everyone started panicking, but everybody was really calm, and the police and firemen were very helpful. Which of the two towers were you in? One. Trade Center one. All right. And when you got to the ground, then what? Uh, it's just like, it's like rubble and dust, like inches thick and like paper, <clears throat> paper, <clears throat> paper everywhere and they just moved us out. How many people do you think were in the building on the floors that were affected? What I, do you I think? Say, I mean, I'm one, fl one office out of 20 on that floor, so I have no idea. How, how far above you or below you was the uh, impact? I think it was up us, above us, I don't know how many floors. We saw it on TV, uh, but I don't know, I don't know. What's the first thing you thought when you heard it? Had to, had to call my wife. Did you? Were you yes. able to? Yeah, I, I got through a phone line. I called her. I'm talking to you because I'm hoping she's watching so she knows I'm okay. What's your name? My name is Matthew right. Gard. Folks, clearly America is under attack. We can only hope that it's over, at least for now. Our David Schuster is in Washington where there have been one, perhaps two explosions at the Pentagon. David, uh, what can you tell us? John, I'm actually in our office here at the Pentagon, and according to counterintelligence sources, they confirm that it was a plane that crashed into the south end of the Pentagon near the helipad. Uh, this is a route that uh, commercial aircraft flying into National Airport, which is just a few miles away, they take sometimes on final approach as they come to the airport. But again, intelligence sources, counterintelligence sources confirming that it was a plane that crashed uh, on the side of the Pentagon. Now, here in our Pentagon officer, producer Chris Wright, says that there was no uh, shaking of the building or even sounds. Of course, the Pentagon is built to withstand attacks uh, perhaps like this one. Uh, but we are getting reports from eyewitnesses who were on uh, Highway 110, which is just uh, west of the Pentagon. One eyewitness claiming that he saw a U.S. Air 737 plane headed toward... All right, let's uh, listen in now to WTTG's coverage there outside the Pentagon. This is coming to you from the Washington, D.C. area. Okay, thank you. Hello? The, Pen the Pentagon, the world's largest office building, being evacuated. Uh, Britt Hume, our Washington managing editor, is still with us. Uh, uh, Britt, go ahead. Well, John, what you're seeing there is that is the uh, interstate uh, or the Route 395, used to be known as the Shirley Highway, that comes up into Washington. As I mentioned earlier, a familiar commuter route. And what you're seeing there are the military personnel evacuating the building. Uh, some, as you know, as we noted just a minute ago, or as you could see just a minute ago, were on the run. Now, we have, John, from, uh, from sources, intelligence sources, what may be a claim of responsibility here. Now, I want to caution you before I note this that at times like these all sorts of uh, claims are made so this needs to be treated uh, with some caution 
But it, some intelligence sources are now saying that the Democratic Front for the Liberation of Palestine is claiming credit. In the meantime, however, the Israeli government is said by sources to believe that Osama bin Laden is responsible for the operation. And those two organizations are related, but they are not exactly the same. I suspect, John, before all is said and done, we will hear more on that aspect of all this. But obviously that is something that we're all keeping an eye on to see if some kind of uh, authenticatable or, or uh, credible claim of responsibility for these astonishing attacks uh, is made that we can, we can believe. Again, you're looking again at the, uh, at the, uh, at the interstate road, that, inter Route 395, that runs down past the Pentagon. Uh, that is just, of course, across the river from, from Washington, D.C. And the smoke you're seeing is indeed from the area out by the helipad, which can be seen by drivers as they go by the Pentagon. And, uh, and uh, you're seeing the smoke uh, from it. It appeared from some pictures we saw earlier, John, of the building itself, that while it was clearly damaged, and in the area where the hit was uh, very uh, badly damaged, uh, it did not look like the damage to the overall building, which is massive, was all that extensive. Right. Well, that is uh, perhaps a touch of good news. Brit, Brit Hume, thanks very much. Let's go back to our man in Lower Manhattan, Rick Leventhal, who is, again, not able to hear us, but uh, trying to bring you from the ground the perspective of, of what he witnessed, felt, and heard. And I think Ricky is not clearly aware as we are that the upper floors of Tower One of the World Trade Center have collapsed completely. And, you know, it felt like a bomb hit or a plane hit or something like that. But the whole floor a plane was did hit. A plane did hit. Yeah, and then we looked out the window, all we saw was debris all over the place. But we thought the building was going to topple over. It was going so Well, one shaking. of them did. One of them did. We were in town one. We made it out. Well, you're a lucky man. Thank you very much. OK, thanks. All right, take care. Clearly, this is a nationwide catastrophe. But folks, uh, phone lines in New York are virtually shut down. So you're not going to be able to call your loved ones if you have any other way, perhaps email. If you have any other way of contacting your loved ones, try and do it without using the telephone because telephone lines in New York are at gridlock right now. Let's listen in again to this eyewitness. I have a lot of faith in God, and I hope uh, a lot of other people made it out the building as I did. All right, thank you. Tell me, tell me what you saw. Stop and talk to us. Where were you? Top of the roof, 25 Park Place. Me and a super. So heard the loud noise from a jet. We look up and we see this big jet, like a 737 or a 720. It was a 757. About that, it was a big jet. Yeah. We saw it come, just looking like it sideways. At first, we thought it was just going to try to miss it. Bang! Right into the middle of it, uh, in, like around the 70th floor. And then, half hour later, we see the second one bang into it. We're on the roof of it. We're a block away. I mean, well, what's going through your mind when you see this happen? You see bodies flying out of the sky, and you can't do nothing about it. You tell me. You tell me what you think. I mean, uh, my heart's in my mouth. I mean, I, I pray for these people. It, it's, it's, there's no words to describe what's going on out there. I mean, you see bodies just coming a half hour later, still coming out of the goddamn sky. Devastating. Devastating. I can't imagine anything worse than this. There's got to be... I can't imagine. You know everybody on a plane must have died? The floor, I got friends of mine on 104th floor, friends on other buildings. I just spoke to one of my friends a half hour prior to that, getting ready to go upstairs to go to work. I mean, I've seen a lot of construction accidents. I've seen a lot of bad things happen. I've never seen a jet fall out of the sky into a building, no less once, but twice. Devastating. I want to bring into the uh, conversation uh, General Al Haig, the former Secretary of State. Now, General Haig, at a time like this, what, how does America respond prudently with the proper amount of caution and, and yet with, with whatever force needs to be applied? Well, first, we have to know the, the full limits of this tragedy, and it's unprecedented, of course. Uh, but we have to stay, above all, united and calm and ready to take resolute action, which sometimes we have failed to do in the recent past when the perpetrators are, are uncovered, and we have many, many uh, indicators of precisely who they are, uh, this was too broadly based a terrorist act to be just a, a few crazies. This is a, a terrorist movement, and we know where they're, where they're located today. And obviously, as a nation, we're going to have to take action against them. 
but uh, clearly that action is going to be some days, if not weeks or months away. Oh, it has to be very carefully assessed before any action is taken, of course, and we have to be uh, reasonably assured that uh, those that we are moving against are the, the perpetrators, and, and I think we know where to center our look. Uh, all we have to do is look at the world today with the Palestinian and, and bin Laden groups. Uh, who, who, do, who are the terrorists that you think are the most likely suspects? Well, I'm not going to speculate because uh, I don't have inside knowledge and it would be uh, rather foolish to do that. But I do think we have the means to assess it and there will be many statements, many uh, parties claiming credit somehow already have done so for the uh, World Trade Center uh, bombings. Clearly with what's going on in the skies where even apparently innocent civilian airliners can be employed as, as weapons of terrorists. What is our military doing right now, General Haig? What should they be doing? Well, they have to be on full alert, and I would have hoped that we would get some aircraft up in the air to enforce the ban on flights. Uh, that has to be done if it has not already been done. And I'm sure it has been. All right, General uh, Alexander Haig, former Secretary of State, thanks for being with us. Uh, Rick Leventhal, once again, with our producer Carlos Van Meek, is in lower Manhattan. Uh, you cannot even see the sky there because of the soot, the ash, the crumbled concrete that is continuing to rain down after one of the two towers of the World Trade Center, the upper floors, collapsed. This after this apparent terrorist attack this morning that sent uh, a large jetliner, perhaps two large jetliners, slamming into the Twin Towers. Come over this way, Pat. You can see Fine. the chaos. So, we can see the top of the building from here. Oh, yeah. Oh, there it goes. There it goes. There it goes. There it goes. Oh. When it comes down, we're down. All right. We do need to put it down now. I think we need to put it down now. Here we go. America, offer a prayer. According to American Airlines, American Airlines is confirming that its Flight 11 from Boston to Los Angeles was hijacked today and that its plane was the first one involved in this attack on the World Trade Center. Brian Wilson is on the phone with us now from the Washington area. Brian, what's the latest? Well, I wanted to tell you, John, that I'm in front of the Capitol, and a moment ago, police officers ran up to us and ordered us off of the grounds and told us, and I quote, there is a plane that has been hijacked. It is 20 minutes south of Washington. This was about 10 minutes ago, and is headed this way. They are taking ultimate precautions. Now, as you know, in these chaotic situations, sometimes information gets twisted. But police officers here are saying that they believe there is a hijacked plane now headed toward Washington. And that's all the information I can give you at this moment. All right, Brian, uh, we had a report from you earlier that military aircraft are circling the Capitol. Is that still the case? They, they have not seen them in the last few minutes, but there were military jets above the Capitol a few moments ago. Of course, you know, John, this has been the nightmare scenario for uh, security experts in Washington, that uh, many of the buildings in Washington, very visible from the air, are very vulnerable. In fact, the flight path to National Airport runs literally six blocks from the White House. So this has always been a big concern. But again, to repeat the information that I have here, Capitol Police have completely evacuated the grounds of the Capitol, and they have told us, quote, there is a plane that's been hijacked. It is south of Washington, headed this way. I, now, the reliability of the information I cannot give you, but that's what police have told us. All right, Brian Wilson, thank you, and uh, let us know if you come up with any new information. It is, it is hard to describe, folks. The, the pictures show what has happened in lower Manhattan, but we don't have a handle yet on the devastation. I, I remind you again that there are perhaps 50,000 people who work in the World Trade Centers 
uh, the two towers, and, and those towers are virtually gone now after this apparent terrorist strike earlier this morning. Mm -hmm. How many of those 50,000 people they were able to get out, we don't yet know. That is the heart of uh, not just the financial district, but uh, many national, international corporations. I mean, look at that smoke. The dust, the, uh, the, that plume that has just engulfed blocks and blocks of lower Manhattan. Uh, you have the Wall Street Journal down there, many, many corporations and offices. So uh, I think we must say a prayer and a heart certainly goes out to everyone who is there right at this moment, uh, as well as the uh, New York City Emergency Command Center is at the foot uh, of, uh, of the World Trade Center. Uh, so uh, we, I think we, it is, John, important for us to take a moment to say a prayer remember these people and um, and hope that God gives and us Ameri grace. And, and, and take a look at the poignant picture you see there. The Statue of Liberty, folks, is still standing. And I think that's important to remember at a time like this. The World Trade Center has collapsed and uh, the, the, the casualty figure we cannot even begin to, to guess at at this point. Our David Lee Miller is with us, we are glad to know, from the City Hall area. David Lee, what can you tell us? John, just seconds ago there was a huge explosion and it appears right now the second World Trade Tower has just collapsed. The uh, debris and the smoke is so thick where I am that, uh, again, you cannot see the World Trade Center even though we're just a few blocks away. But it appears the entire building has collapsed. People are literally running through the streets. They are running from uh, Center Street in Lower Manhattan trying to get away from the smoke, which is absolutely uh, choking. It is difficult to breathe. There are people in front of me wearing gas masks. The cell phone service is virtually non-existent. There are lines of people to use the few pay phones that are available, and uh, people are literally hysterical there in the streets, worried about loved ones who were in these two buildings. Moments before the building collapsed, I was outside, and uh, after the first collapse, the authorities began to move people away from the perimeter. They feared that the second building would collapse. They warned people of that, and they began to push people away, including reporters, including myself. And uh, right now, there is nothing here but uh, shock on the streets of Lower Manhattan. John? All right, David Lee, stay safe. Uh, we are looking now at pictures, this of uh, the second of the two World Trade Center towers collapsing after that uh, awful, awful event. Let's, let's just recap what's happened so far today. Two planes, one of them at least, apparently hijacked an American Airlines plane, slammed into the side of the World Trade Center a little before 9 a.m. Uh, then, as we watch now this picture, a second plane slammed into the second tower of the World Trade Center. That tower collapsed first. It burned for a while and then collapsed. And you can see these pictures as that tower collapses. Um, not long ago, the second of the two towers collapsed. Now again, there are perhaps 50,000 people who work in these buildings on any given day. Not all of them would have been at work yet, uh, but, uh, but clearly um, a great and, and monumental loss of life. Also in Washington, the Pentagon has been under attack. At least one plane slammed into the Pentagon. David Schuster is an eyewitness to that and, uh, and is joining us now. David? John, the Pentagon is now uh, being evacuated. You may be able to hear some of the sirens that going off in the Pentagon. There's smoke billowing down the hallway. Eyewitnesses describe a, a U.S. Air 737 plane uh, on what seemed to be headed towards National Airport at approximately 9.40 this morning when it then crashed into the south end of the Pentagon. The eyewitnesses describe a huge ball of fire, the plane apparently hitting by the helipad, which is near uh, Highway 110 and Highway 395, the main arteries into the city. Uh, there have been unconfirmed reports of second explosions here at the Pentagon. We have not confirmed that, but again, the uh, counterintelligence sources confirming that it was a commercial aircraft apparently hijacked that uh, crashed into the Pentagon. The building has been evacuated. There are uh, reports of, uh, of, of safety precautions being taken at the Central Intelligence Agency, at the National Security Agency. Capitol Hill has been evacuated. The White House has been evacuated. But here at the Pentagon, uh, I was actually uh, on in a taxi cab on Highway 110 when suddenly smoke started billowing out of the Pentagon. Very quickly, you heard ambulances and fire trucks headed that direction. Chris Wright, our producer at the Pentagon, who was on uh, the sort of the northern side of the Pentagon, says he could not hear the explosion or, or, or feel any aftershocks or anything. Obviously, the 
Pentagon, a very large building meant to withstand uh, terrorist attacks or any sort of other attack. But again, eyewitnesses describing a U.S. Air 737 crashing into the Pentagon at approximately 9.40 this morning. The Pentagon, except for, uh, uh, for some personnel, the Pentagon being evacuated, and we can actually smell some of the smoke now in, in the hallways uh, here on the north side. John. David Schuster in Washington, thank you. Britt Hume is with us once again, our managing editor in Washington. Um, Britt, uh, chaos and pandemonium, but uh, how, how do we, how do we uh, measure the response here? Well, John, one thing worth noting is that you're going to hear all kinds of further warnings at a time like this and, and, uh, and precautions are being taken. We've just learned, for example, that uh, police have been sent to Union Station. A bomb squad has been sent to Union Station, which, as you know, John, is located just a couple of blocks from the Capitol. In fact, it's uh, just adjacent to our Fox News uh, Bureau here in Washington. Um, one sense is that there will be many uh, squads and many alerts and many more than there will be uh, things found, but nobody's taken any chances in this town at this hour after the astonishing events that have unfolded so far here today. And, of course, you've been seeing the pictures and hearing the reports from down there at the Pentagon. Who would have imagined such a thing? Um, it appears that the damage to the Pentagon is bad as it was. We don't have any sense of the, uh, whether there was loss of life or, or how extensive it was. It, that is an attack that looks like it could have been very much worse indeed had the airplane hit in a more central area of that, uh, of that building. So we're now watching, of course, the Capitol building with considerable urgency. It's uh, right out the window of our, of our bureau here. Uh, because, as Brian Wilson reported, police on Capitol Hill are evacuating the place, saying that there was airpl an airplane 20 minutes away, apparently, or they had reason to believe that it was headed this way. Now, we know their jets have been scrambled and have been in the air. It is hard to know whether a plane would ever be allowed to get close to Washington, D.C. in the air with all the uh, airports closed at the moment or not. But uh, that, obviously, is something we're watching with considerable uh, interest and worry here. All right. Uh, Britt, I just want to update you while you've been talking. Authorities at the Somerset County Airport confirm a large plane crash about 80 miles southeast of Pittsburgh. We're trying to deal with only facts today and not rumors because there are plenty of those swirling around, but we do have a confirmation of apparently another plane crash about 80 miles southeast of Pittsburgh. You've got to assume that it's related to all of these goings on, but uh, we don't know any more information than that. Rick Leventhal, we are glad uh, to know, is still with us uh, in Lower Manhattan. Rick? Yeah, John, um, we, just, we, we basically ran about five blocks down Church Street uh, north, away from the World Trade Center, uh, as that second tower was collapsing. Uh, a similar scene to the first one, where huge clouds of smoke began, began billowing down the street at us. Uh, and in fact, because of the location of the tower, it actually came down cross streets. So as we were running north on church, we were passing cross streets, and the, the black clouds of debris and smoke were, were coming towards us down the side streets as well. So we were about five blocks, uh, we're about five, that. six blocks north of where we were before. Things have settled down a bit now. That the, the smoke is starting to clear. Um, we've seen more injured coming our way, and there's a lot of uh, police activity on the street. Um, but a similar scene to what we saw earlier as the first tower collapsed, uh, only this time uh, people were ready for it or more ready for it and uh, reacted swiftly. John? All right, uh, Rick Leventhal, thanks very much. Again, there is so much going on. It's difficult to update you, but... You're looking at the cloud of dust, debris, smoke, and probably uh, crumbled concrete over lower Manhattan. The twin towers of the World Trade Center are essentially gone, 110 stories each, more or less. They are gone now. All of this taking place within the last two hours after they were struck um, by uh, two airplanes. American Airlines is now confirming that its Flight 11 from Boston to Los Angeles was hijacked, and apparently one of that, uh, that plane was one of the two uh, that slammed into one of the World Trade Center towers. Uh, we don't know anything more about the loss of life, but it is going to be considerable. David Schuster is with us now, again, uh, not far from the Pentagon. David? Well, John, I'm actually inside the Pentagon in our office at the Outer Ring, and again, we can confirm for you that intelligence sources are telling us that it was a U.S. Air 737 
uh, that crashed into the south end of the Pentagon at approximately 940 this morning. The Pentagon has been evacuated, but we do want to point out that at parts of the Pentagon, key personnel are still here, including the National uh, Military Command Center. This is in the basement of the Pentagon, an extreme, uh, sort of a bunker type of a facility that uh, is essentially designed to withstand direct uh, attacks on the Pentagon. And uh, we're told that officials there uh, are still in that particular part of the Pentagon are coordinating any possible U.S. response, as well as trying to gather intelligence information, counterintelligence information, and essentially act as a clearinghouse from all the various intelligence agencies in Washington. Uh, there have been reports of uh, cautions, precautions being taken at the Central Intelligence Agency in McLean, Virginia, at the National Security Agency. But again, here at the Pentagon, while most of the Pentagon and its uh, 23,000 employees have been evacuated, the National Military Command Center at the base of the Pentagon is still here. Uh, you can actually smell the smoke now in uh, virtually all of the hallways at the Pentagon uh, and uh, fire trucks and sirens going off on the south side. But where we are on the northern side of the Pentagon in one of the outer rings, uh, my producer Chris Wright says he could not feel any of the aftershocks of the Pen of the explosion. There was no uh, uh, noise when the uh, uh, plane apparently crashed this morning at 9:40. Um, but again, uh, most of the Pentagon has been cleared out. The smoke uh, pretty thick here in the halls. Um, but uh, some officials, of course, still at the Pentagon in the offices that are designed uh, for some of these uh, very uh, scenarios. John. All right, David Schuster at the Pentagon. Thanks very much. Uh, it appears, and we had the report from our Brian Wilson in Washington not too long ago, it appears Brian told us that, the, uh, that there was a report of a hijacked plane south of Washington, D.C. and headed toward the nation's capital. Now, it appears that that is the flight that went down about 80 miles southeast of Pittsburgh. We told you that there was a confirmation from the Somerset uh, County Airport. Uh, authorities are saying that... Uh, that may be the plane that Brian Wilson spoke of. Um, let's take you back again to New York and an absolutely horrific scene in lower Manhattan, the entire lower end of the island covered in smoke and, f and floating debris. And what's missing? The Twin Towers of the World Trade Center, 110 stories high. You are looking at the pictures uh, from, oh, the last half hour or so as the first tower simply collapsed on itself this and look at the debris raining down on other buildings imagine the horror uh, now here comes the second tower this is the one that had the tv antenna on top simply imploding on itself 110 stories the uh, workplace of some 50,000 people america the uh, loss of life here is going to be tremendous Molly Falconer is at one of the New York area hospitals. Uh, Molly, it's got to be a scene of absolute chaos there. Uh, John, this is an area under siege. Uh, the police have blocked off a block radius around one of the main hospitals here in New York, and paramedics are coming out onto the street asking people in the crowd yeah. to give blood. I'm sorry, the phone line isn't going in and out, but they're asking people in the crowd to give blood to the people who are coming into this hospital. There are stretchers out on the streets on dollies draped in white Falconer, thanks very much. And that is perhaps something that you can do if you are watching our coverage anywhere in America. Donating blood is going to be um, a very urgent today. Uh, the New York area hospitals are going to be swamped, and, and New York City itself may not be the place to try to do it. But anywhere in America, if you can donate blood, I think it will be helpful. Now, uh, we are once again trying to uh, find out exactly what happened in Western Pennsylvania. 
where a plane went down, a large plane went down just north of the airport, the Somerset County Airport, about 80 miles southeast of Pittsburgh. These live pictures on your screen now show you the, the scene in lower Manhattan where the twin towers of the World Trade Center essentially are gone. We have uh, with us on the phone uh, another former Secretary of Defense, Casper Weinberger. Uh, Mr. Weinberger, it's, it's good of you to join us. Thanks very much. Okay, thank you. How, how should, you know how Washington works. What should be happening right now? Well, what I think probably what is happening, that is the city is virtually shutting down. You see police and little knots in all the corners and uh, all the police cars are out of the uh, police uh, stations and uh, every available fire engine is uh, moving toward the Pentagon and I suppose there are going to be other targets where they'll have to uh, have to go to too. The rumors are floating all over the place and it's uh, it's generally a real siege situation. It's uh, it's very much as if the whole city were under under attack whereas probably it's a it's the two or three principal targets but uh, uh, the cumulative effect is that of a, of a city under siege. Have you ever planned for this kind of an attack in, well, in your experience at the Pentagon? The, uh, the attempt is, is to plan for everything, and there were always uh, uh, various discussions of uh, uh, what form an attack could take. Uh, most likely one was, uh, was a, a suicide uh, a car bomb uh, or a bus or some uh, heavy vehicle uh, being driven up to the uh, Pentagon, as happened in Beirut and in various other places. Uh, I think an aerial attack was considered uh, uh, not, not one of the things you, you, you heavily planned against. Uh, on the other hand, the, the uh, city is ringed with uh, Air Force uh, bases and Navy bases, and uh, the uh, ability to get the defensive planes in the air is, is very, very high. And at the same time, you, you would do what, what is being done, and that is closing off the entire airspace so that, you in, in effect, the whole Washington area is a no-fly zone so that any planes that are, can't identify themselves and get into that uh, are uh, to be shot down. And uh, those are the orders. That, that, that was basically the response that was always uh, contemplated, but uh, nothing on this scale was ever contemplated. You know that there are going to be cries for revenge for a response. Oh, Can America course. respond immediately, and if so, how? Well, the, the response has to be a response that is targeted at the people who did it. Uh, but there will undoubtedly be cries for revenge, and it's the slightest uh, uh, confirmation of uh, who did it or where it came from. Uh, there, these, these will be pursued. The, the, the loss of life has to be absolutely staggering because the, the two twin towers at the Trade Center, uh, there was not time to get them uh, evacuated, and uh, they're both down, and uh, the opportunities... Are, are tremendous now. Of course, they've evacuated the principal targets, the White House and the Capitol building, and and uh, various other points in the in the city. But uh, uh, certainly, there'll be calls for revenge, and and it's important that we that we identify the people who did it, and and that they be destroyed as quickly as possible. And that that's a proper response. All right. Secretary uh, Casper Weinberger, former Secretary of Defense, thanks very much for being with us. Just this word, one of our producers in Afghanistan has spoken with the Taliban, the titular government of Pakistan, of Afghanistan, I should say. The Taliban denies any responsibility. Now, that is not to say that the Taliban speaks for Osama bin Laden. But the Taliban, the government or would-be government, not recognized yet by the United States, as the government of Afghanistan is denying any complicity or any responsibility for these attacks. Well, clearly, uh, some terrorist experts that I've spoken to this morning say this has the signature of Osama bin Laden, that he has had uh, pilots, uh, although these apparently may be at least two hijackings, but he has had pilots on his payroll, three of the uh, of, of alleged conspirators who were involved in the East African bombing trial here in New York, uh, had pilot's licenses. Not to say that that's what happened here, uh, but they seem to indicate that this would have that signature. And, John, I'm hearing of a figure of 10,000 uh, here in New York City, perhaps, for, uh, for casualties on the World Trade Center. And it could go higher than that. Britt Hume, our managing editor, is in Washington, D.C. Britt, what are you hearing there? Well, you're seeing, John, that uh, live picture from our station, WTTG, of the, of the smoke and uh, dust still uh, coming from the Pentagon. And what we now understand is the case is in the place where that plane hit, 
Uh, we believe it now to have been a 737 commercial flight coming in. Uh, the walls of the build, the wall of the building, the outer wall of the building, and of course that building, as you know, is a series of concentric rings. So that uh, when you hit uh, the outer wall of the building, you're only affecting really that part of it. But that those walls are down, and you can see uh, the gutted areas inside, damage in that part, particular part of that very large building very extensive indeed. In, in addition, there was an earlier broadcast report here in Washington that there had been a car bomb outside the State Department. Uh, Terry Schultz, our reporter at the State Department, has talked to senior officials who say that that is not true. The State Department has, however, been evacuated, as has the Justice Department, uh, National Monuments, and all other major public buildings in Washington in terms of absolutely non-essential personnel. So you see something approaching now here in Washington, the kind of lockdown that we have now already seen in New York. The, the, the worry for officials obviously is that while the airplanes have done the great damage so far, they can have no guarantee that that will be the only kind of attack that will be launched. So they have to take seriously uh, any warning, any suspicious package, anything else that they hear that might indicate a further attack of a different kind. All right, Britt Hume in Washington, thanks very much. We have a report that the plane that went down in, uh, the, uh, in western Pennsylvania is a uh, 767. That's, of course, a wide-bodied plane capable of carrying upwards of 350 people. Uh, so there is, a, uh, an, there is a significant amount of the possibility of a significant amount of loss of life. However, it should be pointed out, uh, we are hearing reports that that crash near Pittsburgh may not be related to all of this. As you can imagine, the air traffic control system is, is overloaded, to say the least, at this point. Nationwide, there is a lockdown on, on flights. No new flights have been allowed to take off nationwide for the last two hours. It is an air traffic controller's nightmare to, to keep those planes not only on the, on the ground, but also to get on the ground those planes that had been in the air. And again, you are looking at the pictures of lower Manhattan where the World Trade Center is gone. The Twin Towers slammed into today in a coordinated attack by jetliners. We're seeing one of them here on taped replay. This happened about 10 minutes after 9. A jetliner slamming into the World Trade Center after an earlier jetliner, apparently hijacked by Amer from American Airlines. Um, here is the, uh, the, the, the first of those towers coming down. This is the one that was actually hit by the second plane. It was hit lower. There was more weight on those steel girders that had been damaged, and here comes the second tower, the tower with the uh, signature television antenna on top, both of them simply imploding in on themselves. Our Shepard Smith has a view of uh, much of what's going on. He is on a rooftop in Manhattan. Shepard, what can you tell us? Shep Shepard Smith is with us. Shepard, we are on 47th Street, high above the Fox News headquarters. 47th Street between 7th Avenue or Broadway and 6th Avenue on a spectacular day in Manhattan. And right over my right shoulder is the spot where the World Trade Center stood just a couple of hours ago. Uh, our engineer, Peter Blanchaforti, was standing here on top of this building, uh, arranging to have this live broadcast set up when the World Trade Center just, just started to collapse. Uh, Peter, which side went first? Uh, the east side went first. The one closest to the Verizon building side, and that went about a little over a half hour ago, and the second one followed about 15 minutes later. Um, what, what was going through your mind? Just all the people. It's all the people. It was just, it was un unreal. I don't know how to describe it. So we were setting up for uh, the camera shot, and just to see it there one minute and then gone the next, you can't describe it. Just well, I was... <clears throat> I was personally uptown on the Upper East Side of Manhattan at just about 96th and 3rd Street uh, when, when the call came out and uh, probably took 30 minutes to get ready and then began what is a very familiar trip from the Upper East Side to Midtown Manhattan, uh, coming down Fifth Avenue, straddling Central Park on what is an absolutely spectacular fall day in Manhattan. And there was a, there was a pall over this city like, like you really cannot imagine. When coming down Fifth Avenue, uh, the tunnels which lead you through Central Park from the east side to the west side of Upper Manhattan were closed. There were police officers on streets. Uh, there were women on street corners trying to get phone calls out and men seated on benches crying. It was, it was an unthinkable experience. And from this 
from this location, you can see almost all of lower Manhattan. And certainly we've gotten reports of what it has been like down there over the past couple of hours. Uh, certainly the scenes of carnage, something not witnessed in, in the United States history. And this will be a very long and difficult day. And the pictures to come will be overwhelming. But the important thing to remember, I believe, it, as a nation, is for us all to take a deep breath and, and remember the person next to you and don't allow yourself to, uh, to fall into the abyss which it appears those two buildings have. Uh, the New York City Fire Department and Police Departments are all on full alert. All fire, all fire Department personnel in all five boroughs have been ordered to report to their firehouses. It is my understanding that all the bridges and tunnels in the, in the city are closed, that there is no one allowed inside and out. This building on which I'm standing is the headquarters of the News Corporation, but houses literally thousands of workers on 45 stories. Initially, in the initial confusion, no one knew quite what to do, but now in this building, and I'm quite confident in skyscrapers across Manhattan, uh, security is at the door. No one is allowed in or out without an ID. Now anyone who leaves is not allowed back in, except, of course, for news personnel. And, and the main thing that's being urged everywhere you go is calm that this is a time to remain calm. Uh, we, we are hit with a national crisis unprecedented. And, and the word from people on the street, from the mayor of New York City and others is, it's time to put your arms around a neighbor, take a deep breath, and try to get through this. Uh, there are certainly the inevitable concerns of what will happen in this city in the days to come. Uh, mayor Giuliani has an enormous police force of more than 40,000. The city is equipped, we have always been told, to handle any level of disaster. And certainly, New York's finest and New York's bravest uh, will do their dead level best to make sure that this city uh, remains as calm as is humanly possible. The Empire State Building in the foreground here, as you can see, and it's my understanding that in the moments after the first collision happened, uh, the Empire State Building was put on alert. I was listening to a radio reporter from 1010 Winds, a local uh, radio station, which had dispatched a reporter there saying that there was an orderly exodus going on. I can tell you that for the thousands who are in this building, the exodus was orderly. The drive through the streets, uh, an eerie, eerie calm, uh, tears on avenues and streets as, as I made my way here. People, some of them wandering in front of buildings at St. Patrick's Cathedral in the heart of Midtown, where you turn to come to this building. Uh, there were hundreds of people out front, some on their knees at the front of that building, uh, saying prayers for the no doubt thousands who were in those buildings and in that area when the two jets crashed into them. Now back to you downstairs in the studio. All right, Shepard Smith with our rooftop view here from Midtown Manhattan. Again, to recap, the Twin Towers gone now, virtually obliterated after they were struck uh, by two jetliners, one of them apparently an American Airlines flight from Boston to, La to uh, Los Angeles that was hijacked earlier today. And Washington under attack as well, a U.S. airplane uh, crashing just outside the wall of the Pentagon. Our David Schuster is there and has an update. You can still see the smoke pouring from the building. David? Well, that's right, John. And we're actually, our office is on the north side of the Pentagon. And even over here, despite how vast this building is, you can now actually see the smoke uh, in all the hallways. And we can feel it uh, in our office. The eyewitnesses are telling us that at approximately 940 this morning, a, a U.S. airplane uh, was headed, it seemed, towards National Airport, which is just a couple of miles away from the Pentagon, uh, when it then apparently veered, flew too low and crashed into the south wall by the helipad. Uh, the helipad is, is sort of a helicopter landing pad that is used for the Secretary of Defense and, and military leaders when they uh, travel sometimes in and out of the Pentagon. And apparently on that side, eyewitnesses who were on Highway 110 and 395, which have a great vantage point of that side of the Pentagon, reported a huge ball of fire and smoke billowing out. Um, I was in a taxi cab on 110 when all of a sudden you could see thick black smoke filling the air over Arlington National Cemetery. And as we got up close, um, fire trucks uh, were screaming towards the Pentagon. Uh, the building was uh, somewhat chaotic. There was uh, an evacuation. Officials were, uh, military leaders uh, of all the services were heading out of the Pentagon. There were concerns about whether there was discussion among military leaders about uh, whether to conduct a full-scale evacuation, where to bring the fire trucks at our office here at the, at the Pentagon, and, and also 
cell phone lines in the entire area were not, not working. It was impossible to get a cell phone. Uh, when we arrived here, we started getting reports uh, from uh, from people inside the Pentagon of, of on the south side, on the outer ring. And remember, there are five or six different rings of offices at the Pentagon uh, of, uh, of a ball of fire of a large explosion, approximately 940. At first, there were some conflicting accounts about whether an airplane was actually involved because a lot of people in the Pentagon did not hear an airplane flying overhead. Uh, but then witnesses outside of the Pentagon who had a clear vantage point of the, uh, of the, of the helipad described a silver and red U.S. airplane, according to the eyewitnesses, described as a 737 that flew too low and crashed uh, into the side. Intellig counterintelligence sources are confirming to Fox News that it was a commercial aircraft uh, that, uh, that was apparently hijacked and, and flown into the Pentagon. Uh, the damage, I suppose, could have been a little bit worse if it had scored a direct hit or it hit more in the center of the Pentagon, and it is a vast building with 23,000 employees. And while most of those employees have been evacuated, the National Military Command Center, which is in a bunker in the basement of the center of the Pentagon, is still in operation. That is the key office here at the Pentagon as far as coordinating any potential military response. Uh, our producer, Chris Wright, who has been roaming the halls of the Pentagon, said that offices uh, all over the place are closed, even at the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Some uh, key personnel there are not at their locations. Even some of the guards have left. But we can uh, assume that at the National Military Command Center, which is a very secure part of the building, they are still in operation and perhaps a testament to how big the Pentagon is and, and how strong it is. Uh, the people on this side of the Pentagon said they simply did not hear or see anything at 940 when the plane apparently crashed into the south side. But at this point, uh, it's pretty evident what's going on. You can hear the sirens in the hallway. Uh, the offices, even on this side of the building, are, are starting to fill with smoke. Uh, and in fact, uh, I'm going to stick the phone out the window and see if you can hear uh, the, the warning. Hold on one sec and see if I can drag the phone out there. Hold on one sec. Okay, so that, that's, the, that's the noise you're hearing inside the Pentagon uh, as my producer Chris Wright stuck the phone out into the hallway, and uh, you can actually just, you can see the smoke just uh, filling the air of the hallways here at the Pentagon. Back to you. All right, David Schuster at the Pentagon, thanks very much. Uh, Los Angeles is on a state of tactical alert. San Francisco, pretty much the same thing. Uh, in Virginia, Navy installations uh, are under uh, a con an increased security condition called ThreatCon Charlie. Uh, in New Jersey, once again, the uh, bridges and tunnels into Manhattan are closed. Again, to recap, let's take a look at what you are seeing there in the live pictures on your screen. The World Trade Center is now essentially gone. The Twin Towers were struck earlier this morning in coordinated attacks. We had a report of a, a jetliner smashing into uh, the first tower. Here comes a, a replay video of a second plane that smashed into the second tower about midway uh, shortly after 9 a.m. this morning, Eastern Time. That tremendous fireball, you can imagine, triggered uh, a fire inside the building that apparently weakened the structural elements to the point that the upper level of the building simply could not stand. Uh, it collapsed, and there again, this is a replay of the second plane smashing into the World Trade Center. It happened as we were on the air live shortly after 9 o'clock this morning, Eastern Time. Now, both towers went up in flames, and there was clearly a tremendous loss of life, but then came the catastrophic collapse. This the second collapse of the tower that was actually struck by the first plane. Um, all right, I'm, I'm told that that is the uh, first collapse, but no, that was the uh, tower with the, the tower, the television tower on top was the second one to go down. Uh, you can see the glass, the debris raining down. And imagine, folks, that uh, firefighters and police officers were all around the base of that building trying to evacuate people as it came down. I can't think of a more catastrophic, catastrophic collapse. Um, on top of that, we just heard from David Schuster, the Pentagon has been under attack. American Airlines is going to be holding a press conference about 25 minutes from now in Dallas to talk about one of the planes that was apparently involved in this World Trade Center collapse. We believe, well, in fact, American Airlines has told us that their Flight 11 from Boston to Los Angeles was hijacked this morning, and we believe that the hijackers somehow then commandeered the cockpit controls and, and flew that American Airlines plane 
uh, into the World Trade Center. That would probably be, we don't have confirmation, but probably be the first one uh, that hit. I think, uh, John, if I can interrupt just, I think investigators now are probably looking to see how the hijackers in this co coordinated attack were able to take over the controls. Did they shoot the pilots and then jump in the seats? Uh, what happened? Osama bin Laden, sources have told me, uh, has had pilots on his payroll. We have three pilots that were uh, accused of being uh, conspirators in the, world, in the uh, East African Embassy bombing trial here in New York City. So you certainly have perhaps investigators looking at a base of operation out of Boston and perhaps out of Pittsburgh since you have a U.S. airplane into the Pentagon, which their, their main hub is Pittsburgh, and another crash outside of Pittsburgh. Bill Daly, a former investigator for the FBI, has been good enough to stay with us. Bill, a couple of brief thoughts. Yeah, John, first of all, um, the, the broad base in which these, these attacks took place uh, took uh, a lot of coordination. Um, as Eric just mentioned, there may have been some involvement of uh, groups like Osama bin Laden or others. I would go on to say that as a result of the effort it took to, con to take these uh, uh, have these incidents take place is that we will find the people responsible is that the the trail will be hot we will go after them but everyone needs to realize a uh, state of calm needs to come over the country and realize we're in control we're these are incidents that have happened we're containing those and the government and the people will go on and america still stands let's go to our man in america's capital brit hume with some new information brit just just a few things uh, john uh, one is as you might imagine there is a stupendous traffic jam developing uh, in the washington area right now with all these buildings being evacuated and people people heading home uh, there was a report remember we reported earlier that the bomb squad had been sent uh, over to union station and apparently what that was about was what appeared to them to be an unexploded bomb over there now we're going to air we're going to be in for a lot out of this and uh, we need to keep our uh, keep our uh, our eyes open here to take things uh, with a grain of salt we haven't had a further report on whether there's been anything more to that than just why they went over there but that's what it was uh, in addition uh, the American Muslim Political Coordination Council which is a function of the Council on American Islamic Relations that's a group located here in Washington has released a statement condemning the uh, apparent terrorist attack saying quote American Muslims utterly condemn what are apparently vicious and cowardly acts of terrorism against innocent civilians join with all Americans in calling for the swift apprehension and punishment of the perpetrators no political cause it says could ever be assisted by such immoral acts in addition John there was a attack kick there was a report I should say kicking around on the air of an attack on Camp David the presidential retreat uh, north of Washington uh, senior officials in the administration are saying that that is not true so that's where that matter stands back All to right. you John Rich Hume thanks for the updated information yeah it it bears repeating there will be a lot of rumors a lot of panic swirling around today whatever you can do to stay calm and gather your loved ones around them and then just give them a hug is uh, certainly that that certainly uh, is advice that I think is worth taking uh, there is clearly a catastrophic loss of life in uh, the World Trade Center itself let's get an update now from our Rita Cosby who is in the Washington DC area Rita what have you found out well John I just wanted to let you know I've been talking to FAA officials and they are saying that they keep getting repeated reports of possible hijackings obviously as you said this is still very early on but they're getting a lot of different calls from throughout the country one report from Chicago they're looking into the crash in Pennsylvania which was a 767 a wide body plane they don't know if that is related or not but they're getting numerous calls it's obviously flooded they said at this point normally at this time of day there are typically 4,000 aircraft aloft in the United States. These are in, you know, international domestic flights, a variety of ones, and these include military planes as well as private and commercial aircraft. At this point, there are only just a few hundred at this point because they have ordered a national ground stop as of two hours ago. It's the first time in U.S. history that they have ordered all U.S. planes to be grounded immediately. International flights are being diverted to Canada and the ones that are domestic are being ordered to reach their destination as soon as possible. There are 450 airports in the U.S. that have control towers, and all of them have been told to alert their planes to hurry up and get in. Rita, I want to go to uh, Shepard Smith, who's on the roof of our building here in Midtown. Shepard? And know if you guys know about these fighter jets. Have we already reported on the fighter jets that are flying now? There are uh, fighter jets, we understand, Please flying tell us over Washington, D.C. Uh, Shepard Smith, jets. again, is not able to hear me, They're but uh, he sky. is on the building roof of our building here in Midtown Manhattan and says that fighter jets are circling 
Manhattan. We're standing they back have again been, uh, on, the, on the roof of uh, 1211 Avenue of the Americas at the uh, Fox News headquarters. And we're watching as two fighter jets circle what is lower Manhattan at quite an altitude. Peter Blangeforti is an engineer who's up here, and he was first to see them um, pretty high up, I guess. Very high up they were, and, and uh, I saw one in this direction, and it went down around by the World Trade Centers, and then I saw another one coming from the opposite direction, and we lost track of that one. But they seemed to look like fighter jets, but they were flying very high. Yeah, we can only assume at, that this is part of security that's now gone into place. John, John, you saw the world. You were up here setting up. Yes, sir. John, John McKay was up here setting up for this live shot when the when the first of the World Trade Centers fell. What? What? Tell me what was going on. Uh, uh, couldn't believe it. Peter just said the tower just fell, and we were working and turned and looked. And if we were looking like from so. here, it would be the tower on the on our left side. Yeah, the east the east one. Yeah, it just went into a, and then a huge cloud of uh, smoke and dust. So you're watching. Yeah. And then how long before the next tower? Uh, uh, about uh, 10 minutes, I would say. We were just busy working and just, uh, I mean, you know, butterflies in their stomachs and just uh, can't believe it's all happening. And, and the next thing we know, we turn around, the other one's going. We, Peter Blanchard so, wow. was explaining what it, how the noise and the way it came across the city. It seemed to have rumbled almost as if there was another large aircraft flying overhead, but really I think it was the collapse of the building, the volume of the explosion like just coming across, just sound waves coming across the city. The sound waves making their way up from lower Manhattan into the Flatiron District and up into Midtown coming like like a jet flying right overhead, I think is how you described it. Yeah, just the rumblings of, 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 a, of a jet sound almost, but it sounded more like a deep rumbling probably from the explosion of the collapse. It probably goes without saying at this point as we pan back down to where the World Trade Center stood just a couple of hours ago that uh, communications in this city have become very difficult. There are people all over the world, no doubt, who knew people who were inside those two buildings. Some of the facts as they stack up, uh, there are positives in all of this. In the first place, the first plane to crash uh, allowed time for so many people, we would pray, to get out of those two buildings. And certainly before the collapse happened, there was time for a number of people to get away. If you are considering or trying at this moment to make a phone call into the New York City area or the Washington area, it's time for the good of the country to put the phone down and wait and rely on mass communications because it, the, the people who are constructing what will be an enormous security, security situation now need as many lines as humanly possible. We don't have telephone lines on top. Our cell phones no longer get out. In the minutes after the first plane crashed, the phone began ringing at my house. It's the office. It's your mother. It's your father. It's your brother. It's your girlfriend. The phone lines immediately jammed throughout the city. Uh, there is a plea now for people around the world who may be watching not to use the telecommunication systems at this moment because the people who are mounting this rescue effort need it. Uh, it, it was described by Peter Blangeforti as others as a collapse around a pole which stood. Peter, you were describing what looked like maybe a big support column. You can keep the camera down there. You were describing still seeing something before the smoke rose. Before the smoke rose with the second tower when it, when it collapsed, you just saw it almost as if almost as if uh, one of the large garters or beams was going straight through the building and was the only thing left standing like a toothpick. And eventually that dropped too before the smoke engulfed everything else. But it was just a very strange, surreal sight. Well, there are certainly reports from all over the city of what it was like in the minutes after the, the two towers were struck. Uh, radio reports in the cab on the way here from reporters who were watching uh, people literally jumping out of buildings. Uh, Certainly there was a massive fire and smoke on many different floors of the building. Uh, the size of the jet would lead us, lead us to believe certainly that a number of floors were wiped out almost immediately. And then the chaos to try and get out of that building. But certainly there will be stories of miracles as we go through all of this. And those people who were in that building and after the first, after the first uh, explosion happened and the first crash happened, word of people who got out. I was listening on the radio broadcasting live just about an hour ago to a woman who was in the second tower to be hit. She was able to walk down 92 floors in what she described to be a pretty controlled situation. 92 floors down the west tower of the building down the west tower of the building. She was able to walk without any chaos to give a radio report live. It's my understanding that 
literally thousands of people in the time before the two towers collapsed were able to make their way away from that area. Mass transit was certainly down at the time, but it's a, it's a quick walk to get out of that area. They had, what, a good 45 minutes, Ann Woolsey, to begin to make their way to the north. In Midtown right now, I was looking over this building and down into, in fact, I'm doing so right now. I'm looking down onto 47th Street, down onto 47th Street, right below us. This to my right here, no, you, you don't have to, you, you can't see it from there, I don't believe. Maybe you can see Times Square over here. You can't. This is Times Square right below me. This is a scene right now at 11.15 in the morning, at 11.15 when this would be a sea of tourists on a spectacular day in Manhattan, and instead sirens, sirens echo across Manhattan, and that is the TKTS stand. I believe you're looking at that now. Are you, you're not able to see that, are you? The TKTS stand, can you see it on the lens? We can't. Pan back down to where the yeah, world's Yeah, numb are. shock uh, all over this city and all across America if you're watching us now. Uh, you're looking at uh, the, the lower end of Manhattan where the World Trade Center once stood. It is gone this morning, obliterated after two strikes in coordinated attacks from airliners, one of them apparently hijacked from American Airlines. We are going to be getting a news conference from American Airlines in about 15 minutes. Uh, in the meantime, an Arabic uh, newspaper, a fairly authoritative source, uh, the editor of that London-based newspaper says bin Laden, Osama bin Laden, the Saudi-born, now exiled to Afghanistan uh, 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 rebel leader, Osama bin Laden, according to this newspaper editor, warned three weeks ago that he would attack American interests, and he promised a very big one. Now, we cannot yet attribute this to Osama bin Laden, however, uh, that was the promise from this fairly authoritative London newspaper. Well, John, certainly uh, sources that I have talked to this morning, terrorist experts say this has the signature of Osama bin Laden, that he has the money, the uh, network, the ability to carry out this type of coordinated attack. And let me point out that uh, in the East African bombing terrorist trial here in New York City of the East African, of the bombing of the two embassies in, in East Africa, that three of the uh, alleged co-conspirators uh, one is now in jail, two are in jail, uh, two, uh, co one's in jail, two cooperated uh, for the United States government at the trial. They had pilot's licenses, uh, and they can fly airplanes. So I'm sure investigators right now are trying to uh, figure out a possible scenario. Were these planes hijacked by bin Laden people? Were the, did they rush up to the cockpit? You don't need a gun. You can use burst in several of them and strangle the uh, pilots or something uh, and then take over the controls of an airplane uh, near the uh, the last minute uh, while you're flying and divert the plane and smash it right into the uh, into the World Trade Center towers or in the Pentagon. Clearly that is a scenario that I would think that investigators are trying to go on right now to try and figure out exactly what happened, who is responsible uh, for this horrible act and I also think that we have now entered a new era clearly uh, a day of infamy. Uh, that we are not in this country clearly immune. September 11th, 2001, you're going to remember this day for a long time and a lot of things in this country will change as a result of what you're seeing on your screen now. Not all of the chaos, perhaps the worst of it in terms of loss of life, but not all of the chaos is taking place in Manhattan. Washington, D.C. also has been under attack. A uh, U.S. airplane apparently hijacked as well slamming into the outside wall of the outer ring of the Pentagon. Our David Schuster is there and has an update for us. David? John, we have the eyewitnesses describing it as a U.S. airplane at approximately 9.40 this morning, approaching National Airport from a strange approach. Uh, the eyewitnesses claiming that it then slammed into the south side of the Pentagon. We've just spoken with a U.S. Air spokesperson, Rick Weintraub, who says that all of their aircraft, commercial aircraft, have been accounted for and uh, says that they are uh, unaware of any one of their planes involved in this incident. So this may be a case of, of an eyewitness uh, misreading the markings on the plane, but we can confirm for you that there is a a large gaping 50-foot hole on the uh, E-ring of the south side of the Pentagon near the helipad. Uh, we're getting reports from uh, Arlington, um, formerly Arlington Hospital, which is now an Ananova Hospital, that uh, that injured are being taken there. The Pentagon has been evacuated. The, the smoke is still pretty thick here in the Pentagon, even on our side, the north side of the Pentagon. And uh, uh, most of the 23,000 employees here at the Pentagon have been evacuated. But again, we do not have confirmation on the uh, which commercial airliner may have been involved 
involved in this uh, particular incident at the Pentagon. U.S. Air says that it was not one of their aircraft, uh, that perhaps the red markings that an uh, that, uh, eyewitness saw may, might belong to uh, American or Southwest, which, uh, or American or, or one of the commuter airlines that fly in a national uh, airport, which is just a few miles away. But again, uh, we are confirming that uh, an intelligence, uh, counterintelligence source is confirming that it was a commercial aircraft that slammed into the Pentagon this morning. Uh, there's no indication yet on the number of injuries of those killed. Some initial reports are, are that some Arlington hospitals are being flooded with injuries. Uh, there were um, uh, dozens of fire trucks and ambulances that were streaking towards the Pentagon uh, at approximately uh, 945 this morning, and uh, most of the employees here uh, heading out of the building, and, and most of them are, are in fact now gone, but you can hear the sirens still throughout the Pentagon hallways. Uh, smoke still pretty thick here on this north side. It is worth noting, though, that uh, perhaps this, uh, this incident could have been worse. There are five rings, five concentric rings on the Pentagon, and the one that was struck on the south side by the helipad, which is where officials are land the helicopters and whatnot, is the E-ring, and apparently there's a large gaping hole. This particular ring uh, is, is sort of the offices of senior military personnel, but again, no indications about the number of injuries, the number of killed, but one would presume uh, that if the eyewitnesses were correct, and there's several eyewitnesses of a some type of commercial aircraft, perhaps as large as a 737, uh, that there would be uh, numerous fatalities involved in this incident, and still the, the aftermath still being felt here at the Pentagon, the entire area shut down, uh, uh, traffic has been blocked on 395 and 110, the main highways near the Pentagon, and, and smoke is still pretty thick coming out of the Pentagon at this hour. John? David, you mentioned that eyewitness report that, uh, that called it a, a U.S. airplane, and as you noted, U.S. Air is saying uh, their plane was not involved. Now, we are just getting a confirmation from American Airlines that a second airplane of theirs apparently was hijacked, Flight 77 from Dulles uh, Airport in Virginia to Los Angeles. It had 54 passengers on board. That may be, may be the plane that went down outside the Pentagon. American Airlines once again is confirming that it lost two planes today in apparent hijackings. The first one, Flight 11, from Boston to Los Angeles, 81 passengers on board. And uh, that apparently was the first plane of two that slammed into the World Trade Center, uh, that first one shortly before 9 o'clock this morning, Eastern Time. Uh, a second plane also slamming into the World Trade Center. Both towers of the Trade Center caught fire, and eventually both of them crumbled and collapsed. You can still see the cloud of dust and smoke that is uh, hovering over lower Manhattan. Fires are continuing to burn. Um, it otherwise would be a beautiful day in New York City, uh, but this has cast a tremendous cloud over the city as well as the nation. Two planes crashing into the World Trade Center and toppling them. Apparently, uh, two planes uh, from American Airlines have been hijacked and lost this day. We don't yet know where the third plane came from because not only did the two planes crash into the World Trade Center, uh, but one plane crashed into the Pentagon uh, in uh, suburban Washington, D.C., just across the river from Washington. You're looking now at uh, pictures in midtown Manhattan uh, where people are trying to go about their business, but in the most stunned kind of way. You can see emergency vehicles are at work throughout the city. Uh, the mayor has a special bunker. Maybe Eric Sean can tell us more about this. Ironically, it was always thought to be um, disaster-proof because it was located on the 14th floor of a building in lower Manhattan, but clearly... Uh, that kind of thing can come under attack Yeah, as the, well. the emergency bunker, so-called bunker, which really isn't a bunker, it was uh, in an office building of the World Trade Center. Uh, complex, not one of the two towers that unbelievably and so horribly have collapsed, but in a uh, building that houses uh, the Commodities Exchange and some other exchanges, which is at the foot of the World Trade Center. It is, uh, I think, number six or number nine World Trade Center. That is the emergency command center for the city of New York. It was moved there from uh, police headquarters uh, about uh, within the last two years or so. That uh, thought to be safer, much more sophisticated uh, availability through uh, communications, uh, much more secure. Uh, it was felt than the uh, police department at that time. 
so that uh, is the center. We can only hope we have no report at the moment uh, of, of the condition of the emergency center for uh, New York City. Uh, but then again, the mayor may also be in uh, City Hall trying to deal with the emergency service, the EMS uh, uh, and tactical units. I've been told uh, through uh, EMS that the ca casualties could, uh, the, the numbers being bandied around this morning, John, are 10,000. Uh, or so 50,000 people work in both towers of the World Trade Center. This happened uh, on a beautiful day, 9, 10 or so in the morning when people are going to work, uh, showing up in their offices of the, uh, of the massive World Trade Center complex that houses banks, houses uh, financial institutions, houses uh, the headquarters for the Port Authority of New York, which uh, runs the airports uh, and the bridges and tunnels. It has uh, also has the governor's office uh, and other uh, offices in the World Trade Center built, uh, uh, of course, in 1973. And the 1993 bombing of the, uh, of the World Trade Center the investigator, the uh, terrorists at that time who were from Jersey City, uh, part of a, a local mosque, uh, drove a van laden with uh, explosive into the garage. Six people uh, were killed, thousands injured. Uh, at that time, they were not able to bring it down. That was the, uh, the aim. This time, so horribly and sadly, it seems that terrorists uh, perhaps obviously have succeeded. In terms of uh, uh, you, you mentioned the report earlier from a London newspaper that is credible in terms of Osama bin Laden. Let me also point out, we're going to get some more information about this, that uh, experts, uh, terrorist experts say he has and does have pilots on his payroll, that three of the co-conspirators, alleged co-conspirators in uh, the East African bombing trial had pilot's licenses. Two of them flipped, testified for the government against those who suspects accused uh, of, and who were then convicted of the uh, embassy bombing trial. Uh, so uh, does that work up a scenario that uh, perhaps terrorists were on these planes, hijacked them, and then near the last moment uh, were able to divert them and inca incapacitated the uh, crew, the pilots, uh, completely jumped in those seats and then uh, themselves just, just flew those planes into the buildings. Uh, I was coming to work this morning and saw the first plane, uh, which appeared to be a 737 or, sm or small Airbus, a twin-engine jet, flying very low south downtown over Fifth Avenue. Uh, I was right near Rockefeller Center. Everybody was looking up, saying it's kind of unusual. And then it banked right. Banking right would indicate it was heading right toward the World Trade Center, and it disappeared from my view. And then heard the report uh, that, though, is a, a common air airway from the north, that plane, if that indeed was the American Airlines plane from Boston, that would make sense. Coming from the north, coming from Boston, on the air route uh, to make a, uh, a left leg base and then your, your, your final into uh, LaGuardia, but then All at right. the last moment diverted into this horrible, horrible catastrophe. There will be apparently no news conference from American Airlines, but Mike Tobin, our uh, correspondent, has a statement from the airline. Mike, can you bring it to us? Yeah, the statement is this. Uh, I'll read it verbatim to you. American Airlines confirmed today that it lost two aircraft in tragic incidents this morning. Americans said the flights were Flight 11, a Boeing 767 en route from Boston to Los Angeles with 81 passengers, nine flight attendants, and two pilots, and Flight 77, a Boeing 757 operating from Washington, Dulles, to Los Angeles with 58 passengers, four flight attendants, and two pilots. The statement further reads, because of the heightened security due to the nature of today's events, American said it is working closely with U.S. government authorities and will not release more information at this time. The government has shut down the entire air traffic system in the United States. American TWA, American Eagle will not operate. And a statement from uh, Donald J. Carty, chairman and CEO of American Airlines, says we are horrified by these tragic events. Our thoughts and prayers go out to the families of all involved. And it's got a note here about uh, where media calls should be directed. All right, Mike Tobin, thank you very much. Yeah. A 767, apparently, a wide-body plane capable of carrying very many more than the 81 on board, uh, was one of those uh, uh, apparently hijacked. We're going to be getting an updated news conference from the security chief at Logan Airport in Boston shortly. Meantime, I want to take you down to Brit Hume, uh, just to repeat, the nation's capital also under attack. Um, a, a plane slamming into an outside wall of the Pentagon this morning. Britt Hume, our Washington managing editor, is there. Britt? Uh, uh, John, we are, there are police sources that are saying, we need to be very careful about this, uh, there are police sources saying that there is a plane coming up the Potomac River at a high rate of speed. This would be consistent with earlier warnings that we'd heard from police sources here in Washington, not from federal government sources or from the military. 
that an airplane was uh, some distance away and appeared to be headed toward the city. So that is something obviously we will watch with considerable urgency here. This, this, this may be a nation at this moment that it needs to hear from its government. The Secret Service is not saying exactly where the President of the United States is. We know that he left his, his event uh, out of town and was headed. We, knew, we now know not exactly where. We do know this, that, the, that there was a conference call this morning, presumably after the President was in the air, that, uh, that was headed by the Vice President, Condoleezza Rice, other officials. And what has been what is called the federal response plan has been has been um, put in place. Uh, this was a emergency response plan for a variety of different kinds of disasters, floods, hurricanes, uh, uh, calamities of that kind. It involves 28 federal agencies led by the Justice Department. Uh, the Federal Emergency Management Agency coordinates uh, on on the president's behalf. Obviously, this is more of a disaster relief type of uh, concern, but a terrorist attack response is part of what they do, and that plan is in place and is underway. Meantime, obviously, we continue to watch the horizon south of Washington to see if anything comes of these reports from police sources. We caution you, these are just police sources. We're not hearing this yet from any other federal source or from any intelligence sources or from the military. So we watch uh, with somewhat bated breath, John. Hume in Washington. Commerce in America is not exactly going to come to a grinding halt, but it is going to be significantly curtailed today. Uh, the markets, the stock market, the NASDAQ have not opened yet because of, of course, the catastrophic collapse of the World Trade Center after these two attacks, apparently by hijacked airliners. Also, um, it, it should be noted that uh, airplanes across the country have been ordered to stay on the ground. The Federal Aviation Administration hours ago said that no airplanes are going to be allowed to take off today. So if uh, you were planning on heading to an airport to take even a, an innocuous vacation flight today or something, don't bother. There will be no planes taking off. Uh, of course, authorities are very nervous uh, that there could be more strikes in the offing like the kind you just saw. Uh, that apparently a hijacked airliner slamming into the second of the World Trade Center towers, a tower that collapsed a short time after you saw that explosion. The former Speaker of the House, Newt Gingrich, is uh, joining us now uh, from our Washington Bureau. Uh, Newt, what's your reaction and what should be America's reaction to these, these developments? Well, first of all, I think everyone's reaction has to be that this is a tragedy for the families that are directly involved, the families that were uh, hijacked on those airplanes, the uh, flight attendants, the pilots, the people who have died today in the World Trade Center and the people who have died today in the Pentagon. Uh, I think all of us have to reach out in our hearts to them. But beyond that as a nation, this is a 21st century Pearl Harbor. This is a 21st century kind of war. Uh, I think we need to refer to it as an act of war. This was, a, this was not a random event by a random terrorist. This was a systematic, complex operation of military proportions undertaken cleverly by people who have state support and who only survive because they have the support of some states that protect them. And I hope that the American government, the president, and the American people will react to this as an act of war uh, this will be more casualties, I believe, than Pearl Harbor. It is at least as horrifying as Pearl Harbor, and it deserves a complete and total American response to ensure that it never happens again. When you mention the number of casualties, Newt, I'm reminded that roughly 55,000 American servicemen died in Vietnam. There could have been almost that many people in the World Trade Center buildings today. Not that all of them necessarily would be casualties, but clearly we are preparing for a catastrophic loss of life. This is a terrible event, but it will become even more terrible if it isn't the basis of a deliberate, systematic, and total American response. This reminds us that we're all vulnerable. As you heard, people in Chicago are leaving. They're evacuating major buildings. People in Boston are leaving. Here in Washington, I walked past the mall. People are leaving. I talked with a policeman at the Capitol who have sealed off our national capital. We need to recognize we can only be a free society if we are prepared to relentlessly pursue and eliminate those who would engage in this kind of war against civilians and against a peaceful society. 
Newt, if you'd be good enough to stay with us, I want to bring into the conversation Bill Daly. He is a former FBI agent who worked on the World Trade Center security precautions after what we thought was a terrible event back in 1993, an event that left six dead and a thousand people injured. Bill, could you ever prepare for something like this? Oh, this is one of those scenarios, John, that uh, is in the, uh, the worst case you know, planning. Is that it's those things that, uh, um, close to an act of God, is that it's uh, almost impossible to plan and protect against. When you have a, a major free city uh, with airliner routes that are right nearby the World Trade Center, to, to ever think that you'd be able to uh, protect it from, uh, from that type of an assault. We rely in these cases on our intelligence gathering network, our international domestic uh, 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 terrorist task forces and, and intelligence gathering mechanisms to help us. Apparently this has, uh, has let us down in this particular case, but it's not to say that uh, we're not on the rebound, that we will not investigate and find the people who are responsible for this. Um, and it's also not to say that this will happen and be repeated across the country. I think we need to have a, a state of calm and people understand that uh, uh, the government will secure these locations, we will investigate, and we will protect the rest of the country as best we can. Um, but these, these are type of events, John, that uh, um, next to nuclear disasters are in the worst case scenario planning and, and almost get down to the point of so catastrophic that um, it's difficult to develop exact plans for it. I'm sure we'll hear today stories of, of heroism, we'll hear stories of tragedy, uh, we'll hear stories of, of people rising beyond what they were ever called to do, because these type of plans, particularly even in New York, as much as we're, uh, we're New Yorkers that take on a lot, uh, this is, goes far beyond anything we've been challenged with to this, to this date. Uh, Newt Gingrich, you mentioned that uh, there has to be a coordinated response by the United States. Obvious, obviously, it's, it's too early to know who is responsible, but let's say that, uh, that it turns out that Osama bin Laden is somehow behind this. So what does America do? What kind of pressure can we bring to bear on the Taliban government uh, that is harboring him that we haven't brought to bear already? Well, let me just say that, that we don't know yet who's done this, and I don't think we should rush to judgment. But it is fair to say that bin Laden has claimed credit for having sponsored and financed and structured earlier attacks on the embassies in Africa, for example. It is clear that three weeks ago bin Laden said he would strike the United States in the United States. And the only point I'd make today in the middle of a tragedy, I think we first have to take a deep breath and recognize how big this tragedy is for the American people, that I don't think we have to become paranoid. I don't think we have to go into a bunker mentality. But for eight years, we have said publicly that bin Laden is a major threat to the United States. And yet for eight years, while we have launched Tomahawk missiles and we've done other things, we haven't taken him as seriously as he has taken us. And all I'm suggesting is that if we don't have a decisive response to convince observers that you cannot kill innocent Americans in peacetime without retaliation of severe proportions, that other groups and other people will decide that the most open society in the world is also the most vulnerable and they'll exploit those vulnerabilities. I think this is as decisive a moment for our future as Pearl Harbor was in a different way. As I said earlier, this right. is a 21st century opponent, not uh, an obvious nation state, but in the Sudan, in Afghanistan, in a number of other places, uh, we know where bin Laden's assets are uh, and, we'd, right. and, and we'd need to take the risk of going after them. Newt Gingrich, well-spoken, thank you. Uh, let's go to Edie Donahue, who has uh, some information from our newsroom. Edie? Good morning, John. The target this morning is America, the enemy at this point unknown. But as we were doing our show this morning, Fox and Friends, very, at the very end of the show, the first uh, airplane crashed into one of the World Trade Center buildings, the North Tower. That apparently was American Airlines number 11 from Boston to L.A. It had been hijacked, apparently 92 people on board. Just minutes after that, within 10 minutes or so, the second World Trade Center tower was attacked. That the South Tower, that apparently was a 757, another American Airlines flight, they believe, from Dulles to Los Angeles. Uh, then about 45 minutes later, it was the Pentagon. Moving on down to the Washington, D.C. area, the Pentagon is the next place attacked as it continues. The south wall, there's now a 50-foot gaping hole there. Apparently another airplane that was hijacked 
uh, crashed into the wall that's near the helipod, helipad there, and that is where the, uh, the highest ranking officials are able to take off in the helicopter. Uh, at 10 a.m. then, just about 15 minutes like, after like that, uh, a 757 from United, number 93, crashed about 80 miles southwest of Pittsburgh, and uh, that flight en route from Newark to San Francisco. Uh, area hospitals here in the New York City area are taking in all the wounded from the World Trade Center. As you know, those uh, the, the towers are 110 stories tall. Uh, while we do know that some people were able to get down from the 92nd floor all the way to the ground and managed to escape safely, there have been untold, untold injuries in this and untold deaths. Several area hospitals say they are already booked to capacity. They're asking people in the waiting rooms to start donating blood immediately because there is a desperate need for it right now. At this point nationwide, all U.S. commercial planes have been grounded. The planes that were already in the air were instructed to land at the nearest airport. Incoming international flights were diverted to Canada, and uh, even Canada now, some airports in Canada su supposedly have been closed. As uh, you know, the president left Sarasota, and he is trying to get control of the situation, but it is changing rapidly. We'll continue updating you on the latest. John, back to you. All right, A.D. Donahue in our newsroom, and we should uh, note that the Secret Service is not confirming the president's location he is okay he's aboard Air Force One but exactly where he is the Secret Service will not say David Schuster is at the Pentagon where uh, there was that strike by that third aircraft earlier today uh, David what's the latest John we can now report that the fire here at the Pentagon has spread from beyond the E ring the outside ring of the south side to at least two maybe three of the inner rings and looking at pictures now of the Pentagon there is a gaping hole uh, at least a hundred to 150 feet wide on the south side of the Pentagon where five floors of the Pentagon have collapsed. The fire officials, the firefighters are pouring water onto that side of the Pentagon, but we can literally see now that a fire uh, has spread and has broken out at least now about uh, 300 feet down away from where the firefighters uh, are working on the fire. And so now fire trucks are pulling up to this other side of the Pentagon. We believe this is all, of course, related to the one airline crash. And officials, again, uh, now saying that the, all of the U.S. air aircraft have been accounted for, that this was a silver jetliner, perhaps American, perhaps United, that hit the Pentagon. But again, the, the news from here is that the, the fire at the Pentagon is still out of control. Smoke is still billowing off of the roof from some of the inner rings now at the Pentagon, and the fire has also spread along some of the outer rings, spreading from the south side towards the north side. We, our office in the Pentagon is actually uh, in the north side on the E ring, and uh, we can now see smoke coming not only from uh, to our left down the hallways, but also to our right, and, and smoke still pretty thick. So this fire at the Pentagon still out of control, uh, and literally, when you remember the pictures of the Oklahoma City bom uh, bombing with the, the Murrow building completely sort of burrowed out uh, like a sort of a, like a horseshoe. That's what it looks like for a part of the Pentagon where literally there's a huge, uh, maybe 100 feet hole, uh, and you can actually see the offices carved out like a giant U on the side of the Pentagon. The Pentagon, of course, uh, the, uh, there's concentric rings where all the walls are connected, and now suddenly there's this giant hole and, and a fire that clearly has spread to some of the inner rings of the Pentagon. Uh, the Pentagon was evacuated at about 10 o'clock this morning. Some 23,000 employees cleared out. Uh, the reason that the, the fire uncontrolled might still be a problem is that the, the people who remain in the Pentagon, aside from a couple of journalists here, includes officials at the National Military Command Center. They have a bunker in the basement of the Pentagon in the center of the building. Uh, those are the officials that would coordinate the uh, military response. Those are the officials that might coordinate the, uh, uh, the dispatch of some of the uh, fighter jets that uh, reporters have seen flying over New York and flying over Washington. It, it might at some point, I suppose, become a problem if the fire continues and they've got to start pouring water on the center of the Pentagon, that, that, that at that point perhaps there may become uh, some potential uh, problem for the officials. That Let's are go here. to uh, David Schuster in Washington. Thank you. Let's go to Logan Airport in Washington. This is a security news conference. We've closed the airport to all arriving and all departing flights. We've increased our security measures. We've shut down all the construction sites within Logan Airport, both air side and land side. And we have shut down all security checkpoints and removed all passengers who had been previously screened out into the non-secure part of the airport. We've activated our Family Assistance Center at the Hilton Hotel based upon some reports that some of these flights may have originated from Boston. 
Uh, we're asking the, the uh, media's assistance to notify any family members uh, that may have had families flying on those flights that uh, we've had various reports on uh, to call these following numbers. American Airlines, 800-245-0999. Uh, secondly, family members can call a Massport number, 617-568-3100. We're also uh, urging people not to come to the airport at this point in time. We've increased the shuttle buses from the terminals to the MBTA Blue Line stop, and the MBTA has increased the uh, frequency of um, subway uh, transportation. Uh, we are in close communication with the FAA, the FBI, state police, Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And that's all I have right now. Joe, you've got to tell us more about these planes that left this morning. What, what flights do you have reports on? The flights, uh, I cannot confirm or deny any flight numbers because I have not received official notification on any flight numbers. So how can we get people to call these well, numbers so they everybody who's got a flight? Okay, I, I do believe uh, several of the media outlets are broadcasting several flight numbers. I believe uh, they're broadcast flight number 11, American Airlines. Is there a second flight out of Boston? Involved. Involved in this? I, I don't know at this point in time. Were the buses hijacked? I cannot confirm that. What Has the airport accounted flight? for all outbound flights? Uh, that's uh, outside of the scope of the airport's responsibility. Uh, we're leaving it up to the FAA to conduct that activity. Joe, what is the code, Joe, what is the code Fort Knox? We have reports of employees screaming Fort Knox around the airport at the time that the planes went into the World Trade Center. That, I don't know what that means. Doesn't mean have any connotation here at Logan Airport. What about planes that are flying in here? Are they being rerouted somewhere else? Fly, uh, aircraft were, were flying into Logan Airport. Uh, we did take some arrivals, but now since the airport is shut down, uh, these flights will be diverted to uh, Canada. They're not taking flights either, Remove them for another area, yes. Where are they now and what are they They're being directed to seek either public transportation or their own transportation out of the airport. Leaving the airport? Yeah. No. How long do you anticipate the airport to be closed? It's indefinite at this time. Um, we're just, uh, we'll be meeting with the FAA. We'll be conducting an uh, analysis of our intelligence that we have. We'll make a determination later on this afternoon. Pardon me? All right, that is the situation at Logan Airport in Boston. Uh, one of these planes that was apparently used in a hijacking, uh, a hijacking that then slammed into the World Trade Center. Both towers of the World Trade Center are gone after being attacked, apparently, by two separate hijacked planes. One of those planes. Uh, an American Airlines flight from Boston to Los Angeles. In the meantime, folks, we should tell you uh, that United Airlines is saying it is concerned about Flight 175, that also a flight from Boston to Los Angeles. Uh, there is no word on what has happened to that plane. It was due in L.A. at 11.16 Pacific time, uh, and a spokesman for United Airlines would not say if they know where that flight is they are working with the FAA on it. Uh, so there is the possibility that we may not be done yet. This after two airplanes smashed into and eventually obliterated the World Trade Center and another smashed into the Pentagon. All of those buildings still uh, disastrously involved in flames. All right, uh, the uh, Speaker of the House, Dennis Hastert, and Senate Majority Leader Trent Lott have been taken to safe locations. Pres uh, a minority leader, I should say. President Bush is also safe aboard Air Force One. The Secret Service will not say where he is for obvious security concerns. Uh, we're quite confident that uh, when the president gets a chance, he will be making some kind of statement. Uh, but the president is safe. The Secret Service is simply not saying where he is. Also, the minority leader of the Senate, Trent Lott, and, um, and uh, House Speaker, Denny Hastert, 
we uh, know have been taken to safe locations as well. Uh, let's get an update on the situation in Manhattan. Molly Falconer is at St. Vincent's Hospital. Clearly there have been perhaps thousands of casualties today when those two towers came down. Molly, what can you tell us? John, this is a hospital under siege. This block is under siege. Police have got the entire area blocked off with uh, what looks like police barriers. So far, we have about 152 people who have come into this hospital. People are out in... We lost communications with uh, Molly Falconer. You can understand why. It is a chaotic day, and many of this city's and this nation's communications uh, infrastructure, satellite dishes, uh, television towers, and so forth were located on top of the World Trade Center. And the World Trade Center, both towers are essentially gone now, a, a smoking pile of rubble. As you can see, that smoke column still billowing out of lower Manhattan. Rick Leventhal was uh, in downtown Manhattan when the buildings came down and has an updated uh, update for us uh, from lower Manhattan. Rick? Well, John, uh, we're, we're on Church Street at Reed Street, for those of you who are familiar with Lower Manhattan, just a few blocks away from World Trade. Still thick black smoke billowing from the scene where both towers collapsed, again, just a few blocks away from us. We were standing out here on Church Street when both towers came tumbling down, and each time there was a huge cloud of smoke and debris that came roaring down this street, and everyone literally ran for their lives. At this point, the police have uh, been efforting to establish a perimeter. They're trying to keep people back and make sure that no one gets uh, interferes with their job, which is to try and uh, secure the area and then get inside that World Trade Center rubble to see whether or not they can locate any survivors who may have been inside the building or just outside the building when it came tumbling down. Uh, we want to bring in Mark Walsh, who's a, a, a freelancer for Fox. You live just a few blocks away and witnessed. Dude, I was, I was, I live on the 43rd floor of a building, which is five blocks from the World Trade Center itself. I witnessed the entire thing from beginning to end. People talk about how it looked like a movie. I know when I came walking down here early this morning and saw both towers on fire and people on every street corner, it was, it was, Dude. it was like a movie. But you watched the planes hit the towers. I was watching with my roommate. It was approximately several minutes after the first plane had hit. I saw this plane come out of nowhere and just ream right into the side of the Twin Tower, exploding through the other side. And then I witnessed both towers collapse, one first and then the second, mostly due to structural failure because the fire was just too intense. Uh, obviously, there were, there were a lot of people inside the buildings at the time. Two guys um, from the 7th Precinct, uh, the 1st Precinct, the fire department right here, the 7th truck, they, those guys were all right there at, at ground zero when those things went down. And God bless. I know there's a lot of guys there that were around there, and hopefully they made it out. What was happening around you and the streets around you as this was all going down? Absolute pandemonium. From my viewpoint, up 43 floors, I could see people running like ants, just absolutely scurrying for their lives, billows of smoke coming through the streets, just walking down the street, just pushing everybody back. And then several minutes after, it looked like it had just snowed over the entire area. Yeah, the, the, the debris, the soot was thick on the street. You, there's still a, a, a dusting of it out here. Uh, but but when, I, when I was standing here and, and the towers collapsed, we, we saw police officers running for their lives, screaming, get back, get back, get back. And I'll tell you, that's a wake-up call when you see cops running for their lives. And people, too, women's pushing baby carriages, that sort of thing. Well, you had the first tower first. That one, When that first went down, it just pushed everybody back. And it was a good 15 minutes before the second tower finally right. collapsed. Yeah. And it was just overwhelming. And by that point, it was just insane. Well. well. Uh, uh, hearing a lot of similar stories from people who were inside the building. One gentleman we spoke to earlier today, John, uh, was on the 77th floor and said it was a relatively orderly evacuation at that point after the first plane hit the first tower. Everyone going down the stairs, not a lot of panic. But when they got to the sixth floor, he says they felt a second shake. And that, then people started to really be concerned. Uh, obviously, there were uh, people uh, in the building at the time of this, and, and uh, some of those people. Uh, they haven't recovered them yet, and, and that's a, a big issue right now is trying to get the, the rescue workers and, and the emergency crews to the building. There were police officers there and emergency crews there uh, when this was all happening, and and they were right at ground zero when it all went down. Can, so can we talk to you? What's your role out here right now? I'm uh, just standing by right now. can't say what role I'm playing right now. Well, uh, w <laughs> there's a lot of standing by. There's also concern that some of these other buildings might actually come down. 
This building right here with the glass uh, that you see, this the nearest tall building, uh, that has structural damage as well. Uh, we saw a lot of glass broken out, and a corner of the building appeared to be uh, in distress. And there's concern that there might actually be another collapse uh, of that building. And I can also tell you that when we were when we first got here, we were a few blocks up. We could actually see debris from one of the planes on the street, a huge gear at one point, uh, looked like a piece of an engine at another point. So that debris is still littering that area up there. They had roped it off with police tape, and they had FBI agents out there, and that was just before the first tower came tumbling down, and everyone went running away. So there's evidence out here. There's a lot of work left to be done, and uh, as you can imagine, the streets are, are a bit chaotic at this point. But I just want to show you one one drastic uh, 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 difference looking north as opposed to looking south. Blue skies, uh, clear streets, not a, not a lot going on over there, but then come back around this way, Dan, and uh, you'll see just... Uh, smoke billowing from the scene, uh, still obviously a, a major disaster waiting to be cleaned up. Back to you, John. All right, Rick Leventhal in Lower Manhattan, thank you very much. A, a dark day in America, September 11th, 2001. Two planes strike the World Trade Center, obliterate it. It has collapsed. Another plane hits the Pentagon. It is still on fire, and we may not be done yet. Britt Hume, our Washington managing editor, is in D.C. Britt? Uh, John, just some notes from our State Department reporter Terry Schultz. Uh, all U.S. diplomatic posts worldwide have been notified of the, what has happened here and have been encouraged to take what is called appropriate action. Ambassadors in such a situation have the right, should they choose to, to close embassies. It's worth noting here that Secretary of State Colin Powell is out of the country. He was down in Lima, Peru, is on his way back. He has released a remark saying that this is a terrible tragedy and adding, this is from Colin Powell, Secretary of State, the U.S. government will find those responsible. At the State Department, which has been uh, largely evacuated, it's worth noting that uh, De Deputy Secretary of State, and now for the moment at least Acting Secretary of State Richard Armitage, is there and has elected to stay in the building. So that is the state of play here as we continue to watch. Uh, fire, which as you noted, is still burning at the Pentagon, and we watch obviously the southern skies to see whether anything comes of this report of a plane bound here. I should add to that, by the way, this report to this business about a plane being on its way here, that the uh, that that Senator Kent Conrad, uh, remember the Democratic leadership on the Hill, chairman of the Budget Committee, uh, told our Colin Spencer just a short time ago that he that he was aware that 16. Uh, U.S. warplanes had been scrambled and were in the air in this area. So any airplane, I think, that attempts to attack Washington or crash into it is probably going to have to contend with them, and I wouldn't uh, want to bet that it would ever happen. Which, But it does raise the possibility, of course, of an ugly incident in the skies uh, in or near Washington. John? Uh, Britt, we know that uh, President Bush is okay. We know he is on board Air Force One, but it would seem that they are not going to be bringing him back to Washington at this point. I, John, I don't think we know that, and I think that um, that there's a very great likelihood that they will that the that the Bush administration will want to have him here and in familiar surroundings and seen in familiar surroundings as soon as possible in an effort to calm the nation. This is a nation right now, mind you, except for the things that we have been able to quote that except for the remarks and it, the additional remarks that we heard from President Bush earlier this morning just before he took off from down in Florida to come back here, this is a nation that has not heard publicly from its government. And uh, at such times, obviously, it is characteristic of a government that you send somebody out, they stand before a camera, uh, they tell you what the state of play is, they furnish information, they seek to uh, assure people. Uh, under these circumstances, with people evacuating buildings in Washington and everybody on a high state of alert, it's understandable that, that wouldn't have happened. But one has to imagine uh, that the administration will want that to happen as soon as it is safe for it to happen. So I would imagine that the president is headed in this direction, whether he is headed to the Andrews Air Force Base right outside Washington where he would normally land or some other, some other location. Obviously, we don't yet know. We've got an eye on that for sure, though. Is there a broadcasting capability aboard Air Force One? Could he address yes. the nation from yeah, the plane if he chose? Every known form of modern communication is there, but my guess is, John, that he'll want to be seen. Uh, I don't think he wants to be broadcast, you know, with, with, with Americans in the streets and, and, uh, and others, um, um, uh, people within government bu buildings on fire and so forth. Uh, I, my guess is that he's going to want to be seen, but, uh, but we'll see about that. He could, of course, broadcast from Air Force One if he chose to. Britt Hume, our Washington managing editor. The pictures tell the story, folks. It is an awful day in America. Your lives, safe to say, will change from this day forward.
Newt Gingrich called this uh, a 21st century Pearl Harbor, and uh, that may be an understatement. There could be perhaps, well, on a given day, there would be 50,000 people working in the World Trade Centers, and both of those towers in that World Trade Center are gone now after an apparent terrorist strike, another terrorist strike at the Pentagon. That building is still on fire. Keep it here on Fox News Channel for the latest. Good morning, John. As you said, America has been under attack today. Secretary of State Colin Powell, who had been in Peru, is now heading home. The president, we know, we have been told, is safe, but we do not know where he is. This morning, at about 8.50 Eastern Time, here on the East Coast, the World Trade Center Tower, the north one, was hit, apparently by American Airlines Flight 11, which was en route from Boston to LAX, hijacked 92 people on board there. Fifteen minutes later, the other tower, South World Trade Center, hit. Also apparently by an American Airlines plane. This one, uh, we believe, from Dulles to Los Angeles, 64 people on board that plane. At 9.45, the Pentagon hit the south wall. Uh, that's the area where the helipad is. There's now a gaping hole of about 100 to 150 feet there. The sirens still wailing in the Pentagon. As we know, key personnel are staying in the Pentagon trying to keep control of the situation. Just about 15 minutes after that, 80 miles southwest of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, another airplane crashed. That one believed to be United Flight 93 from Newark to San Francisco, a 757 with 54 people on board. Just shortly after that, the South World Trade Center collapsed. That was the second building hit this morning. It had been hit lower, and it just gave way. And about 15 minutes after that, the North World Trade Center collapsed. It is incredible for those of us who covered the World Trade Center bombing uh, back in the 90s to take a look down now and at first see that scene replayed and now those World Trade Center buildings absolutely gone, all 110 stories. 50,000 people, as you mentioned, work in those buildings. We do not know how many of them were able to get out safely with their lives, nor how many are injured. We do know that New York area hospitals, several of them say they are full. They're asking anyone in the area to donate blood as soon as possible, saying there is a critical need for it. We also know that all U.S. commercial airplanes have been grounded. That is the first time in history this action has been taken. We know that some airplanes were diverted to uh, Canada, including some income international airlines, uh, airplanes that were bound for uh, the U.S. Uh, most federal, are all federal, and most U, uh, state buildings here in the U.S. have been closed. And most major landmarks, including Wrigley Field in Chicago, the, uh, the Bell down in Philadelphia, uh, the Merchandise Mart in Chicago, those areas also have been closed. Here in Manhattan, all major buildings uh, are in a state of very heightened security. People are being required to show ID, and if they leave buildings, in many cases, not being allowed to return in. The president, as we said, is apparently safe. He left Sarasota, Florida, where he had been attending a, uh, an elementary school, reading a book to children when he was first notified of the original attack on the World Trade Center. We do not know where he is at this point. Newt Gingrich says this obviously is an act of state-sponsored terrorism. As you said, John, he likening it to the attack on Pearl Harbor. And uh, meanwhile, Tom Daschle, the Senate Majority Leader, saying that the president is getting everyone's full support. We will update you as soon as we get more information down here. Right now, John, back to you. Edie Donahue in the Fox Newsroom, thank you very much. Again, uh, continuing to keep an eye on the situation unfolding in downtown uh, Manhattan, where the World Trade Center uh, workplace on a normal day of 50,000 people is gone, obliterated by two strikes from those two airplanes today. Also now, Washington, D.C., the Pentagon still on fire after another airplane apparently was hijacked and employed as a flying bomb to attack the nerve center of our nation's military. David Schuster is in the Pentagon and has this late report for us. Dave? John, we can uh, report for you that the Pentagon fire is still out of control. Flames have started now about uh, 100 feet away from where it's clear you can see where the plane hit the south side of the Pentagon. Uh, eyewitnesses describe a silver commercial jetliner, possibly a United Airlines. It's not been confirmed, but a silver commercial jetliner slamming into the south side of the Pentagon this morning at approximately 9.40 a.m. It hit the outer ring of the Pentagon. There are five rings of the Pentagon. Pentagon. And at this very moment, you can literally see a, a hole in the side of the Pentagon of perhaps 150 feet wide where five floors in that hole have literally collapsed. 
Uh, we can see that flames have spread to the center part of the Pentagon to some of the inner rings. In addition, on the outer ring, the E ring that was initially hit by that plane, now about 100 feet away, flames are leaping out of some of the office windows there. Uh, smoke has been pouring through the Pentagon hallways for much of the, of the last uh, uh, hour and a half or so. And uh, about 15 minutes ago, uh, some of the smoke started coming in from another side of the Pentagon. We're sort of uh, smack dab there in the middle. Uh, but in any case, uh, there are plenty of fire and rescue on the scene. Uh, local hospitals reporting uh, dozens of injuries uh, being taken there from the Pentagon. One can only imagine how many fatalities uh, there must have been if indeed it was a commercial jetliner that slammed into the side of the Pentagon. Uh, while most of the Pentagon has been evacuated, we can report that military officials are telling us that the U.S. Joint Forces Command in Norfolk, Virginia, reports that the Atlantic Fleet, which is the largest collection of military assets on the East Coast, has now gone to threat condition Charlie. This is second from the top. Only Delta is higher. Uh, the Air Combat Command is located in uh, Norfolk, Virginia, and uh, they have responsibility for coordinating uh, United States-based military assets in support of civilian agencies like the Federal Emergency Management Agency and the Department of Justice. There's a group called the Joint Task Force Civil Support, which has its headquarters in Norfolk, which is uh, going to coordinate uh, what assets will go where to sort of secure areas such as the Pentagon and other areas in the Washington area and the New York, New York area to help with the aftermath of the incidents. But again, the Air Combat Command uh, located in Norfolk, Virginia, uh, and other agencies of the U.S. military are now at threat condition Delta. This is second from the, t uh, I'm sorry, that, I, I'm just being told now that that is the highest threat condition that the military has, threat condition Delta. We had initially reported that the Atlantic Fleet was at threat condition Charlie. Threat condition Delta, John, is the level at which the United States military goes to when it declares or when the president declares or when the military perceives an act of war. So the military is now at the same level that it would be if the United States was engaged in a war. But again, here at the Pentagon, while most of the employees of the Pentagon have been cleared from this building, there's still the National Military Command Center, which continues to operate in the base of the Pentagon, uh, a secure bunker, if you will, in this Pentagon, which is, of course, built to withstand these sort of attacks. And while the smoke is pretty thick in our side of the building, we can tell you that at 940 this morning, when eyewitnesses described this jetliner slamming into the side of the Pentagon, that people here, including our own producer, said they did not hear or see anything. There were no shock waves. There was no sound. There was only a large plume of smoke. And then came the reports from inside the Pentagon that the Pentagon was on fire. And I can tell you at this point, uh, the Pentagon is still on fire, that uh, the fire has not been contained. It has spread to some of the inner rings of the Pentagon, as well as spreading along some of the outer rings. And again, just to report that the Atlantic Fleet, some of the military uh, uh, command and control are now at Threat Con Delta. That is the largest threat level in the United States military. It's the threat level which the military goes to when it is engaged in a war. John, back to you. All right, David Schuster reporting live from the Pentagon. Thank you. The question, of course, uh, if, if America is in fact under attack, as it clearly is, how does the military respond? They are in that threat condition delta, but no one knows where or how at this point to, res to respond. Uh, let's go to uh, my colleague Shepard Smith, who is, uh, has a bird's eye view of what's happening in Manhattan from uh, Midtown. Shepard? John, as you've been getting the updates from Washington and other places, we've been watching the streets of Manhattan. There is certainly uh, concern uh, of how people might react. And I can tell you that at this moment, the initial reaction was calm, and now Manhattan has taken on a whole new sort of flavor. I want to take this camera because I can't see what you see. I'm going to take the camera and show you around a bit as well as I can. We're going to begin. We're on the top of a building at 47th Street and 7th Avenue, or uh, 6th Avenue in Midtown Manhattan. This is 42nd Street. And you can see this was there was a lot of traffic in this street until a short time ago. But now you can see 42nd Street at the corner of Broadway has become a sort of sea of people. At this time of day, midday in Manhattan, this would normally be on a Tuesday afternoon. Uh, a very busy busy traffic area it is not today i'm going to pull out over here and take you this is 47th street 47th street looking panning now going up towards 7th avenue now this avenue is north northbound as you can see and traffic is pretty well gridlocked there uh, there's very little of it actually and looking over toward the hudson river uh, there's very little traffic across all of manhattan now we are looking right now over the Hudson River west in Manhattan.
panning around now in the skyscrapers. This is where the World Trade Center stood. And down here is the TKTS building. Uh, this is another high traffic area in Midtown, an area with which most people who have ever visited New York would be quite familiar. This is the spot where you line up for Broadway tickets, and at this time of day, uh, just after 12 o'clock, this would normally be a sea of literally thousands of people uh, who, are, who are working their way around, getting their lunch and that sort of thing. You're looking live now in Times Square, uh, a scene rarely repeated. Uh, let's, let's get back to this camera, because I'm going to pan down this street. When you're back on this camera, Bernie, let me know and I'm going to pan down what is Broadway Avenue, making your way down. This was a, would eventually take you all the way down to the Financial District, panning across this building and back over to 42nd Street. I want to try to give you a look down the avenue toward, toward what is the Diamond District. This is a little tricky, as you might imagine. This is the entrance to the Diamond District, right outside the Fox News studios. That would be the Diamond District, looking 47th Street now, all the way toward the East River. Absolutely no traffic in Manhattan today. Nothing. Uh, it initially started, cabs were running. I was able to get one about uh, 9 30, 10 o'clock. Most of the cabs are no longer running, and the river crossings are now closed. All of Manhattan is shut down, and there is what was the World Trade Center. To say that there is chaos in the streets would be absolutely inaccurate. This is a city that prides itself on its ability, on its ability to, to maintain amid the chaos, and that appears to be what's happening today. No violence in the streets, no problems to speak of, no incidents anywhere in Manhattan that I can tell you about. Certainly downtown would be a completely different story, but this city is not, is not reacting in a violent way at all. Uh, there is calm here in Midtown, John, at least. All right, Shepard Smith, thank you very much for that update. Uh, of course, the World Trade Center, it, it sounds unbelievable to speak the words, but the World Trade Center is essentially gone, struck by two airplanes, uh, apparently both of them, hi them hijacked. We are now getting a report, a confirmation from United Airlines that two of its planes are gone. Uh, one of them, apparently the plane that... Uh, crash near Pittsburgh but look here this is the second plane that struck the World Trade Center shortly after nine o'clock Eastern Time this morning an earlier plane left the Tower of Smoke in the uh, upper stories of, of the building on the right there so both towers hit by planes they burned for a while and then one at a time they both collapsed um, we have an onlooker who um, gave us uh, uh, what is sort of a a horrific description of what it all looked like, sounded like, and felt like. Uh, let's hear from that person now. I saw the building falling down. Say that again. I'm, I didn't hear you. I saw people jumping from the building from the hundredth floor, and I saw the building just coming down. It is absolutely an appalling day, not only here in Manhattan, but also in Washington, where the Pentagon uh, also was apparently the... Uh, the subject of a strike by one of these hijacked airliners flying bombs really the pentagon uh, in these pictures taken earlier but still very much on fire uh, the damage there perhaps not as severe as it is at the world trade center uh, but clearly america is under attack i want to bring into the conversation a man who long planned for and never experienced this kind of event. Howard Safer, the former police commissioner and also fire commissioner, if I'm correct, of the city of New sure. York. You gotta be wondering about the guys who you once commanded both on, on the fire and police departments who are no doubt trying to help people get out of those buildings when they came down around them. Well, it's incomprehensible. Uh, we plan for all kinds of terrorist attacks, uh, biological warfare, uh, chemical warfare, but nobody envisioned two commercial airliners slamming into the World Trade Center. And I can tell you that although New York has the greatest emergency services in the world, uh, they are being strained by the triage, by the number of injured, and by the requirements uh, of, of this disaster. I'm just, I'm just guessing uh, that most of those uh, brave police and firefighters would have been clustered right around the base of those buildings, right? When, when we thought we had only a fire, Clearly, there would have been glass falling. We even had reports of people jumping out of the upper floors simply because they couldn't tolerate the smoke anymore. 
Um, but a lot of your people would have been gathered at the base of those buildings when they came down. Absolutely. Firefighters and police officers run into danger. They don't run away from it. And unfortunately, uh, and I hope I'm wrong, there's probably going to be serious loss of life in both agencies as well as in the civilian area. Uh, I've been talking to some of the people at hospitals, and the hospitals are totally overwhelmed. They're triaging people they can help and making sure they don't spend time on people they can't. I'm sure it's a speech that you never wanted to give, uh, but what do you tell people, what do you tell America right now? How do we behave? Well, my view is the way we behave is we assess who did this, we find out who they are, and then we make sure that we send a message that is clear, because terrorists only understand one thing. They understand force, they understand strength, and this is a time when we can't be weak. This is a time when we have to go and find out who did this and make them pay for it. As for um, the reaction uh, of the citizens of New York, um, the plea is out for people to donate blood. Is there anything else that New Yorkers can do right now? Well, I think they, they can donate blood, but they, they really need to stay calm. They need to follow the instructions of the emergency service personnel. This is an incredibly difficult situation for police and firefighters. The National Guard will be coming in uh, this evening. And this is something where citizens should pretty much, they don't have to be out, stay home. Yeah, so uh, stay off the streets if you possibly can. What about communications? We already know that phone lines in and out of New York are swamped. There are going to be thousands, millions of people perhaps across the country who, who may know somebody who uh, worked in the World Trade Center. What do you tell them? Well, this is still a rescue operation. There's still people who need help. There's still people who are alive in that wreckage who can be helped. And what people should do is, unless it's an emergency, don't use your telephone. Let's go now to uh, a man who experienced something like this. Frank Keating, the governor of Oklahoma, is joining us. Of course, he was in office at the time of the what had been uh, the worst terrorist attack America experienced, that of the domestic kind. Uh, Frank Keating, as you look at these pictures, what is going through your mind? Well, this really is a day of agony and infamy for America. Again, we have lost our connection with Frank Keating, a former FBI agent and the governor of Oklahoma. You've got to understand, folks, that uh, many of the communications lifelines in New York City ran through the World Trade Center. There were um, uh, satellite dishes uh, sprouting like mushrooms from the top of that building. There was a huge television tower, and all of that now is, is gone. Uh, our Washington managing editor, Britt Hume, uh, once again has the view from the nation's capital. Britt? This gives us a sense of uh, the state of official uh, worry and uh, knowledge here. Uh, Richard Shelby, the senator from Alabama, who is a leading Republican and now vice chairman of the Senate Intelligence Committee, has come out. One would presume if, uh, if anybody would know a lot about uh, what the U.S. officials know, he would. And he said all he knew about was the two plane attacks in New York. Uh, the one at the Pentagon, and he said that they had heard something had happened in western Pennsylvania. That, of course, consistent with the reports we've had about a Pittsburgh airport. So, so we are, um, so we're, uh, w the sense we have is that, uh, that of many officials, many senior people here in Washington may know less than we do, at least officially, about what has happened here. All right, Britt Hume, thanks. John McCain is, uh, is on Capitol Hill speaking, and we're, uh, we got an ear out for him as well. All right, Britt, thanks very much. Uh, uh, Newt Gingrich, the former Speaker that? of the House, was on the air with us not long ago and described this as the 21st century Pearl Harbor, and that does not overstate it. Uh, there may be as many as, on, on a typical day, there would be 50,000 people working in the Twin Towers of the World Trade Center, and those towers are gone. How many of those people were able to evacuate, we do not know. Uh, once again, to Britt Hume in Washington. Britt? John, we uh, believe we've been joined now on the telephone by Republican Senator John McCain of Arizona. Uh, Hello, Senator, Brett. thank you very much. Uh, as a senior member of the U.S. Senate and a man deeply concerned with the U.S. military, uh, what can you tell us uh, beyond what we know about, the, first of all, about the attack at the Pentagon? I, I can't tell you, Brett, uh, anything that more than the information that you have. And uh, I think that's probably the case with most um, members of Congress at this moment. Um, I, I'm, I'm not in disagreement with others who said that this is an act of war, and um, it is, uh, it's 
there aren't words to describe adequately the enormity of these attacks and the depravity of those who would uh, commit them. Uh, but I, I, I have no additional information, and uh, I'm not sure that in the short term there will be a lot disclosed to the members of Congress uh, as, as they acquire it. But the fact mm -hmm. is that this is, this is an, an enormity that staggers the imagination. Senator, it, you, you and others have s described this as an act of war. What are the implications of seeing I, it in that light, rather than a mere loan or isolated act of terrorism? What are the policy implications? I, I uh, what kinds of steps are now possible or might be taken uh, by, by this government in, light of, in, the, in the light of viewing it as an act of war? I think that that means that the, the Congress acts to support the President of the United States in any actions that he needs to take to make sure that those who are responsible, whether they be governments or they be individuals or groups of individuals, uh, that whatever measures need to be taken uh, will be taken and, and consider the United States now on the basis of, of a war and, uh, and, and go on to that footing and use whatever assets and and and, uh, and efforts that are necessary to bring those to justice and at the same time prevent uh, ever a reoccurrence of, uh, of a tragedy and a crime of this enormity. Senator, we're seeing, we've been seeing just a, for the last couple of minutes some uh, live pictures of uh, injured people arriving at, uh, at a hospital in New York for treatment there. Obviously, it would appear based on what we know that the loss of life is going to be very great indeed. Um, your sense from knowing the Pentagon and knowing the area or where that, uh, where that uh, airplane hit, um, fire still going over there. Do you have any, any, what can you tell us about that part of the building, number of people work there, that kind of thing? Well, as you know, the Pentagon is a very large building and which may work uh, to our benefit uh, here as opposed to the trade towers. Um, I, I can't make an estimate, but fortunately, the Pentagon is a very large building, so let's pray that, uh, that the extent of the casualties has been uh, limited by that. Obviously, there's casualties, but uh, what staggers the imagination, as I heard you talking, is the 50,000 people at work at the trade towers. It, this is, we, we pray for them and their families, and uh, it, it's a tragedy that, again, words have become inadequate very quickly when describing something of this nature. But I'm, I'm sure the president will lead us. I am sure that the president will, uh, will reassure the American people, and uh, all of us, all Americans, will commit ourselves to making sure that those who committed it uh, pay the heaviest price, whether they be governments or individuals, including governments that may have harbored groups that, uh, that were responsible for this, and uh, we will make sure that there's never a reoccurrence. And that's, I know that's no consolation to the grieving families, but I don't think we can, uh, we can do more except uh, I am confident the President of the United States will lead and the American people can have bestow their confidence upon his leadership. Senator, what you're saying suggests, as others may have mentioned, that life in the United States will not again be the same anytime soon. Would you agree with that? Uh, I, t I totally, uh, I totally agree with that. And uh, and uh, again, um, it's it's incomprehensible and reprehensible, and nothing, none of us that I know of ever imagined something this enormity and well orchestrated, obviously. Senator, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Thanks, Brett. We now have uh, Brian Wilson, I believe, able to report to us on what he's been hearing. He's up on Capitol Hill. Brian, what are you hearing, buddy? Well, I'm hearing a lot of things, Britt. One of the things that we're hearing in the last few minutes uh, is from Senator Richard Shelby, who is a member of the Senate Intelligence Committee, who told us there has been no advance warning, uh, and they call this very well organized, and, uh, and he says that uh, they had no advance warning that it was coming at all. And usually they do have some indication uh, from the intelligence community. So. Uh, very surprised. They say, of course, they know about what happened at the Pentagon. They know about what happened at the World Trade Center. They're still trying to figure out exactly what happened in western Pennsylvania. But members of Congress are coming out and expressing uh, in the strongest terms that the intelligence community failed uh, to give them any advance warning and any kind of information about this, that it caught them completely off guard. One member of Congress, uh, Congressman Kurt Weldon of Pennsylvania, said, well, the government has failed the people of this country, and that's an indictment on both parties. Uh, Brian, it, do, it does certainly seem that uh, these members of Congress uh, not only had no advance warning or that the government had no advance warning, they don't seem to know very much about what actually happened, do they? 
No, the, and, and Senator Shelby said we're still getting briefings, but uh, information is very sketchy and communications are scrambled, an indication that uh, they're not getting a good flow of information uh, and an overall sense that perhaps more will have to be done to shore up uh, the intelligence budgets in the days ahead, but also, uh, you know, just complete outrage, Britt, that, uh, that somehow... Uh, the millions of billions of dollars that we spend on intelligence in this country somehow let this one slip through the cracks. All right, Brian Wilson, thank you very much. John Scott, uh, that's it from here for the moment. One last note. Uh, we learned uh, a few minutes ago that uh, Secret Service agents had sprinted up the street from the White House uh, and cleared people away from a bag uh, that was sitting in the middle of the street there up at okay. uh, the corner of Connecticut Avenue and I Street right by the Army-Navy Club there in Washington. It turns out, apparently, that uh, the bag has been found to be harmless. So uh, one more of these uh, false alarms, of which there have been a number, and doubtless will be many more, uh, has been put to rest. John? All right. Britt Hume in Washington, thank you very much. Uh, you are looking uh, at the pictures of what is uh, left of the World Trade Center in lower Manhattan. Really not much. Uh, these, pictures, um, these pictures coming to you now live, we're going to show you uh, what happened earlier this morning, 9 o'clock Eastern Time. Uh, you can see there are people uh, who are leaning out the windows. At that point, they were hoping for some kind of rescue. There was smoke throughout the building. And they couldn't breathe inside, so they were uh, breaking out the windows of that building and hoping for some kind of rescue. Ultimately, a number of these people simply decided to end their misery and, and jumped. Uh, we are... We are um, going to get a, a, some late information now from Fox producer Dan Cohen, who uh, saw much of this going on. Uh, Dan, this is an awful, awful day. What can you add to what we've already seen? Well, uh, I got here, uh, as you were just saying, and the people jumping out of the buildings, that's about when I arrived. And uh, I'm also uh, an emergency medical technician, so I came down to see if I could help. I uh, identified myself to uh, some of the people that were setting up the medical command posts. We had gotten everything set up. They were doing an amazing job of uh, instantly just having everything organized. As soon as we got the medical command post uh, set up and I uh, was with a team of other uh, fire department EMTs who we were about to go uh, off and treat uh, some people we had been assigned to treat, all of a sudden we looked up, heard, uh, before we looked up we heard uh, what sounded like basically a jet airliner landing right on top of our heads looked up and the building was just coming down. We, uh, the entire command post that I was at ran, uh, just started running. Uh, the wall of smoke came up behind us and I think most of us came out of it. Um, I lost the crew that I was with. They started setting up another command post and then sure enough about five minutes later, uh, well, we were treating some of the people that had gotten trapped the first time. Um, someone said that the tower's leaning, the tower's leaning. We all started running, and, and that's when the, the, the tower came down completely. Uh, I managed to get up. A lot of the people uh, did not and were, were trapped back under the debris. Um, once the, the dust started to clear a little, we went in, took some firemen out. Uh, a lot of the firemen had already been in the building at that point. Um, we put as many as we could on some ferries uh, as we were by the water at this point, sent them over to Jersey City for treatment. Um, and from that point on, it's uh, pretty much been chaos. I mean, the, uh, the New York City Emergency Service has been doing an amazing job of, of trying to control the chaos, but every time uh, things get set up, uh, there's either more explosions or more debris or more people come out of the rubble. All right. Dan Cohen, uh, a Fox News producer, also an emer emergency medical technician who has been in lower Manhattan trying to help the wounded on this catastrophic day. We can't overstate uh, the level of damage that's been inflicted here. It, it, it bears repeating, folks, that America is still standing. We are united. We are strong. And we will find out who did this. But for now, uh, there are, are thousands, probably, of casualties in uh, not only in lower Manhattan, but also in Washington, D.C. Let's uh, get the latest now from our Edie Donahue in the Fox Newsroom. Edie? Well, John, America may be standing, but we are certainly in shock. Uh, the Pentagon still in flames. Our own correspondent, David Schuster, there. 
An update now on exactly what happened this morning. The first shot came just about 8.50 Eastern time. That was when the first plane, an American Airlines plane that had been hijacked en route from Boston to L.A. with 92 people on board, slammed into the World Trade Center. We were just finishing up our morning show. We watched that and started speculating what was happening within 10 minutes, 15 minutes, the second plane had hit the second World Trade Center. That was the South Tower. That apparently, although it is not confirmed, United Airlines says it is missing Flight 175, which was uh, en route from Boston to Los Angeles. Witnesses later say that they saw people from the top floors on fire jumping to their death. At 9.45, the Pentagon was hit the south wall that apparently by American Airlines Flight 77 en route from Dulles, Washington, that is, to Los Angeles. That uh, is a 757 plane. It was carrying 64 people. That uh, ripped a 100 to 150-foot hole into the south uh, ring, the south wall there, the outermost ring of the Pentagon. Um, that, as we said, the, the fire sirens still wailing there, the Pentagon still on fire. At about 10 o'clock, uh, 80 miles southwest of Pittsburgh, this uh, United Airlines Flight 93 from Newark to San Francisco crashed. That's a 757 with 90 people on board. Now, what's interesting is that crashed just after the FAA ordered all United States commercial airliners to land at the closest uh, possible place. Right after that order was issued, that plane crashed. Later on, the South Tower of the World Trade Center collapsed. The North Tower of the World Trade Center collapsed. We do know that some people, even as high as the 92nd floor, were able to be evacuated safely. In the U.S., for the first time in history, all United States commercial aircraft have been grounded. We know that some internationally inbound flights landed at uh, in Canada, but now Canadian airlines and airports have been shut down as well. All federal buildings and many, most, state buildings across America have been closed, and most major landmarks in the U.S. are closed. In New York City, bridges, tunnels, subways all shut down. At St. Vincent's Hospital, where many of the first victims of the World Trade Center uh, crash were taken, we have paramedics out on the street donating, soliciting blood from any donors they can find. They say the, the need is that great right now. Uh, as we say, right now, America seems to be in a quandary. We have had these attacks this morning. The president apparently is safe, but we do not know where he is. He has not made a statement since the official one this morning saying that this was a, a criminal act and that he would do everything to find out who had committed it. Uh, the enemy, though, at this point, unknown. No one has officially claimed responsibility. John, that's the latest. Back to you. All right, Edie Donahue in the Fox Newsroom. Thank you very much. It's not surprising that we haven't heard from the president yet. He took off from Florida, where his uh, scheduled events have been canceled for the day. He took off from Florida probably around 9.30 this morning. And the uh, flying time to Washington being what it is, if, in fact, he is headed to Washington, uh, we wouldn't expect to hear from him for some few minutes now. Let's get the latest on that from our Britt Hume, our Washington managing editor. Yeah, we, John, thank you. We are uh, awaiting to hear when the president will land and exactly where and when uh, he might have something to say about all of this. Um, a couple of things worth noting. Brian Wilson has just called to say that uh, he was co talking to Congressman Jim Moran, a Democrat of Virginia who has received a briefing on Capitol Hill, and that uh, Moran says that what they know about that uh, plane crash near Pittsburgh uh, was they believe that was related to an attempted attack on Camp David. Of course, you know where there was an earlier f uh, f uh, uh, incorrect report that Camp David had in fact been attacked. All officials, are now, all officials now are saying that is not the case. So we have a little bit more from what the intelligence community is apparently uh, telling members of Congress. Uh, it appears also that uh, fighter jets are now escorting Air Force One, which would be a standard precaution under a circumstance like this. The last time I can recall, uh, in my own experience, this happening was when President Bush the first uh, flew down to a drug summit in the nation of Colombia, where, of course, terrorism is a constant threat. Um, we are um, we're waiting, as we noted, for um, for further word from uh, from the White House, uh, where communications are obviously a problem because everybody's been evacuated as to where and when the president will land. So uh, that is basically the latest we have from here. I might call your attention to a quote. This is from Chris Yates, an aviation expert at Jane's Transport in London. Jane's, of course, is a company that publishes a number of defense-related and uh, aviation and uh, maritime-related uh, publications, military-related publications. He called it the most auda audacious terrorist attack ever taken place in the world. There you go. 
that cannot and, uh, be Rita over. Cosby, by the way, is, uh, is, uh, has something to report as well. Rita's been uh, staying in touch with us by telephone. She's in our air. Rita, what do you know? Well, Brett, I'm told by the FAA that at this point, 22 international flights have been diverted to Canada, and there are 50 flights over the United States. Remember, we're in a full-fledged ground stop right now. This is the first time in U.S. history that they have done such a ground stop, but we are told that there are 50 flights still in the air trying to reach their locations here in the United States in order to land immediately. There are also two international flights from Europe in which the pilots have not responded, and that is drawing concern from U.S. These are flights that were en route to the United States from Europe, and the pilots have not responded to the FAA. So they're trying to find out if those two planes may be in trouble. Also, law enforcement uh, sources are telling us, and this is interesting, that there was word put out through an Arab newspaper about three weeks ago that bin Laden himself, the mastermind behind the East African bombings, the uh, embassy bombings there in East Africa, that he apparently did put out word about three weeks ago saying that he was planning an unprecedented attack against U.S. interests. Since that time, they got other information that there may be some sort of attack against U.S. possibly governmental facilities. And then, as we know, on Friday, the State Department did put out a worldwide caution uh, basically telling U.S. Uh, citizens and also particularly government and military officials that they should be in a heightened state of alert. But I will tell you from talking to law enforcement sources, I talked to them minutes after the uh, two planes rammed into the World Trade Center building, this were in the Twin Towers, that they were very stunned, that they said, look, we had gotten word that there may be some sort of attack, but we had no idea it was going to be on U.S. soil, no idea that it was going to involve airliners and so forth. But I will tell you also law enforcement sources do know that uh, Osama bin Laden, right now they believe he's sort of the prime suspect. They have no idea who's behind this, but they are looking at him because they do say that he and his men did a lot of training. In fact, where they did practice hijackings, where they did have pilots who were on their staff, and in fact, we had reported earlier that three people involved in the East African bombings were actually pilots, and that's sort of part of their training, and they get some of that in Afghanistan, also Iran, and a number of other countries. So this is sort of part of their training to prepare for something like this. But law enforcement sources are telling me, and these are intelligence officials, that they were really stunned by today's development. All right, Rita, thank you very much. Um, it's worth uh, perhaps also adding to this, uh, John Scott, that the North American Air Defense Command, NORAD, is uh, controlling the U.S. aircraft that are in the air, including those that are, uh, that are escorting Air Force One. So. So um, you, give an, you get an idea from that just how seriously this threat is being taken by the U.S. military. Back to you in New York, John Scott. All right, Britt Hume, thanks very much. This was supposed to be an election day in New York. Primary elections were scheduled for mayor here and other offices. Uh, those elections have been canceled. A couple of other more mundane matters considering all that's gone on. Mo Major League Baseball has canceled its scheduled games for tonight. All those games are canceled. Uh, let's listen to one of the witnesses from Lower Manhattan now recount what he saw. This is unedited tape. All right, we're having a little trouble hearing the audio there. Uh, as you can imagine, uh, Wall Street workers, uh, a, a great number of other people, uh, terrifically impacted by uh, the collapse of the World Trade Centers that after they were uh, hit by two apparently hijacked airliners uh, shortly before and shortly after 9 a.m. this morning Eastern Time. Uh, Oklahoma Governor Frank Keating is on the line with us once again. Uh, Governor, you have had more experience than anybody dealing with catastrophe of this scale in the bombing of the Murrah building. How should America respond? Well, no one has had experience responding to a catastrophe of this scale. And this is just uh, agony beyond comprehension. It is horrific. Uh, it really is a day of infamy. And uh, I, I am confident as a citizen, because I dealt with the New York uh, Police Department and the New York Fire Service here in Oklahoma City, that they have first-rate authorities. Their emergency management people are first-rate. I'm confident in the military authorities and obviously in the president's leadership. But uh, this is just absolutely uh, Governor, let me interrupt you for just a minute. Uh, Britt Hume has some late-breaking information for us. Out uh, of John, we've, j we've just learned from the White House press pool, that is the, uh, the group of journalists who stay with the president at all times, fly with him aboard Air Force One, that the president will, in a matter of minutes, 
be making a statement. There is some mystery about exactly where that statement will come from, whether it will be from Air Force One or some other place where he may have landed. So we await, obviously, with great interest that, but we are within apparently minutes of hearing from the president for the first time since uh, his initial remarks before he got in the air after these uh, attacks originally occurred. So we wait here in Washington to bring that to you as soon as uh, we have a, have a signal from the White House or from, from wherever the president is. And almost certainly, Britt, uh, that would not be from the Oval Office. The White House has been evacuated, right? The White House has been evacuated, and we have no reason to believe that the president's plane has touched down in the Washington area. But communications here are such, John, that all kinds of things could have happened that we don't know about, and indeed that not everybody here on the ground knows about. But the president, of course, travels with the most elaborate communications facilities. The president has, we're, we, the latest word we have now is the president has touched down at Shreveport, Louisiana, and it is apparently from there that, that we will hear whatever he has to say. So we are awaiting word from, we're awaiting a signal, a picture, and the words of the President of the United States coming from Shreveport, Louisiana, a place that uh, the military apparently found, felt that the President was safe to go. So we are watching and waiting for that, John. All right, Britt Hume in Washington, thanks very much. We will uh, continue to await uh, the words of the President uh, when he gets to a television transmission facility, apparently, as Britt told you there, in Shreveport. Uh, Frank Keating, the governor of Oklahoma, is still on the line with us. Governor, you've been in this position. You've had to calm a populace horrified by a sudden terrorist strike. What does the president need to say, and how do Americans need to take in this uh, cataclysmic disaster? Well, this is a, an attack, an act of war against the United States. In my case, it was a domestic terrorist attack. In this case, ostensibly, it's an international terrorist attack. I think the president will appropriately say the first thing we must do is rescue and recover. Uh, we must pray for those who are injured, pray for those who are killed, and anyone who did this, we will get them. Real simple, but focus first on rescue, recovery, and prayer, and I'm sure that's exactly what the president will do. There is going to be a, a, a great uniting of America, isn't there, coming out of all this? Well, yes, because this was an attack on us, and in that building, that is a melting pot of America. There are obviously thousands of people of all different walks of life, all different races, all different religions and nationalities there. And uh, to make a political statement by destroying innocent men, women, and children is never acceptable in any moral society. And this is absolutely an affront to civilization, and the president and the country will be united and will respond in accordingly, and appropriately so. And an affront to civilization is just what you'll see in the pictures that we are about to bring you again. These are unedited. We cannot uh, exactly predict what you're going to see because we haven't seen some of them ourselves. But this is video as uh, one of the towers of the World Trade Center collapsed. You can see the sheer terror on the people as that shock wave of dust and debris rolls toward our camera crew there. And all of a sudden, it is midnight in downtown Manhattan as the crumbled concrete as the shell of what was once Manhattan's proudest buildings, pair of buildings, as it crumbled to dust. And it is still burning, it is still on fire. Uh, untold numbers of people are dead, untold numbers of people are trapped. The rescue effort is going to go on for days, perhaps weeks. Again, imagine uh, the, the mindset of these people who were at the base of the building there, uh, watching what they thought uh, was nothing more than a fire. Nobody knew at this point that these buildings uh, were going to collapse. I might bring into the conversation uh, Howard Safer, the former uh, chief of police, uh, police commissioner here in uh, New York City, also fire commissioner as well. Uh, Mr. Safer, nobody ever thought the World Trade Center would fall. I mean, that's what the terrorists tried to do back in 1993, and they weren't even close to being successful. That's true, and even the engineer who designed the Trade Center had told me it was designed to withstand a commercial airliner attack. Obviously, that's not correct, but this is incomprehensible and just the kind of thing that, although we plan for every kind of terrorist attack, this is overwhelming for the emergency services in New York, which are some of the best in the world. Let's look at the bigger picture. I mean, everybody wants to know who did this, but it's going to take, take some time, isn't it? It is. I mean, this is obviously, and, you know, it, it's not that it's time to worry about the people who are hurt and injured, but this is ob obviously an intelligence failure. We're going to have to figure out not only why we didn't have the intelligence, but we have to figure out how these hijackers were able to breach airport security and what we have to do to fix that. It could be something uh, relatively simple. Um, if, if you wanted to, I mean, I have boarded uh, 
I have boarded airplanes before with my pocket knife, a three or four inch blade. That can be a lethal weapon and nobody ever, nobody has ever stopped me. Uh, there are limits on what kind of a knife you can take on board, but a couple of trained terrorists, trained in hand-to-hand -hand combat, could easily get into a cockpit and commandeer a plane. Well, that is true. Also, the quality of personnel is, is very important. The technology is very important. Uh, and most importantly, uh, the way you prevent terrorism is through intelligence. Uh, you can't prevent terrorist acts when they're taking place, but you need to have the intelligence so you know about them and prevent them before they take place. Let's check in with Molly Falconer. She's in, she's in the lower Manhattan at St. Vincent's Hospital, a scene of absolute chaos. Uh, Molly, what's going on there? John, it's been, it has been a state of chaos all morning. This is a hospital under siege. It's taking many of the victims up from the World Trade Center. They're running out of blood. They're running out of something called Silvadine, which treats burns. They have been raiding local pharmacies and local stores to try and get that. And I'm standing here with Kim White, who managed to make it out of Tower One right before it went down. And you're saying you had a hard time with some of those fire doors. Yeah, the fire doors were locked, and um, we couldn't get them unlocked. It took about 10 minutes for somebody to actually come and open up the doors, and then we were able to finally head down. But then there were other doors that were locked, so we were brought into another floor when there was another explosion, and they finally let us continue to go down. And your clothes are in shreds, and you still got debris in your hair. Is that what happened to your colleagues, and, and how were they? Um, I, I have a rim which that's how we've been keep, able to keep contact with one another. Yes. And I had my, uh, one of my co male co-workers contact me right. when I was in the hospital and asked me and told me that he's with the entire team. Mm -hmm. Where am I? And I told him I was at the hospital, so everybody is doing okay. How are people feeling? And could you see anything? Was there smoke all around you? Well, when we got down to the bottom floor, um, it was, we would thought we were okay. And then there was a collapse. We don't know what collapsed. There was a collapse of something. The police and fire department told us to go run to the wall and don't look outside. Next thing we know, billowing black smoke just came in. And I mean, it went down my mouth, up my nose, all over the place. And people were hysterical at that time. You couldn't see anybody. You could barely see the lights of the flashlights that were downstairs. But eventually, they I think they broke a plate glass window to Borders. They were breaking glass to try and get out? To try to get out to Borders Bookstore. And they we went through down their escalator and then up another escalator to come out. And that's how we finally got out of the um, Okay. out of the office. Okay. I'll let you go. Thank you very much for stopping. And John, we are hearing a lot of victims come, some staggering, out of this hospital. We've got reports that over 160 are inside. They've turned the corridors. They even turned the hospital gym into a makeshift ER. They have hundreds of doctors and nurses on call. Obviously, their disaster plans are in effect. They've sent several triage teams downtown. They have blocked off all of 7th Avenue, which is one of these main thoroughfares right in front of the hospital here so that they can ferry ambulances from the World Trade Center to St. Vincent's Hospital. And all morning, all we've been seeing are gurneys out on the street standing at the ready for the hundreds of ambulances, I should say dozens of ambulances that are coming in. But who knows, there are no estimates as to how many will eventually get here. A spokesman named Mark Ackerman came out a few moments ago and said he can't put an estimate on how many people will be here, but we'll keep a watch on it for you all the time. Again, there is a call out for blood and something Thing called Silvadine. It treats burns and infections. They have already raided the local pharmacies around the hospitals and they're calling for more. Back to you. All right, Molly Falconer at uh, St. Vincent's Hospital in Lower Manhattan. Thank you. Uh, we want to take you out to Los Angeles now. A couple of the planes that were hijacked were bound for Los Angeles. John Dupree, our correspondent there, has some late breaking information for us. John? John, the ripple effect of this disaster felt clear out here on the West Coast. Three, in fact, three of the planes which crashed today were bound for Los Angeles International Airport, where you find me now. American Flight Number 11 with 92 people on board, American Flight Number 77 with 64 people on board, and United Flight Number 175 with 65 people on board, which may, I say, may have crashed into the Pentagon. 
all bound for Los Angeles International Airport. Their numbers were not even on the arrivals board here. No one had begun to come here to pick up passengers arriving from those three from those three those two cities. Now and only now, one by one, family members and loved ones beginning to show up here at LAX, being escorted into the corporate offices at American Airlines here at Terminal 4, being escorted by United officials to a nearby hotel, being briefed on what has happened, being told that their loved ones, their family members, by all appearances, most likely dead. The skies above Los Angeles International Airport, where 150 to 250,000 people each day take off and land the busiest airport on the west coast of these United States eerily empty that's the effect here on the other side of the country John Scott All back right, to you. John Dupree in Los Angeles thank you again these pictures just coming into us now this is unedited video of the pandemonium the fear the chaos in lower Manhattan as the Twin Towers the World Trade Center the tallest buildings in Manhattan once the tallest buildings in the world as they collapsed in an incredible shock wave of, of dirt, debris, smoke, and certainly a catastrophic loss of human life. This was the reaction there in, um, in Manhattan. Nobody ever thought those, those towers could fall. Almost certainly uh, the terrorists who tried to inflict this didn't think they could fall. They perhaps hoped it would happen, but nobody thought there would be this kind of catastrophic, this, uh, this kind of catastrophic damage. William Daly and Howard Safer. William Daly, a former FBI agent who investigated the first World Trade Center bombing. Let's talk about the bigger picture once again. Sure, the terrorists wanted to inflict maximum damage, maximum loss of life, but their real goal is mental, isn't it? Aren't they trying to scare America? That's true, John. In fact, my, my role was one after, after the incident in helping uh, put security back in place for these once prestigious locations. And the thought is when we do security planning and, and try to predict where terrorists will attack, we always think of what are the spots that are indicative of the American way, whether it's the World Trade Center, whether it's some other landmark or what they call trophy building that they like to have uh, exactly what we see here, be up in smoke and for everyone to be panicked and concerned. So when we predict, try to predict terrorist acts, we look at these, but we, we really at the very far end of the spectrum would think they would ever come down to something like this. We always looked upon something worst case, like uh, vehicle bombs we saw in Oklahoma City or we've seen over in Europe, uh, individual bombings. Uh, but when we look at planes, uh, flying bombs with people in them, which are, are of them by themselves would be, would be catastrophic on, incidents on if any they given, occurred. On any given Anyone. day, any one of these incidents would dominate the news for weeks. Uh, exactly. We've had four planes crash today, three of them deliberately into, um, into buildings, two at the World Trade Center towers, one at the Pentagon, and one went down uh, in an airport area uh, near Pittsburgh. Britt Hume is keeping an eye on the situation in the nation's capital. Let's get the latest from him. Britt? Well, the first thing, John, is that that fire at the Pentagon continues to burn out of control and going ever deeper into the building itself. One presumes that the building has been now evacuated of all but uh, firefighting personnel, but that obviously a worrisome situation. There you see a live picture of the plume of smoke, uh, black smoke still rising from the Pentagon. Evidently, the amount of fuel that was spilled or whatever was aboard that aircraft was sufficient to keep that blaze going apace. Um, from Capitol Hill, we learn a couple of other things. Senator John Kyle, Republican of Arizona, said uh, to our Brian Wilson just a short time ago that uh, the leadership, members of the leadership are in various different, congressional leadership are in various different places, in touch with each other and with the administration. We have a plan. We have a plan, said Kyle, and it is in place. Uh, what that's all about will remains to be seen. Um, uh, Brian also reports that at the Capitol Police Station, uh, J.C. Watts, Tom DeLay, both were members of the Republican House leadership, had been seen there, as well as Democrats Dick Gephardt and David Bonnier. So members of the Congress, congressional leadership here in Washington, uh, those four we know about uh, and have been seen, and they are said all to be in touch with one another as we await remarks by the President of the United States, who is at Barksdale or is either on the ground or is about to speak from Barksdale uh, military base, Air Force base there outside Shreveport, Louisiana. As soon as that can be technically set up, we expect to hear from the President. We'll let you know. All right, Britt Hume, keeping an eye on the things in uh, Washington. Thanks very much.
Um, Howard Safer, uh, again, uh, this is something that New York City has planned for for a long time. New York always thought it was an obvious terror target. Um, you might say, in a way, we dodged a bullet back in 93 when the World Trade Center was bombed, six people dead, a thousand hurt, but nothing on the scale of what we've seen today. Absolutely not. This is uh, incomprehensible. Uh, the idea of one plane was incomprehensible. The idea of four is beyond the realm of conception. And, you know, this is obviously something that was well planned, had to be well coordinated, uh, had to be something that was planned for months, maybe even years. And, you know, finding the people who did this uh, after the rescue operation and we save as many lives as possible is really the key here. How is uh, life going to change in America as a result of it, of this, or is it too early to say? Well, I think one of the things you're going to see is a re-examination of both our intelligence procedures and our security procedures. Certainly our airport security procedures are going to have to be put under a microscope and look for the vulnerability points because four, four airplanes hijacked in one day says the system doesn't work. Perhaps, uh, Bill Daly, I'm, I'm just uh, exploring some options here, but might we see almost armored cockpits from now on? I mean, those, those uh, cabin doors, as anybody who's ever flown, are lockable but fairly flimsy. Uh, excuse me, Bill, we want to go up to uh, Shepard Smith, who's actually keeping an eye on things from the sky above Midtown. Shep? I'm actually down in the newsroom now, uh, John, and want to bring you an update on the facts as we've been getting them in in just a, in the, in the last few minutes. The FBI headquarters will be making an official announcement short, shortly. Fox News Channel will carry that for you as well. As Britt Hume mentioned, we are waiting at Barksdale Air Force Base, where President Bush is scheduled to address the nation in just a few minutes. It's our understanding that there are technical reasons that he's not on yet, but that should be happening shortly. I can also tell you that now the, the United States border with Canada has been shut down at all crossings. Uh, there is a report from Afghanistan now, from Kabul, Afghanistan. Uh, Osama bin Laden's people and actually the Taliban now responding to this. Afghanistan's hardline Taliban rulers have condemned this devastating terrorist attack in New York and the one in Washington and rejected suggestions that Osama bin Laden could be behind them. The Taliban's ambassador to neighboring Pakistan uh, has now said that bin Laden, the Saudi dissident who has not been given, has been given asylum in the country, uh, does not have the facilities needed to carry out such an attack. Quoting now from the Taliban, it is premature to level allegations against a person who is not in a position to carry out such attacks. It was a well-organized plan on connection with the 1998 bombings of the U.S. embassies in East Africa that killed 224 people. Now, there are reports that the victim count at the Pentagon is now at 34. Those are unconfirmed reports at this moment, but certainly with a fire that happened so quickly and an explosion on that level, uh, fears at the Pentagon are certainly running high. We're also getting word from NASA now uh, that astronauts aboard the International Space Station can actually see the smoke rising from Washington and New York that this plume of smoke that was once the World Trade Center in New York City can be seen from 224 miles in the sky and on the International Space Station. They are watching in what is certainly a day which will live in infamy, uh, September the 11th, 2001, and the worst terrorist attack in the history of the world. The updates are coming in fast and furious now uh, from individual states across the nation. Suffice it to say that governments across this country are now shutting down all major tall buildings. That's the way it seems, as we've just gotten reports from New Jersey across the river where they watch these buildings fall. The governor of Pennsylvania now asking to use a Fox News satellite truck to address the people of his state. Overwhelming calls now from governors and congressmen and senators for calm across the nation. The president soon to address the nation about how the United States will respond. David Schuster has been reporting throughout the day that the military is now on an alert which is parallel with alert that would be in place should we be at war. Uh, Newt Gingrich saying earlier that, that this is likened to Pearl Harbor. Uh, President Bush will put it all into perspective for us shortly. Those are the latest updates as we have them. Uh, once again, the FBI to make an official statement in just a matter of minutes. This from our uh, correspondent there at the Pentagon. The president to speak down in Shreveport, Louisiana in just a few minutes. John, both of those for you live when they come in here in the newsroom. All right, Shepard Smith in our newsroom. Thanks very much. Again, to restate, you're looking at the place where the World Trade Center used to stand in Manhattan. A billowing cloud of smoke still rolling up from the uh, foundations of the towers. They crumbled 
around, uh, well, in the 10 o'clock hour. This after they were struck by two hijacked jetliners in separate incidents just before and just after 9 o'clock this morning Eastern Time. 50,000 people work in those buildings on a given day. It's certain that a good number of those people were already at their desks. Witnesses describe seeing people jumping from the upper floors in flames, pre preferring to make a, a quick end of their lives rather than uh, suffer disastrously. Here is the picture of the second plane coming in. Uh, we are are not exactly certain at this point which plane that was. It's believed uh, that was the American Airlines Flight 77 from uh, Washington to LAX. We believe that was the plane that was employed as a flying bomb uh, to destroy the second of the World Trade Center towers. The structural steel in those towers, steel that was thought to be strong enough to withstand this kind of attack, ultimately gave way to the heat of the burning fuel from those aircraft. You can see there the pictures, uh, people who have broken out the windows. They cannot breathe. They are leaning outside, uh, waving handkerchiefs, towels, anything they can, waiting for rescue, rescue that almost certainly never came. Uh, the towers crumbled one at a time, as you're looking at the replay here, in a tremendous shower of shattering glass and concrete. Almost certainly there will be casualties in neighboring buildings because the World Trade Center towered so tall above the buildings around it. As it fell, there'd be steel beams, girders, chunks of concrete, enormous piles of material cascading down from a thousand feet in the sky, a quarter mile up, all of this material falling down to the ground, and anybody who was underneath it would have a difficult time surviving indeed. Also, we take you to Washington, where the Pentagon remains on fire, a fire burning out of control after a hijacked jetliner there slammed into the outer wall, the outer ring of the Pentagon. Now, this one could, could have been worse. We have early indications of perhaps three dozen people dead, uh, but it appears that the impact of that plane actually came on the ground outside the Pentagon. So the fire is still burning there, the Pentagon in flames. Uh, clearly, this was an attempt to strike at America's financial structure, the symbol of America in many respects, the World Trade Center, uh, the, the tallest, the most visible buildings in New York, uh, New York City, right alongside New York Harbor, and also a strike at the, uh, at the Pentagon, the center of America's military. Shepard Smith has a late update now from the newsroom. Shep. Uh, John, we have just gotten this in from the World Trade Center explosions in New York City. The death toll is now estimated at 10,000. This out of New York, and this, according to the Pentagon, that there were undoubtedly deaths at the Pentagon as well. Representative Jim Moran, coming out of the Capitol Police headquarters, has just told Fox News on camera, again, he is a Democrat from Virginia, that the official estimate now is 10,000 have been killed in Lower Manhattan as the World Trade Centers collapse to the ground. We're expecting to hear from the President shortly, John. All right, Shepard Smith, thank you. And that, uh, that death toll, uh, suffice it to say, could certainly go up. There were thousands of people, perhaps, among them some of New York's uh, finest and, and bravest police and fire uh, officials trying to effect the rescue of those people who were caught in the top of those buildings. Uh, at the time, we thought, and here you look at the replay of the plane slamming. This is the second plane now slamming into the second tower and the catastrophic explosion there that certainly killed everyone on board the plane as well as probably hundreds in the World Trade Center towers. So there were uh, firefighters and police officers on the ground trying to effect the rescue of those people above. And all of a sudden, both of the towers came cascading down around them, uh, clearly a great number of the people whose lives have been lost today are the firefighters and the rescue crews who are trying to help save others. We are awaiting word from President Bush. He was in Florida at the time this all began. As you look at these unedited pictures of people scrambling away from the dust cloud resulting uh, from the collapse of the World Trade Center. President Bush was on the ground in Florida. He was uh, to address an elementary school on what was supposed to be an upbeat event promoting education in this country. President Bush is safe. Air Force One took him to Shreveport, Louisiana. We expect he will be addressing the nation momentarily.
Uh, once again, the U.S. military is on the highest state of alert. Uh, uh, this, this, the kind of alert that would have emanated from the uh, Pearl Harbor attack. And as uh, former House Speaker Newt Gingrich said today on, on uh, the air on Fox News, certainly this attack will bring with it more casualties than the American forces lost at Pearl Harbor. This is a 21st century Pearl Harbor. Experts have been saying for a long time uh, that perhaps the military attacks of the future would be of this kind. And Bill Daly, former FBI agent, I guess this is the, the, the worst kind of um, scenario. This is, this is what was predicted, but perhaps maybe never imagined. Um, it was predicted, imagined, but the countermeasures to ever deal with something like this were, uh, were something you couldn't come to grips with. How are you going to stop commercial f airliners from coming down routes around New York that they normally travel? It's, uh, it's, it's monumental, the scope of the catastrophe. Uh, Britt Hume is in Washington now with some more information for us. Yeah, John, we just, uh, as we've noted, that fire continues to burn at the Pentagon, but the Secretary of Defense, we now understand from Admiral Craig Quigley, his spokesman, who has just spoken to Fox News a short time ago, says that he is in the building, that he is in the National Military Command Center, which is a kind of bunker within the Pentagon where it is said that communications are working. Uh, while the place is a little smoky, the secretary never left the building, that threat condition Delta, which David Schuster earlier described to you as the most advanced threat condition there is, uh, has been set for the Pentagon, quickly seemed not to know when asked whether that was the, uh, military, the military threat alert nationwide. But as for why it was imposed at the Pentagon, he said, quote, it was simply the prudent thing to do. I think most people would concur with that. Um, the members of the congressional leadership, Brian Wilson reports from Capitol Hill, where he's been at the police station there, uh, have been taken, it is said, to a secure location. We earlier heard from Senator John Kyle that said, yes, they are secure, and they are in touch with each other, that the plan, at least for dealing with these things, as far as Capitol Hill is concerned, is underway and in effect. The FBI, John, is saying that they received no warning about Mike, this, Mike no I warning at all, and for that reason, obviously, that U.S. forces were not on Mike any special I alert. That's the latest from here. All right, uh, Britt Hume in Washington, thank you. As you look at these pictures of the smoking uh, side of the Pentagon, it, it bears repeating that most of the building is still intact and uh, even occupied. David Schuster was in the Pentagon for a good part of the morning. David, are you still inside the building? John, we are. If you, the pictures that you're looking, if you imagine the, the camera swinging to the left and going to the next concentric ring, that's uh, where the uh, media offices are and, and that's where we are. We can tell you that the hallways, uh, to give you an extent of, of how big the fire is that continues to rage out of control at, at many of the offices of the Pentagon on our side, which is clearly you know several hundred feet, uh, if, uh, or, or if not uh, several hundred yards from where the fire is that you can see on the screen, uh, the smoke is so thick that you really can't see down the hallway more than uh, 20 feet in front of you. That's, that's how thick it is. Uh, uh, a short time a while ago, we saw uh, six FBI agents uh, uh, walking down the hallway heading towards the part of the building uh, where the plane uh, crashed. Uh, we do believe now that the plane, in fact, uh, that it was a direct hit on the south side uh, of the building. Uh, some of the local television pictures, when you look at them, you can see that there is a gaping hole at least 150 feet wide uh, by the helipad. It does not appear that there are any marks on the grass in front, so it does seem as if uh, the plane that struck the Pentagon did hit directly into the E-ring, the outside ring. Uh, at the moment, there are still at least, from our estimation, perhaps a 20 to 30 offices over four floors that uh, continue to burn out of control. The flames are shooting out the windows. The, fly the fire apparently continues to spread north along the building, north as far as the side facing Arlington National Cemetery. Uh, again, the Pentagon has been evacuated, except as reported earlier, the National Military Command Center, which is where Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld is, is located. In addition, as far as the threat condition Delta, that applies to some of the Atlantic fleet, some of the air command and control, uh, the groups that would coordinate uh, U.S. military assets along the East Coast. Many of these assets will be used as far as uh, civilian help, civilian efforts. Furthermore, we're told that um, all U.S. fighters in the United States are now on alert and are under control of the North American Air Defense System known as NORAD. This is a joint U.S.-Canadian system based in Colorado. Uh, fighters were set up, were sent up and uh, escorted Air Force One into Louisiana. But again, the situation here at the Pentagon, as you can see, uh, the fire uh, continues to burn out of control. Uh, one of the problems that firefighters are having is that it is very difficult because of how big the Pentagon is to get to some of the inner rings where the fire continues to burn. John? All right. Uh, David Schuster at the Pentagon reporting live. Thank you. Again, apparently in that uh, updated report from David Schuster, the Pentagon took a direct hit.
Uh, let's get another update now from Britt Hume in Washington. Well, Britt. John, the latest thing we have, just quickly, is that we're learning, we're hearing now from the uh, through the White House press pool and from our car, our uh, producer Nancy Harmeyer, who's still in Sarasota where the president was, but in touch that the president has made the statement that he is going to make. He made it to tape, and that the tape has been dropped off there at Barksdale Air Force Base, uh, Barksdale Military Facility there. In, on the Texas-Louisiana border near Shreveport, and he's now headed, uh, we, don't, we know not where, um, and that the, the tape is being ferried to a local broadcasting facility there, and, and uh, you now see the uh, situation there, some live picture from the Pentagon um, of officials there in the hall, and here is the president, here it, I'm sorry, this is the president to make this statement, this is Barksdale. This is tape, folks, not live. Sorry, folks, it appears there we saw the president start to come in. Uh, uh, that, of course, was videotape, and uh, that was a raw tape feed as it was coming in. It takes a while often for levels to be set and for everybody receiving to uh, get clear that the picture and sound are coming in properly, and it is not uncommon at broadcast facilities when tape like this is being fed. We're going to have another go at it here now and, and see if this time we can hear this taped remark from the president. Freedom itself was attacked this morning by a faceless coward. We see what's happening here. This is a videotape being fed from a remote location, and we're trying to get a clear signal and keep it from breaking up and get it onto the air. So sometimes this takes a little bit of time, and uh, we will de definitely do what we can to bring it to you as soon as, uh, as soon as we can see it and hear it clearly. Um, that was the President of the United States. Here he comes again, same tape, see if we can hear it and see it more clearly this time. Freedom itself was attacked this morning by a faceless coward, Earth. and freedom will be defended. Earth. I want to reassure the American people that full, the full resources of the federal government are working to assist local authorities to save lives and to help the victims of these attacks. Make no mistake, the United States will hunt down and punish those responsible for these cowardly acts. I've been in regular contact with the Vice President, Secretary of Defense, the National Security Team, and my cabinet. We have taken all appropriate, appropriate security precautions to protect the American people. Our military at home and around the world is on high alert status. And we have taken the necessary security precautions to continue the functions of your government. We have been in touch with the leaders of Congress and with world leaders to assure them that we will do what is, whatever is necessary to protect America and Americans. I ask the American people to join me in saying a thanks for all the folks who have been fighting hard to rescue our fellow citizens and to join me in saying a prayer for the victims and their families. The resolve of our great nation is being tested, but make no mistake, we will show the world that we will pass this test. God bless. That, that concludes the President's taped comments from Barksdale Military Base in Louisiana. The President of the United States speaking just a short time ago. We know not now where the President is. You heard him say that the United States military is on full alert. All security precautions could be taken, that he's been in touch with House, Senate leaders, and other members of the administration, as well as with foreign leaders. He said we will hunt down and punish those who are responsible for what he called this cowardly act. Uh, that concludes Fox News Channel's presentation and Fox News' coverage of this presidential statement. Back to you in New York. 
Britt, thanks very much. It bears repeating that uh, apparently Camp David, uh, the president's um, vacation residence there in Maryland, apparently was the target of another one of these attacks. We haven't talked about it a great deal today because apparently that, uh, that attempt did not succeed. But there was a fourth airliner besides the two that slammed into the World Trade Center and the one that slammed into the Pentagon, a fourth airliner, a United plane, uh, slammed into the ground uh, not far from, uh, well, about 80 miles southeast of Pittsburgh. And the intelligence indications are that Camp David, the president's, um, the president's uh, vacation uh, residence, and it bears noting the place where the Camp David Accords were signed, uh, signifying a, a, a possible peace deal between the Israelis and the Palestinians, Camp David was apparently one of the attacks. Uh, Bill Daly, um, former FBI agent who worked on the investigation following the first World Trade Center bombing back in 93, is still with us. Bill, there is so much symbolism um, that we will have to be alert for as we look at the causes of what has happened today, uh, right down to the names of the airlines involved, United and American. You know, John, I think as we, we take a step back, and certainly we're all reeling from the, from the shock of the first, you know, few moments of this, which we're still into, and, and the recovery, when we look at, at what actually has happened and, uh, and to the design that has gone into this uh, by using domestic carriers, as you mentioned, ones that carry our own flag on it, uh, crashing into symbols of our way of life. Let me interrupt dramatic. you, Bill, because uh, we are going to... Any questions that you might this have is a spokesman from American Airlines. ...today's events appropriately need to be addressed. The and again, Al, you can't confirm which plane went into what I cannot, what not at this point. And it makes it difficult for you to release any information. Right, it's just impossible at this point. Yeah. Now, yeah. you did get a warning, apparently, this morning that something was amiss. Well, uh, again, every aspect of the investigation is being handled by the FBI, and uh, they will respond to any questions you might have about the investigation. When How is American Airlines handling this in terms of operations, getting passengers off planes that are stuck on planes? We, again, we are in total control of, the, of, uh, of in total contact with the federal government about every aspect of it, and uh, uh, and working with the federal government on all of on all, uh, every aspect of it. When you relatives dial that 800 number, what will they be told? Well, we'll, we'll, we'll deal with them. We have procedures for dealing with them and, uh, and doing the best we can to assist them. Can you tell us if all your planes are on the ground? Uh, at this point, I can't. And what, what's the sense around here? Clearly, it's a terrible tragedy for, for your company. What, what's the sense in this building today? Well, obviously, it's, I mean, it's a matter of deep regret that, that the incident occurred, and we are working uh, completely with the FBI on every aspect of the investigation. Do you ever think so. you'd see something like this? Well, it's, uh, this is an extraordinary circumstance, sir. Is it anything you all tried to prepare for? Okay. Well, it's just, uh, I don't, there's no way to prepare for something like this. Like Al, I'm sorry, did you say all American flights were uh, uh, on the ground? On the ground? Well, I, we, 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 no, we, are, we are working with the federal government to ascertain that at this point. So. Well, there's nothing much more I can provide at this episode. If we have anything more that we can provide, we'd be delighted Thank to do you. that. Okay. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So there you hear from uh, a spokesman for American Air. Airlines, two of its planes apparently involved today, two United airplanes also involved today in strikes against the World Trade Center, the Pentagon, and possibly an attempted strike against Camp David in Maryland, the presidential retreat. As you look at uh, live video of U.S. Air Force fighter planes that are now circling New York as well as Washington, D.C. Shepard Smith has some uh, late-breaking information now for us from the Fox Newsroom. Shepard. A wealth of information coming in, John. I can tell you now that the United States military has dispatched two warships and the National Guard to report immediately to New York Harbor to help in what will be the largest in-country rescue effort in the history of this nation, no doubt. Uh, to repeat our earlier information from Representative Jim Moran, Democrat of Virginia, who came out of the Capitol Police Headquarters, Capitol Police Headquarters, and said on camera, an estimated 10,000 people are dead in New York City, and says the attack on the Pentagon, there were undoubtedly deaths as well. The fire at the Pentagon still 
quoted as being out of control in the words of those there trying to put it out. Uh, this information from the West Bank city of Nablus, where we now have reports and videotape coming into talk, Fox News Channel, where thousands of Palestinians are this day celebrating Tuesday's attacks, chanting, God is great, and, and distributing candy to passersby. The Taliban has made a statement as well, saying that it is, uh, un, it is not right to be putting this off on Osama bin Laden at this moment, that he does not have the resource sources available to do such a thing, and the Taliban there has itself uh, condemned today's attacks. President Bush and a handful of aides were whisked away by motorcade from Capitol Hill. Uh, Mrs. Bush, that is. Mrs. Bush, the first lady and a handful of aides, whisked away by motorcade from Capitol Hill, where she was to have testified at a Senate Committee on Education to a hideout now, the first lady in a hideout away from the White House. There, the sequestered group huddled around a single television in their hideout and channel surf for the latest news. You may be hearing a broadcast going off within our building. We are now in a 45-story building, the News Corp building, and we are hearing on overhead that the New York City Police Department is requesting that all non-essential per non personnel in the building be evacuated immediately. Here is the situation now. It's my understanding that these evacuations are happening in high-rises across New York City. 50,000 people scheduled to work this day in the Twin Towers. Hundreds of thousands more across the city, and all of the skyscrapers in the city of New York are now being evacuated. The problem with that is the subway systems are down, traffic is almost non-existent. We travel here by cabs, which are not on the streets. Uh, John Scott, back to you in New York. Fred Smith, thank you. I want to bring in uh, somebody who has uh, kept an eye on this kind of situation. Over the years, Bill Richardson, the former energy secretary and U.N. ambassador, is joining us by telephone. Secretary Richardson, this is an appalling development. I can only ask for your gut level reaction and, and what should America's reaction be? Well, first we have to support the president, who I think made a very, very important statement that uh, we're not going to tolerate this. Uh, we have to pray uh, for the victims. I think this is a time when the country needs to come together. This is an unbelievable tragedy. It looks like the work of Osama bin Laden, who uh, I had tried to extradite several years ago from Afghanistan as UN ambassador. It's a coordinated attack. I think we have to get the best intelligence we can from our allies and friends around the world, and then basically plan a huge, massive response uh, against uh, these perpetrators. Well, as you say, you have tried to get him extradited before. The U.S. has been pressuring the Taliban to give him up for years. What further pressure can we bring to bear? Well, I believe that the first thing we need to do is penetrate those terrorist cells to find out exactly where he is. Uh, we need a massive response against him there. Secondly, uh, we have to raise the stakes in the international community to uh, initiate sanctions if nations don't cooperate in extraditing him to the United States or finding him. This man is a menace to the international community, not just to the United States. And thirdly, I believe that we have to bring the international community, uh, our allies, the developing countries, in a war against terrorism. Uh, terrorism uh, hits uh, across borders, and there has to be uh, an international, perhaps United Nations response, a coordinated response to prevent this from happening again. This is a massive attack on the United States, but also on the international community. Bill Richardson, the former United Nations ambassador, thank you. As we continue to keep an eye on the skies over Manhattan uh, and in Washington, D.C., people are nervous, understandably, when they hear jets fly overhead, and many of the jets that are flying now are military fighters. On alert there, the Air Force and presumably the Navy as well have uh, military aircraft pat uh, pat pat patrolling the skies over the nation's capital and also New York City. Uh, probably several of the other major cities as well. Let's go to one of our correspondents in Washington, D.C., Rita Cosby, who has some late information for us. Rita? John, I've been talking to intelligence sources 
few hours. And the last thing that they said to me was all signs are strongly pointing to Osama bin Laden. Uh, one intelligence, this is a senior official at an intelligence agency, told me that on June 20th of this year, bin Laden released a video to his followers saying, quote, it's time to penetrate America and Israel and hit them where it hurts the most, signaling that he may plan some sort of attack on U.S. soil. In addition to this, John, um, they're also looking at who would have had the capability, who would have had the motivation. They said in recent weeks there has been a lot of activity on Islamic chat rooms talking about threats against the United States. But in terms of actual training for Osama bin Laden, he does own a number of uh, planes, also trains specific pilots to actually be able to carry out these type of attacks. And this is something that uh, intelligence sources are saying, that they were aware he was doing this type of training, not necessarily to attack the U.S., but to train for suicide attacks on planes and other mechanisms. He also, as we know, is believed to be behind the attack of the USS Cole. And, of course, that was someone who came up on a boat and planned a suicide attack in that mechanism. They do believe, however, um, if he is connected to this, and, again, this is just a strong possibility that they're looking at, that he would have been augmented by another group. They said that, um, of course, he has widespread tentacles across the world and has followers across the world. And among the possibilities that could have uh, that they're looking at right now is augmenting would have been a Palestinian group and also the Hezbollah. All right, Rita Cosby, uh, this is just an absolutely stunning day. I still cannot get accustomed to the pictures that you're seeing there on your screen now. This is a looking, uh, well, we were seeing lower Manhattan. Now, this appears to be the area around uh, uh, Reagan National Airport in, in Washington. Hard to say. We'll find out what these pictures are specifically, but fighter jets now patrolling the skies over Manhattan as well as over Washington, D.C. There is the picture where you should see the World Trade Center st standing tall and proud, but they are gone. 50,000 people scheduled to work in those buildings today. We don't know yet how many of them were able to get out, uh, but uh, the estimates are that 10,000 are dead. Hard, hard to wrap your mind around a number like that. 10,000 dead. We suspect that the number is going to go higher than that. Britt Hume is in Washington, D.C. Britt? Uh, John, uh, some senior members of Congress, uh, members of the Senate in particular, have been, um, been heard now on what they think the congressional response ought to be. Uh, Republican Senator John Warner, who is the ranking member of the Armed Services Committee, uh, said just a short time ago that he believes that the Congress needs to meet tomorrow or as soon as possible in some place. Uh, he also assures Washingtonians and uh, those working in this city that there is a military air cap over Washington, D.C., which means that there are warplanes in the skies that will not allow any unauthorized plane near the city. Uh, that should be of some comfort to those who have been wondering whether a further attack from the air might be on the way or indeed possible. Senator Joseph Biden, the chairman of the Senate uh, uh, Foreign Relations Committee, uh, told our Brian Wilson just a short time ago that he believes that Congress should meet tomorrow and that the meetings that Congress should meet in the Capitol building to show that business goes on. And, uh, and uh, that is uh, something obviously the leaders of Congress are considering very urgently. Now, one of the things that we should point out here when you see the president uh, 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 touching down at a, an Air Force base at an unknown or at least previously unknown location, dropping off a videotape, uh, having taped a statement there and moving on is that at times like these, the security uh, uh, becomes very tight and security officials exercise maximum authority and get control of the situation. And after all that has happened, one can only imagine how extensive and how sweeping they want the further security precautions regarding the president and anyone around him to be. So I think we're probably in for some more mystery about the whereabouts of the president of the United States for some time now, because in a situation like that, security becomes the ultimate, the only, almost the only priority, and that will govern a great deal of what happens. Back Britt, to you, John. Britt, I know we're all grabbing for information here, and it's uh, coming in bits and pieces, but uh, do you know anything about that plane crash that apparently there, there is talk of a plane crash perhaps directed at Camp David? How well, close did it come? That, well, that is what uh, members of Congress coming out of briefings are saying, that the plane crash near Pittsburgh. Now, Pittsburgh is up in the... It, Pittsburgh, of course, is, is, is some distance from Washington, but it is north and west of Washington, as indeed uh, Camp David is north and, uh, and somewhat west of Washington. And so if a plane were headed south uh, and east out of, uh, out of Pittsburgh or, out of in the, or in that region, that would be a likely place.
place for it to that would be a likely area for it to be in or, like, or for it to be in that region. So uh, members of Congress are told that intelligence officials uh, believe that that's exactly where that plane uh, was going uh, when it crashed in that area. So that is obviously what they're thinking, that the Camp David retreat may have been under attack. And the Camp David retreat, by the way, is easier to hit. Uh, than uh, than the uh, than the White House. The White House is really not in anybody's normal flight plan or flight plane. That's not true of the Pentagon. The Pentagon is located just cheek by jowl with Washington National Airport. So a plane could be headed for what looks like a normal approach to Washington National Airport, veer off at the last minute, and crash into the Pentagon, which appears to be what's happened. That would be more difficult to do uh, with the White House. If a plane appeared to be on, on a flight path there, there would be jet scramble. It would be harder to accomplish. Camp David, though, on the other hand is another matter. And I can't help but wonder, Britt, about the possible symbolism of a strike at Camp David, the place where, after all, the Camp David peace accords were signed. Well, absolutely, the Camp David peace accords being signed there. And, of course, it is a symbol of the President of the United States. It is a place where he goes as a retreat. It is thought of as a safe and secure place. Um, the symbolism of that would not be lost on the world either. All right. Britt Hume, again in Washington, uh, thank you very much. Uh, Newt Gingrich, a Fox News contributor, the former Speaker of the House, is, is also joining us once again. Uh, Newt, uh, you have a lot of high contacts at high levels of, of government. Uh, what is the thinking about the responsibility at this point, or is it too early for that? I, I think it's way too early for people to have sorted this out. I think the first reaction is to, as Brett pointed out, is to make sure the President and the, the leadership is safe. The second reaction is to make sure that we save as many lives as we can, that we focus on the rescue effort. And I think you'll see coming out of this in 24 to 48 hours, a much more focused effort to then begin to look at uh, who did it, how do we get at them, uh, how do we hit them hard enough that nobody ever tries to do this again. But I think it takes some time. This is an enormous shock. And the system, I think, takes a little while to get in gear. I must say, though, that to hear members of Congress complain about the intelligence service when the budgets have been too small, when for the last 25 years we've adopted rules that were tighter and tighter and stricter and stricter that made it virtually impossible for the American intelligence agencies to penetrate these kind of groups. I think that if the Congress really wants to be helpful, they need to pass some immediate action that strengthens our intelligence capability. And instead of playing a blame game, they need to take some responsibility for strengthening and enhancing our intelligence. And then I think the administration has to reach out around the world and make quite clear that we are going to go after whoever did this and that people can decide either to be with the terrorist or to be with the Americans. But there's not going to be any middle ground and there's not going to be any neutrality uh, in the process of getting even. This will turn out to be vastly worse in human life than Pearl Harbor, and we have to keep refocusing. This is an act of war. This is not an accident. It's not an act of God. This is an act of war deliberately created by a group of people who were determined to hurt the United States. And yet they could be a relatively small group. How do you strike back at a country uh, that uh, when you may not be able to pin down exactly well, who within that country? Let me say flatly, I, I don't believe this was done by a relatively small group. I don't think you could have trained and prepared for this mission. I don't think without sanctuaries, uh, without people who were protecting them, without uh, safe uh, areas, without training camps. Uh, these, this was not prepared in a couple of mobile homes by a handful of fanatics. This is a well-financed, systematic act and could not be sustained without the support of some very major states. And we have to make clear that we will not tolerate any nation harboring training grounds, preparation areas, or known fugitives, and that we will exert whatever level of pressure and force is necessary to get those people released. Bin Laden has been a known opponent of the United States for eight years. And we have not exerted the kind of pressure we're capable of. This is an act of war against the American people, against freedom, as the president said. And I think we have to react on behalf, as we did in 1941, after Pearl Harbor. We have to react with total effort to make sure that this doesn't happen again. Newt, I know that you are a historian. Uh, perhaps you can uh, fill us in a bit later about uh, reaction financially uh, throughout uh, America and the world after Pearl Harbor. But let me bring in now our managing business editor, Neil Cavuto, who is here. 
Uh, Neil, all of the stock markets continue to be closed today, correct? Right. The first was talk that they would open late. They decided not to open at all. Uh, trading in Europe has now since stopped. The markets there were hit and hit hard. Uh, it's probably a good thing in retrospect the markets never opened here. They would have uh, collapsed at the open anywhere from a 300 to 500 point opening had that occurred. Of course, this is the financial center of the world here, not just the New York metropolitan area in the United States, but of the world. Uh, this was the home of Morgan Stanley Dean Witter. It takes up about a tenth of the lease space in those two towers that are now no more. Um, we should also emphasize that the New York Mercantile Exchange is here. A great deal of oil and gold, even some currency trading, was done out of these buildings. It is also interesting to note that as this all hit the fan, uh, the dollar was tumbling here as the world markets began to sense from this that the United States was in serious, serious trouble, and then this bastion of security was maybe in some doubt. Typically in times of strife, people run to the dollar as sort of a safe haven. They did just the opposite today, and not surprisingly, because terrorism hit our shores. We should also point out some of the reverberations from this. We have not gotten any indications from the New York Stock Exchange or the NASDAQ or any of the financial markets uh, if or even when they're going to open anytime soon. The feeling seems seems to be that they might resume sometime tomorrow, but again, that is not a given. We should emphasize here as well that uh, this is very much royal trading abroad. All the major markets were down appreciably before they shut for business, anywhere from 5 to 7 percent losses on concerns that the world's greatest superpower has a terrorist problem on its hands. Now, where has that money been going? Interestingly enough, it's lifted the price of oil. There's a serious concern that we might go tit for tat into the Middle East on concerns whether this is Osama bin Laden or some Middle Eastern terrorist group, and that this might lift oil prices as a result. We should say that at last check, Oil had shot up better than six bucks a barrel, now to close to $32 a barrel. So the financial pain, besides the obvious physical pain, could be quite pronounced. And it's something we're watching very closely for you because if the intent here was symbolic, that is going after a United Airlines plane and an American Airlines plane, then also attacking the financial mecca of the universe was uh, just as symbolic and perhaps longer term more telling. Rick Leventhal was literally in the center of the storm. He joins us now out of downtown New York with the latest. Rick. Well, it, you know, it's, it's an eerie scene. It's, it's almost eerily quiet now, except for an occasional uh, ambulance flying by. And just a short time ago, we saw some uh, doctors uh, in scrubs heading on small vehicles towards the World Trade Center, uh, which is still, or what's left of it, still smoking down the street here. Police have cordoned off the entire area surrounding it. Uh, the only vehicles passing through now are police cars, uh, fire trucks, and, and ambulances, uh, and construction vehicles like that. We just had a fleet of ambulances head into the scene. They were staged behind us here. They just went in, which suggests that perhaps they're getting closer to the, to the base of the World Trade Center where there might be uh, many uh, injured waiting to be rescued, in fact. And, and joining us now is a former detective with the New York City Police Department, uh, worked with the Commissioner's Office. I know you're very familiar with crisis management. Tom Ruskin uh, just came back from the base of the World Trade Center. Describe for us what you saw there. There's a lot of fire, a lot of debris. Part of the facade of the World Trade Center is all brought down. Uh, and hanging there in an eerie type of site that you would expect to see in a movie. Fire is burning around it. Emergency crews are staged in the area but can't get close to it because of the fire and the chance that the debris may come down. What can we expect to happen next? Well, after they search for survivors, possible survivors, what uh, will happen is the FBI will take over the investigation. The FBI will launch a massive investigation, as the president has told us this morning, which... Uh, will definitely go up to Boston where the planes originated and uh, thereafter go wherever the trail may lead. You're familiar with, with the way the city handles these types of terrorist attacks. You handled the, the last bombing at the World Trade Center. What, what's going on right now in, in, in the hearts and minds of New York City's finest? Well, what's going on is trying to rescue those people who may be left behind uh, underneath the rubble, around the area, people who have been hurt. Hospitals have uh, gone to a full state of alert in their triage areas. A block from here, we have a firehouse that is acting as a triage area so people can go in there and be treated with medical personnel. The city is on a high state of alert relative to the medical uh, 
casualties that we may have. Do we have to, to work under the assumption that this is not the end? Is that the way the police department and everyone, all the other agencies handle this? Well, the military has gone on their highest state of alert. It, we don't know if it's over. We don't know. We know that all planes have been grounded throughout the country at this point in time, and thereafter, each step that uh, has been planned for will take effect. A lot of people might say, well, New York City should have been ready for this. The, the police department, everybody else should have known that something like this might happen. Was the department prepared? Did it have a plan in place? There, the, the, the city constantly trains and retrains. The Office of Emergency Management does nothing but train and retrain and get ready for something like this. But we live in a very free society where our gates are open, where people come in to visit. Terrorism has always been a possibility in the United States because we don't live under the tight control of other countries. So a plane hitting the World Trade Center or two planes hitting the World Trade Center was something that could happen. They are trained for it. I don't think that anyone would ever expect it to happen. Two planes in one day in one city, another plane to hit the Pentagon, another plane to crash in Philadelphia. All right, Tom Ruskin, thanks a lot for joining us. We're hearing that there's a run on a lot of grocery stores in New York City, Upper East Side in particular, where people are starting to panic and thinking they might not be able to get food and supplies and that sort of thing. And obviously the message is not to panic and not to... to take these kinds of actions. Also, I want to point out, they're looking for blood. They need blood donors, and they're, they're asking people if, if you're able to donate blood to go to a number of locations in New York City to do just that. So uh, something that everyone should think about. Reporting live in uh, Lower Manhattan, I'm Rick Leventhal. Now back to you. All right, Rick, thanks very much. Uh, let's get an update now from Shepard Smith in the Fox Newsroom. Shepard? Uh, John, I want to get you updated on a lot of information that has been coming through. Uh, uh, this now coming from the Associated Press, which has just been handed to me, an update coming from AP with editor of a London-based Arabic newspaper saying he received a warning from associates of Osama bin Laden but did not take them seriously. Also, a news conference by airport officials is underway in Pittsburgh. Uh, Pitt, the governor of Pennsylvania will be addressing his state in just a moment through the facilities of Fox News. I also want to let you know, we know more about the president's travels today. You may remember as all of this happened, President Bush was in Florida waiting for an education conference. He was flown then immediately. He, they put him in the air initially with no initial decision about where he would go. They took him to a very high altitude, according to reports. His jet, Air Force One, was accompanied by and flanked by U.S. military fighter jets. Then a decision was made to put him down in Shreveport, Louisiana, where he made the statement. I can tell you that he has now spoken with Mrs. Bush, who is in a bunker, as it is being described, a hideout bunker huddled around a single television set in this hideout, channel surfing for the latest news, according to one person who was in there uh, during the time. Osama bin Laden's name has been mentioned here. The Taliban has said throughout the day, rejecting claims that Osama bin Laden may have been involved. There is dancing in the streets in one city on the West Bank, it is now being said. Uh, we have videotape, as a matter of fact, which we are efforting to get into New York and should have here shortly, of them handing out candy in the streets and saying that God is dead. Now, this as an aside, in June, a United States judge had set this Wednesday, tomorrow, as the sentencing date for a bin Laden associate for his role in the bombing of a U.S. embassy in Tanzania that killed 213 people. So an associate of bin Laden would have been sentenced tomorrow in Manhattan at a courthouse just across the street from the World Trade Center. No one from the U.S. Attorney's Office could be reached today to comment on whether the sentencing is still on. In the West Bank city of Nablus, thousands of Palestinians celebrating now, chanting God is great, distributing candy to passers-by. As we speak at this moment, the death toll continues to rise in lower Manhattan. We had a quote earlier this day from a man, uh, a senator, actually a congressman who had been inside Washington, D.C. police headquarters. He is a Democrat from Virginia, Representative Jim Moran, who came out of the Capitol Police headquarters and sent to our cameras the estimated death toll now 10,000 out of New York and says the attack on the Pentagon, that there were undoubtedly deaths as well. The Pentagon still on fire as we speak in lower Manhattan, still working to clean up the mess and find any potential survivors. Rick Leventhal mentioned just a moment ago this idea that there are fears at least that panic may spread. Rest assured, in much of the city of Manhattan, there is some degree of edgy calm. There are not streets, there are not cabs in the streets. There are not cars making their way around. The, the bridges and tunnels to this island city are shut. 
you, you have to realize as sentiment goes against Osama bin Laden, the people who drive those cabs have suddenly made themselves uh, have made themselves scarce. There is no public transportation to speak of aside from buses in Manhattan. The subways are shut down. The major buildings, at least in our area, in the center of Manhattan, have just been ordered by the New York City Police Department to be evacuated of all non-essential personnel. So the situation as we know it now is this. The tens of thousands of people who work in skyscrapers, which were not leveled today, have been coming out of those skyscrapers in, into the streets with no way of getting transportation anywhere else within the city and no way to exit the city of Manhattan. Therefore, they gather on street corners, talking on cell phones, outside 54th Street, just down the street from here. We could see them at 42nd Street from the, from the roof of our 45-story building here. Outside all the major points where transportation would normally be available, uh, Grand Central Station, the gateway to New York City uh, by subway and by, and by train, uh, Penn Station, where buses were coming in, all shut down. And again, a plea for calm. So many of these people who are sitting around in Manhattan with nothing to do or urged now to donate blood because the situation in lower Manhattan requires that a lot of blood come forward. We are getting reports from every state in the United States now, uh, repeated ones through the Associated Press, about the way each state is now reacting. All government headquarters now on high alert. We are on Delta alert right now in the United States, which means our military is at a level as if war had been declared against the United States. There is no higher state of alert in the United States of America than is underway right now. Delta. David Schuster's at the Pentagon keeping watch there. Rick Leventhal in downtown Manhattan. As the facts come in, we'll bring them to you from the newsroom. John, back to you. All right, Shepard, thanks very much. I want to get an update now from Lower Manhattan. Molly Falconer is at uh, St. Vincent's Hospital where the dead and injured are being taken. Molly? Mm -hmm. It's a terrible scene here, John. Over 300 people have volunteered to go inside and give blood. Hundreds are coming in here to St. Vincent's Hospital, treating for everything from heart attacks to smoke inhalation to severe burns. And I'm here with Dr. Robert Lurch, who's been inside all day. Can you tell us what's been going on? Um, basically inside, there's all types of injuries, from very minor injuries to very serious injuries. Uh, the hospital is very well organized. People are being uh, uh, triaged into the appropriate situations where, whether it be a minor cut or an abrasion or asthma or heart attacks or stroke or whatever. Have you got what you need, and is there a sense of panic, or is it calm? No, I think everything is basically under control. There's every imaginable specialist in there. People are just waiting to do whatever they can, and... Uh, uh, things are very well uh, uh, taken care of at this point. Okay. Is there anything you can tell us about what patients can do? Can people volunteer? Can they come here to ask about loved ones? It's obviously a scene that's been in chaos. Unfortunately, at this point, I don't think really anybody knows anything. Okay. At this point, people are just being taken care of. And as far as in a global sense, what, what, how many people are hurt, how many people are, no one has a clue. Okay. Thank you very much. We'll let you go back to your work. Okay. Thanks. Family members can call St. Vincent's Hospital. Uh, press conference is going to go on around 3 o'clock today, and a list is being compiled and released. Nothing is formal yet. All is in chaos. We'll keep a watch on it here. Back to you. Molly Falconer, thanks very much. The mayor of the city of New York, Rudy Giuliani, is on the phone with us now. Mr. Mayor, do we have any idea yet the number of casualties? We don't know the number of casualties. We know it's going to be a large, large number of people that were seriously injured and that died. And there's no way at this point of knowing or even focusing on that. The, the effort right now is to save as many people as possible. And we have thousands of emergency workers doing that right now. And we have from the police department, the fire department, the emergency services, the governor has alerted and put on standby the National Guard, and they should be able to relieve us later this afternoon. I believe that's going to be a number like 1,500, 1,700 National Guard. And we also have the uh, urban search and rescue teams, three of them, that are coming to New York to help assist our police department and our fire department. I so hate, that's really the, the focus right now has to be. I hate to how many people. How many people can we rescue? Right. I, I hate to wonder how many of your people, how many police and firefighters, were there around the base of the Twin Towers when they began I, collapsing. I am very worried about them, and uh, you know, saw some of them rush in and go in, and was with them. We we were in a building that was uh, trapped for a while. So when we left, I could see that they were going to. There's no question they're going to be significant
casualties to our uh, emergency personnel. What, it's terrible. What do you say to the residents of New York City right now? Clearly, Manhattan has been locked down. The, the, the transportation well, for, in and out is, is, is shut off. It, it, first of all, anyone in, in southern Manhattan should, uh, should just head north, just get beyond Canal Street, even further north. Not only is it safer because the smoke condition is still very bad, but it will help us in the emergency efforts if we clear out southern Manhattan, Canal Street south. Everyone should just leave and walk out and walk north, and therefore we'll be able to get the hundreds and hundreds of ambulances that we have to get in and then take people to emergency hospitals out as fast as possible so we can save as many lives as possible to the rest of the people in the city of New York. And just um, pray. And uh, things are safe and things are secure right now. And let's keep uh, hoping and praying that the casualties are kept to the smallest number uh, possible. We've put out the appeal, Mr. Mayor, for blood donations uh, from people nationwide. Uh, but what else can people do to be helpful? Any people, any, anyone that has emergency uh, techniques or uh, emergency uh, expertise uh, can volunteer. Uh, volunteer at the ho local hospitals. Uh, volunteer to give blood. We're going to we're going to need blood. We have a, over 170 hospitals in the city of New York. We're going to utilize virtually every single one of them, and the hospitals in the surrounding areas. So anyone that believes that they can uh, donate blood, I'll give you at least one location: 153 East 53rd Street. That's 66 in Amsterdam. Uh, the Red, Red Cross actually is at 66 in Amsterdam, so people can volunteer there, or they can go to 153 East 53rd Street and give blood. That would help a great deal. We're going to the hospitals are going to need are going to need blood if if people have background medical backgrounds and they volunteer at the hospitals. That would that would help particularly later this afternoon when the people working there. I was just on the phone with St. Vincent's Hospital. That's under obviously great stress because they're right right there they're, they're the closest hospital but every hospital is going to need help we've had reports mr mayor and i don't want to overstate this but there has been report reports have been reports from some of our people in the field of of a sense of panic beginning to build of a run on groceries and so forth what can you do there's to no calm down? no there's no reason at all for anyone to panic uh, the airspace around new york city is now uh, secure the federal government has cut off uh, any flights. Uh, the fact is that uh, the city of New York is safe right now. It's secure. People should not panic, and they should just go about their lives, and they should have confidence in in America and in American democracy. We're going we're gonna to overcome this, and we're going to prevail. We're going to find out. I'm sure our government's going to find out who did it, and we're going to make an example of you know, of course, there was the uh, the mayoral uh, primary uh, and, and other primaries here in the city of New York. Uh, those have been, uh, we understand, canceled. Yes, for Governor, Governor Pataki and I uh, decided about two hours ago that it that it did not make sense today to have a, an election going on. Uh, among other things, we needed the police uh, personnel that are used during the primary to focus on on uh, this rescue effort and assisting each other. Where were you when this terrible episode began? And, and uh, well, when I out? first was notified, I was in Midtown Manhattan, and I rushed down and saw a good deal of it with my own eyes. Uh, saw the, the damage that was done to the World Trade Center. Saw people jumping from the top of the building. And then we were in 75 Barclay Street, where we set up a temporary command post, and, and then we were hit by the debris from the collapse of uh, the Trade Center, and were trapped in the building for, uh, for a short while, then had to evacuate. 75 Barclay Street, is that your command center? That actually was a ground floor uh, area right next to it. Uh, we were using a ground floor area as a temporary command center so that we could be close to where the uh, rescue efforts were taking place. And uh, as we were setting up, when we were on the phone talking to the governor and the White House, and uh, the, the building collapsed, and we had to evacuate through the basement. It was, uh, it, it was pretty dicey for a while. From your long years of experience at the Justice Department, you are uh, not only familiar with uh, uh, with trying to govern Manhattan, but also familiar with the operation of of terrorist cells. Uh, what do you say to the people who inflicted this this terrible attack on America? I have no doubt that we're going to find out who's responsible for this, and that we're going to uh, make an example out of it. And I believe that uh, ultimately the strength of American democracy will, will prevail. We have to have confidence 
in ourselves now, and we have to have a sense that uh, our government, a government of democracy and laws, is the future of this world, not this kind of horrible, awful, inhumane uh, way of acting. And I'm sure we'll find out who's responsible for it and make an example out of it. Rudy Giuliani, the mayor of New York City, joining us live by telephone. Thanks very Thank you. much. Thank you. We know you have much to do today. It'll be a sleepless night and mostly a sleepless week for you, I'm sure, but uh, thank you for taking the time to be with us. Once again, uh, the mayor's uh, words there, if you have medical specialties, if you can in some way contribute to the rescue effort, you're asked to report to your hospital uh, to be able to do that. Ordinary citizens can donate blood at any hospital in the New York area or any of the, of the, of the uh, blood centers that are already established, but please stay away from lower manhattan if at all possible uh... we're joined now by uh... uh... uh marine colonel oliver north former marine Col colonel ollie north who can give us some of uh, his perspective uh... ollie a, a lot of people uh... newt gingrich among them are are saying that uh, this is the twenty first century pearl harbor do you agree oh it's far worse than pearl harbor john uh, we, what we've got is a, is a vicious attack on the united states uh, interestingly enough, I was on my way back here from Detroit on what may well have been one of the last flights to get off the ground before all U.S. air travel was grounded. Our flight was due to land at National Airport, Reagan National. We were diverted to Dulles. Uh, I got a cab driver who was from, of all places, Afghanistan, paid him heavily. Fox will pick up the tab for that, uh, to get me back here into town. There, several remarkable things, John. The re in spite of the attack here on Washington, remarkable calm as people were courteous but moving quickly to get out of the area. The attack on the Pentagon had activated all of the local law enforcement emergency rescue to include the Fairfax uh, fire and rescue experts who are now, I'm told, being prepared to go to New York to assist in any recoveries that can be made up there. As you know, there are experts that worked on the first world trade bombing and, of course, Oklahoma City. I'm also told that, that the attack that may have been aimed not at Camp David but at the National Military Command Center, Fort Detrick, Maryland, uh, the attack that uh, apparently brought down a plane near Somerset, Pennsylvania. And finally, there is talk already here in Washington of postponing or indeed canceling the, F, the, the, the International Monetary Fund and World Bank Conference here at the end of the month, which was scheduled for Washington and which the city was girding for. In fact, went through an emergency drill last week, uh, which may well have helped some of the response here at this end. No doubt that this is the worst attack against the United States that we have ever experienced. Uh, my sense is, John, that there's going to be a call not to treat this as a crime, but to call it what it is, a war. And it may be a call for the Congress to do just exactly that, to make a declaration of war. Ollie North, thank you. Stay with us if you would, please. Let's uh, get some thoughts on that from another man who knows more than a thing or two about declarations of war. Uh, Al Haig, the former uh, general and also former secretary of state. Is it time to be talking about that? Is it time to declare some kind of a war here, Mr. Secretary? Well, the terrorists have declared war on us uh, for a number of years now. We simply haven't treated it as a war. I'm sure this very shocking and horrible day will... will uh, certainly energize that kind of thinking and I would be for it certainly we should declare war on terrorism and we should take all the actions necessary to stamp it out and that means working with our allies in close harmony but also not to be ha hogtied by moral equivalence arguments which have seemed to dominate our response up to now so what what kinds of arguments can you see coming out of of some kind of a, a strike against terrorist facilities well, I don't have to draw any pictures there. We've, we've seen it for a number of years. Uh, we saw it even uh, dominate uh, our decision to, to let Saddam Hussein survive the Gulf War, for which we uh, should be very, very, uh, uh, have second thoughts on that today. But we also know that bin Laden has made it very clear that this is a, a war against the United States and Israel, and we should take action accordingly. We haven't done that. And, and those who are giving them harbor and sanctuary we should talk to in very forceful terms and take action if that's necessary. But for now, we Americans should avoid panic. We should stay united. We should shut up on what I call the recriminations of politically motivated operatives here in Washington. 
unite behind our elected president and get on with the task of giving all the resources we can, our prayers, our physical resources, to the victims of this horrible uh, attack and this act of war. Al Haig, thank you. Stay with us if you would. You mentioned the president, and we want to replay for you now what the president had to say around uh, 1230 today. Uh, the president was taken from Florida to Shreveport, Louisiana, where he made this statement. Let's listen to what uh, Mr. Bush said. Freedom itself was attacked this morning by a faceless coward, Earth. and freedom will be defended. Earth. I want to reassure the American people that full, the full resources of the federal government are working to assist local authorities to save lives and to help the victims of these attacks. Make no mistake, the United States will hunt down and punish those responsible for these cowardly acts. I've been in regular contact with the Vice President, Secretary of Defense, the National Security Team, and my Cabinet. We have taken all appropriate, appropriate security precautions to protect the American people. Our military at home and around the world is on high alert status. And we have taken the necessary security precautions to continue the functions of your government. We have been in touch with the leaders of Congress and with world leaders to assure them that we will do what is, whatever is necessary to protect America and Americans. I ask the American people to join me in saying a thanks for all the folks who have been fighting hard to rescue our fellow citizens and to join me in saying a prayer for the victims and their families. The resolve of our great nation is being tested. But make no mistake, we will show the world that we will pass this test. God bless. A grim-faced President Bush in an address to the nation made uh, within the past uh, hour and a half from Shreveport, Louisiana. This after the awful events took place over the span of about an hour and 45 minutes today. An airplane smashed into the World Trade Center tower just before 9 a.m. A second plane followed a little bit after 9 a.m. Eastern Time. A third plane, all of them hijacked, smashing into the wall of the Pentagon about uh, 10 a.m., 9.45, I should say. And a fourth plane crashing in Pittsburgh. It is a day that has forever changed the future of this nation. The response yet to be determined. And welcome to our continuing coverage of the crises in New York and also Washington, D.C. Target America, enemy unknown. Apparently terrorist strikes taking place in the span of an hour and 45 minutes. You're looking at a replay of videotape of the second of two hijacked airplanes smashing into the wall of the World Trade Center in lower Manhattan. That particular strike came minutes after 9 a.m. Eastern Time this morning. The first tower had already been hit by a similar hijacked plane, flying bombs, if you will. This, then, is video taken from about 10 a.m. After that tower, the second one which was hit, that tower could no longer stand the strain of the flames uh, that weakened the structural elements, and the tower collapsed, sending concrete, glass, steel, raining down almost a quarter mile onto the streets below. This now, the second tower, the one that was hit by the first plane, also collapsing, earthbound, in a, in a deafening and terrible and fiery conflagration of smoke, flames, and certainly tremendous loss of life. Perhaps as many as 50,000 people scheduled to work in the World Trade Center towers on this day 
It's unknown at this point how many of them were able to make it out. Certainly, there were people who did get out from as high as, we have reports, as high as the 92nd floor. But clearly, an estimate of perhaps 10,000 people did, and that, meant that number may go higher. Now, these pictures from earlier, outside the Pentagon in Washington, D.C., or just across the river they're from, 9.45 a.m. on the south wall of the Pentagon, a hijacked airliner believed to be United Airlines uh, was, was smashed into the outside south ring of the Pentagon. You can see the smoke billowing up uh, from the uh, headquarters of our nation's armed forces. The building's still on fire. They have not been able to get it out yet. And in fact, we have been told that the uh, flames have penetrated not only the outer ring, but also the, the inner rings of the Pentagon. Firefighters are trying to get a handle on it, but in a building of that size, they are having a very difficult time. Uh, President Bush was spirited away from an event in Sarasota, Florida, put aboard Air Force One, uh, where he made a statement to the nation upon landing at a uh, previously undeclosed location. Shreveport, Louisiana is where the president turned up. He is safe, and so far um, all officials of the U.S. government, it appears, are safe. Uh, but for the first time in this nation's history, all air travel has been grounded. All airports shut down. These are pictures of what's left of the World Trade Center. You can see those leaning shells of what used to be a very familiar sight to many Americans. Uh, the steel and glass and, and concrete towers rising up 110 stories proud. Uh, they are simply enormous piles of rubble right now. Again, we do not know how many people have died. Uh, there could have been as many as 50,000 people in the building at that time of the morning. Uh, certainly many hundreds of people who were on board those hijacked airliners have died. Uh, one of them, American Airlines Flight 11, it was scheduled to fly from Boston to LAX, 92 people on board. Also, American Airlines Flight 77, uh, bound from Washington to Los Angeles Airport, uh, 64 people on board. A couple of United Airlines planes also apparently taken by force by these suicide hijackers bent on causing the maximum amount of destruction possible, and they have done that, um, uh, inflicting damage on New York City and on Washington, D.C., uh, that even in the worst terrorist scenarios, nobody could have imagined. I want to bring into the discussion now my uh, co-anchor, Linda Vester, and also uh, Neil Cavuto, who is with us. Uh, the uh, stock markets uh, throughout the nation are shut down. The NASDAQ and the New York Stock Exchange never opened today. The world financial markets really in turmoil. Yeah, you're right. I mean, uh, to jump on that, I think it's important to keep in mind, besides the carnage that you outlined, John, and, and I know uh, Linda will shortly, this is the financial capital of the United States, folks. This is the financial capital of the world, and that is as important and symbolic as the choice of uh, airlines that uh, these guys decided to hit, United and American. When you can bring to a halt all trading in the, the wealthiest country on the planet, you have also done a service to your cause, even though a clear... Uh, calamity to ours. Uh, the New York Stock Exchange shut down uh, today. It was supposed to open late. It decided not to open at all. The NASDAQ was shut down today. But here's what's interesting about the World Trade Center. It is actually a complex of buildings way beyond the two gigantic towers that John pointed out that collapsed today. Uh, it houses some of the most pedigree firms and financial uh, names on the planet. Morgan Stanley Dean Witter has essentially been demolished today. Offices that are housed there are now gone from there. They occupied the upper tier floors in the so-called One World Trade Center that was hit by that second plane. We should also point out that the New York Mercantile Exchange was essentially destroyed today. That is where much of the world's oil and energy and uh, metals trading is done. Why is that important? Because if you can stop that or disrupt that, you can cause those prices to dramatically rise. And that is exactly what's happened. Some of the fallout from this goes way beyond 
beyond the smoke and fire as you're seeing there on that screen. Uh, oil prices rocketing today, up to $32 a barrel, a better than $6 advance. We're also seeing stock markets across the world falling on this on concerns that the safe haven of the world is in considerable disarray. Linda. We want to take you now to Washington, D.C. You now know that the U.S. military has been placed on high alert status. That is U.S. military personnel in the United States and all around the world. There is also, just to give you more information, amid this fire at the Pentagon, apparently from this plane crash earlier this morning, uh, there is a full air cap around all of Washington, D.C. With that, we, we take it to Tony Snow, who is uh, monitoring things in Washington. He has more new information. Tony? Thanks, Linda. Well, the Pentagon, Craig Quigley, the rear admiral, who's a well-known public affairs officer, has given an off-camera briefing to some of our reporters. He said the Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld was, in fact, in the Pentagon at the time of the explosion and, furthermore, tried to make his way in within the building to the site of the explosion. He went outside for a bit of time to try to assist with some of the wounded, then was ushered back in, and he's now at the National Military Command Center, which obviously is serving as a hub of not only gathering and providing information, but also trying to formulate a follow-up strategy to today's uh, acts of terrorism around the country. And uh, here's Craig Quigley. The Department of Defense can impose around the world uh, they are imposed on a local basis because what may be true here in Washington could be very different in San Diego or, or some other location. Here in Washington, D.C., we are at threat condition Delta. That is the highest condition that we can go to. That is the absolutely appropriate thing to do given the events of this morning. What, what seems to have happened is that we had an aircraft intentionally fly into the Pentagon. Uh, for those of you with cameras, you can see the spot behind me. Uh, there were intense fires following the aircraft's impact into the building. Arlington search and rescue personnel are just now, and it's about uh, almost 2 o'clock, just now gaining access to portions of the building where the plane hit because the fires were too intense. Um, the fires are still burning in the Pentagon, at least in that vicinity. Um, we have a variety, too many to even mention, of local um, first responders, fire departments, uh, police departments, you name it, that have rushed to the aid of, of the Pentagon here and the people. Each of the military departments is working to set up an 800 toll-free number where family members can call to find out the status of their loved ones. As soon as we have those phone numbers, we will give them to you. I would ask for your help, please, in getting those numbers out as far and wide and quickly as possible so that we can alleviate some of the concern for individuals who have loved ones that work in the Pentagon. Um, I don't have an, a feel for the extent of damage to the building, but it was significant. And again, fires are still burning, at least in several places in the building. Um, that's about what I know. I'll try to answer some of your questions, but you're going to have a lot more questions than I have. Did the we we ask you about the individual right here. Explain what happened to you personally at the time of the impact. What did you see and, and hear and feel, if anything? How did you respond? What were you trained to do in that situation? Well, despite the, the size of the Pentagon building, many in the building felt uh, a thud and heard kind of a muffled explosion. And it was, um, at, at that point, uh, the Defense Protective Service, the fire department, uh, others uh, uh, took off in, uh, for action to the impact point in the building. Um, the building was very quickly evacuated. Uh, people were, were sent as far away from the building as possible. Uh, many, many people were sent home. Uh, and again, with, with a request, please call your loved ones right away to let them know you're okay. Uh, people uh, were, again, sent as far away from the building as possible. We didn't know what might happen next, and the fire was burning very fiercely at that point in time. Was there a Go ahead. 
No, I, I sense no panic. I, people were moving very quickly for the exits to the building, but it was all very controlled. Do you know what happened to the FBI handling this? Are there any military agencies? I'm sorry, say that again. Is the FBI handling this exclusively, or is there any military organizations that are helping with the investigation? Well, I'm sure the FBI would probably have the lead on this as any domestic uh, sort of circumstance. We will assist wherever... All right, that is uh, Admiral Quig Craig Quigley. We want to take you now to... Uh, Spokesman for the Washington, D.C. police. Let's listen into what he has to say. ...reports from a variety of federal agencies. Once all that information has been received, the House and Senate leadership will make a determination as how they would like to proceed from this point forward. No, we do not have a plan to approach the Capitol today. I'm sorry? Are they going in session tonight? Are they going to be in session tomorrow? That decision will be handled by the House and Senate leadership. We'll have that later on this afternoon. As soon as I have word, uh, the leadership will either issue that statement themselves or they'll issue a statement through me. Can they be in session anywhere but the Capitol building? Can they conduct business somewhere else in an off-site location? I don't anticipate that to happen. Who just, got, in, who who just got into the chopper that landed on the Capitol grounds? That, that's an area that uh, deals with direct security, national security issues. Um, I'm sorry, I can't disclose that information. What I, what I can tell, excuse me, what I can tell you is we have taken... All right, so uh, we have apparently lost, at least temporarily, our connection to Washington, D.C., but look here, live pictures once again. Uh, these uh, from just across the Potomac River of the Pentagon, still on fire, a fire burning out of control after a hijacked airliner. We believe this one to have been a United Airlines flight smashed into the Pentagon around 9.45 this morning. Uh, that was uh, only the capper to what had already been a horrific morning. Just before 9 a.m. Eastern Time, another hijacked airliner smashed into one of the towers of the World Trade Center. A second plane, also hijacked, smashed into the second tower shortly thereafter. You're about to see video of the 9.10, approximately, crash. Uh, that suicide bomber smashing into that uh, World Trade Center tower. Uh, it was not long before that tower collapsed. The other one followed soon thereafter. The loss of life so far catastrophic, estimated at 10,000, but that number could go much higher. Shepard Smith is joining us now from the Fox Newsroom. Shepard. Uh, John, we're getting a great deal of information. I want to get, get past along the good news now, as it appears to be that the Department of Defense was very lucky today. This from our David Schuster, who is still there, who reports that it appears the jetliner crash at the Pentagon could have been much worse. We are now told that the wedge of the Pentagon, which was hit, recently underwent renovations and that this particular area was largely unoccupied at the time of the attack this morning. The, as a result of that, the number of casualties at the Pentagon could be much lower than many had feared. In fact, we're now told that only 40 people are being treated at a nearby hospital, seven of those listed in critical condition. Uh, on another note, the plane which crashed in southwest of Pittsburgh this day. You may remember Britt Hume was on the air earlier today reporting that there was a plane jetting up the Potomac and that there were fears at least that this plane, this jet, might be en route to cause more problems at the White House. The White House was evacuated just around the time Britt Hume was making that report. Now we know that that plane crashed. How did that plane crash is one of the questions which is being explored at this moment. There was a cell phone call, which according to the Associated Press and confirmed through the military, that was placed from this particular jet at, just before it crashed uh, uh, outside of Pittsburgh. And according to reports, uh, there were 45 people on board this thing. It was 80 miles southwest of Pittsburgh. And at 9.58 this morning, Eastern Time, a passenger on board this plane, who claimed to be locked inside a bathroom, began screaming on the phone to emergency dispatchers that, in fact, the plane had been hijacked and he was hiding out in a bathroom trying to get help for this plane. There were 45 people on board it. We have no reports of any survivors. At this moment, there is an urgent plea out in the city of New York for blood donations. And though I know we're, we're broadcasting to a, world, to a world audience, I want to give what information I can about that because this has apparently become quite serious. While I'm searching for it, I can tell you that all the entire Major League Baseball schedule for the remainder of the regular season has been at least postponed. Uh, the Emmy Awards, which were scheduled for Sunday night in Los Angeles, have also been postponed. Uh, this blood, this plea for blood donations in New York City has reached what some are calling critical mass now. 
There are blood donation centers set up across Manhattan and other boroughs of the city as well as emergency workers continue to try to pull survivors, for whatever number of them there are, from the scene which you're seeing on your screen night right now. So many people running for cover. The lens of that covered in dust as the largest building in the city of New York came crumbling to its knees as thousands of people waited around that building. There was chaos around this building at the moment. The police department of Manhattan, the fire department there, this had just happened. A jet had plowed into the World Trade Center. By the thousands, they were piling out of there. People were jumping out of buildings, out of the windows from 30 stories up. People were screaming, running away to a, a radio reporters saying, I just saw people jumping from 30, 40 stories in the sky, and all of a sudden, as the police and fire departments work to maintain control, after this has happened, the tower collapsed, and all of those rescue personnel and people trying to flee this scene were left underneath all of that rubble. The carnage in Manhattan has just begun. The rescue effort is well underway, and we have multiple reports of people coming from their apartment buildings, having just seen what you're witnessing right now, one of the two towers of the World Trade Center collapsing in lower Manhattan and residents of this city going out and taking the shirts off their back, applying tourniquets to people's arms and trying to save as many people as possible. A congressman who was inside the Washington, D.C. police today emerged from that police department and told one of our correspondents that the very early death toll in Manhattan was expected to be around 10,000. John. Shepard, we have more information coming in. Just to make it clear to all of our viewers who are watching right now, although the scenes you may be seeing on your television are chaotic, it's important to remember there is a government plan in place that has been enacted. It's called the Federal Response Plan. It's been put in place by 28 federal agencies, FEMA involved. It's all led by the Department of Justice. They're involved in crisis management. The FBI is involved in leading the investigation. The plan has been practiced over and over. It's being put in place today. Also, a reminder that uh, as they are asking for blood shortages in New York City, or they're asking for blood donations in New York City with shortages in New York and in Washington, D.C., the U.S. military is on the highest alert both in the United States and around the world. A warship and the National Guard have been dispatched to New York to help with the rescues. We go now to senior correspondent Rita Cosby. She has more information on what uh, the FAA has put in place, a full national ground stop, the first time ever in U.S. history. Rita. That's right. That ground stop went in place about 9 a.m. Eastern time several hours ago. And some good news from the FAA. They said that they had about 40 to 50 domestic flights that were in the air. And as of about five minutes ago, they all had landed. As of five minutes ago, they have all landed now, about 40 or 50 domestic flights. These are all the domestic flights that were in the air. Of course, because of that ground stop, Linda, they were ordered to return to their destinations immediately. They are awaiting the arrival. There's a minimal number, we're told, of international flights that are still en route to the West Coast. They are going to be landing at several different times in the next few hours. But we are told from an FAA official that all of those planes are accounted for. In other words, there are no indications of any problems at this point on any of those flights, and there are just a minimal number of those. In addition to that, uh, we are told from a number of U.S. officials are telling Fox News that there are, quote, strong indications that people linked to Osama bin Laden and also his group, the Al-Qaeda group, which is his group that he organizes out of Afghanistan, that they are strong indications that people linked to him and his group are possibly behind this. Um, they say that for a number of reasons. They say that they have the training in place, they have the capabilities in place, the resources in place. Also, an intelligence official telling me that they do have information that bin Laden is in Afghanistan and that there was some movement of his troops in recent weeks, in the last week and a half specifically. They're also looking at the possible connection that in the last few days there is a Northern Alliance figure in Afghanistan who was fighting against the Taliban and was very much against Osama bin Laden, and he had been assassinated in recent days. And soon after that, bin Laden's followers put out a word saying that we're going to attack all enemies of bin Laden. In addition to this, on June 20th of this year, bin Laden and his followers released a videotape in which bin Laden was saying, quote, it is time to penetrate America and Israel and hit them where it hurts the most. In this, there was no specific warning of an attack. And again, intelligence sources are telling me that they had no idea that this attack was going to happen. But they were certainly getting some hints that there may be something on U.S. soil based on this message that he put out just June 20th of this year. 
And also, they said, on some of the Islamic chat rooms, there's been a heightened amount of activity. There's always been sort of continual threats against the U.S. on these chat rooms, but a heightened amount of activity, particularly in the last week and a half. And U.S. officials are strongly looking at the possibility of bin Laden and also his group, al-Qaeda, being behind this. The other thing they point out that it was just about a year or so ago, and I remember this when I was covering all the millennium attacks, the possible millennium attacks that were basically thwarted all over the world, that one of the things that they were looking at was Osama bin Laden with an Algerian group, and remember he has tentacles all over the world, that they were planning to hijack a number of planes that was over a year ago, right around the time of the millennium. And that plan was thwarted in addition to a number of other things. So they learned at that point that the possibility of hijacking planes was something that they were looking at. They also said that there was information, some intelligence information, that he was training individuals for suicide bombings, as we know from the USS Cole. Of course, uh, a number of Yemenis have been uh, tried in that case. The trials are still going on at this point. But uh, some of them are believed to have ties to Osama bin Laden, and intelligence officials tell me privately that they believe he was behind that attack. That was where somebody pulled up in a boat and a bomb went off, a suicide bomber in a boat. But they strongly believe that he has the intelligence, the capabilities, and we know from a number of people who were involved in the East Africa bombings, the embassy trial in, in New York, which took place not too long ago, that many of those were pilots. So he certainly had the capabilities, the finances, and intelligence officials, uh, one senior official telling me just a few moments ago, strong indications that uh, this tax could be possibly linked to him and his group. Back All right. to you. Rita Cosby in uh, Washington, thank you. Uh, let's go to um, uh, our Molly Falconer, who is in uh, outside one of the hospitals in Manhattan where the uh, dead and uh, wounded have been taken. Molly? John, this has been a hospital under siege all morning as the dead and wounded have been brought here to St. Vincent's Hospital in uh, downtown Manhattan. Um, we are calling for blood and for extra supplies. And I'm here with the city controller of New York, Alan Hevesy, who is saying that there are hundreds of firefighters and policemen who are still not accounted for down at the Twin Towers. What can you tell us about that? Well, what I've been told by police officials is that when the first plane hit the first tower, the uh, emergency services, uh, EMS, the firefighters, and the police officers rushed to the scene. Yeah. Then the second plane hit and caused enormous damage, right. and then the tower collapsed, right. and there are a number that are not accounted for. They may be all right for all we know, but they, we're, we're very worried. And you said one thing coming down here. You are running for office here in New York City, and that election being held today, very symbolic that we've had this attack today, has been postponed, and you have, are just about to release a statement along with your uh, fellow running uh, mates and competitors about that. What can you give us a preview of that statement? Well, what, what we said was we, uh, we're here to stand in support of the families who are mourning the dead and yeah. the, the, the huge number of people who are injured uh, in this catastrophe and that, that this is not a time for politics and we fully support the decision to cancel this election. Uh, Two questions. Is 10,000 a realistic number? And there is an emergency bunker, a secret one, inside the World Trade Center. Have you heard any word from that? Well, we haven't heard anything from the command center that's uh, where our, which is the headquarters for our emergency services. Um, again, that doesn't mean the, 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 that they're not okay, but we haven't heard. Okay. But secondly, there are 50,000 people who work in the World Trade Center. This was a quarter to nine in the morning. There are another ten number, tens of thousands of people who work, who move through the World Trade Center with the subway or the train or eating in the restaurant. So the, that number could be plausible. We don't know. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining us. City Controller Alan Hevesy. And uh, we have a press conference here at the hospital slated for 3 o'clock today. They cannot estimate the number of dead and wounded. Back to you, Linda. All right, Molly Falconer, thank you very much. Just to give you some more information, more than 10,000 rescue personnel uh, have been sent rushing to Lower Manhattan. That is the area where the World Tra Trade Center was located until this morning. Uh, there is a shortage of blood. Two warships and the National Guard have been dispatched to the area to uh, help with uh, the rescue operations. Some of the wounded, not only filling up the New York City hospitals, but hospitals across the, uh, across the river into New Jersey. They're just taking people basically wherever they can find room at this point. Uh, once again, we want to take it back to correspondent Rick Leventhal, who has been there on the ground near the World Trade Center, getting people's reaction as they were fleeing from the collapsing buildings. Rick? And Linda, we just spoke to a couple of firefighters who were walking by. Uh, they were not eager to stop and talk because they're still trying to figure out if, if their friends made it. Uh, a lot of firefighters responding to the initial uh, explosion, the initial crash of the jets into the towers, and then to the, uh, to the collapse of the first building. A lot of firefighters and other emergency personnel on the ground near the buildings, and there's fear that many of them may have been lost 
in the collapse of, of the two towers. So uh, firefighters uh, on scene here, not just trying to get the fire out, there's still a fire burning uh, at what's left of the two twin, uh, World Trade Center towers. But they're also trying to figure out if their friends are still alive, their, their fellow firefighters. Uh, the only vehicles on the street at this point are, are police vehicles, uh, ambulances and fire trucks, uh, occasional construction vehicles going by. But the, the, the lower Manhattan uh, in the several blocks surrounding the World Trade Center is virtually shut down. Uh, it is a, uh, a major scene here. Uh, police and fire officials everywhere. Uh, but their main focus now is to uh, get that fire out and to hopefully find possibly some survivors in the rubble. There were a lot of people on the ground near those buildings when they came crashing down. We were among them. We were a few blocks away, and even a few blocks away, the clouds of, of smoke and debris coming from the, the collapse of this 110-story building was huge uh, and enveloped these blocks, covered people from head to toe with soot and concrete ash, many of them now just wandering out of here. I talked to a guy who worked uh, a couple of blocks away from the scene. Uh, he, able, he was able to get into an office nearby uh, and stayed there for most of the morning and just now is getting out of here. So a lot of people took refuge uh, after this happened, but many more were not able to do that because they were caught up in the collapse of that building, Linda. Rick Leventhal joining us live from uh, Lower Manhattan. Rick, thanks very much. All right, uh, continuing to look now at the situation in Lower Manhattan, where the Twin Towers once stood. These are live pictures. You saw moments ago the replay of the collapse of those two really symbols of American finance and business. The World Trade Center gone today after these terrorist attacks, an attack that uh, President Bush says we will respond to. We take it now down to Washington. Tony Snow uh, getting more reaction from lawmakers evacuated, obviously, from the Capitol, but uh, now starting to figure out and coordinate their plan of response. Tony? Linda, thanks. Yes, we're joined from elsewhere in our Washington studios by Senator John Bro, Louisiana Democrat. Senator Bro, first, were you in the Capitol at the time of the evacuation today? Senator Bro, it's Tony Snow. Can you hear me? Well, I'll tell you what, Linda. I think let me just uh, give a little, a couple of little additional items of information. We're going to try to establish our audio contact with Senator Bro. Uh, let's try once again. Senator Bro, Tony Snow. Can you hear me? I can hear you fine, Tony. Great, thank you. Were you in the Capitol at the time of the evacuation this morning? Actually, we were, Tony. We were having a Democratic leadership meeting with uh, Dom, Tom Daschle and all of the leadership team when uh, we had the television on. We were watching what was happening with the Twin Towers in New York, and all of a sudden we could see the smoke coming from the direction of the Pentagon and were informed that the Capitol was immediately being evacuated. We've heard some rumors that there may also have been a close overflight of the Capitol. Do you know anything about that? Tony, when we left uh, the Capitol, uh, we were all just getting out as fast as we could, and we looked like there were, uh, it was a plane that was flying in an unusual area uh, around the Capitol, but I think no one knew whether uh, that was uh, uh, you know, a plane that was uh, trying to do damage or probably it might have been one of our own planes just surveying the area to make sure things were safe. Senator, would you like to see Congress reassemble tomorrow? There's been some talk of having a meeting of Congress, A, to demonstrate determination to move on, but B, also to consider a declaration of war. Well, one of the problems is who do you declare war against? I think that obviously I think everyone, Republican, Democrat, Independent alike, is very determined to get to the bottom of this at the same time while we're worried about victims and their families and the rescue mission that is on the way. But I think you're going to see a very strong bipartisan uh, agreement that we have to pursue uh, uh, all possible actions against the responsible parties. is the difficult job right now, unlike uh, the summer of the 7th, 1941, and Pearl Harbor. We knew who the responsible party was then. I think there's still a great degree of uncertainty as to who those parties are today. We want to strike back. The question is, who do we strike back at? Senator, also, there's been a lot of debate about budgets and surpluses. All that going to be set aside right now, and people, at least in the Capitol in the short run, focusing on national defense and security? Tony, I think you're going to see the country coming together, the political leaders in both parties coming together like we haven't seen in a long time. One thing America does in a time of crisis is to stand together, to work together, to look for solutions to these very uh, serious problems. I think you're going to see uh, a lot less bickering and trying to unite to find out uh, who caused this 
and take every action humanly possible to see to it that it never, never happens again. Senator, if you could stand by. We're joined on the phone now by Sandy Berger, who was the national security advisor from President Clinton and is well versed in especially the ways of Osama bin Laden. Mr. Berger, first, your reaction. Does this at least have the feel to you of an Osama bin Laden operation? Well, it is a, it's, a, it's a massive and coordinated attack on the United States um, of, a, of a kind that we have uh, not seen before, a major escalation uh, of a terrorist assault on the United States. It's a sophisticated operation uh, uh, that obviously involved uh, uh, dozens of people in the United States. Uh, penetrating the United States, um, and uh, I, I think uh, we've got to be careful not to uh, leap to conclusions, uh, but certainly uh, bin Laden and, and al-Qaeda would be a, a suspect. Would it be your sense or expectations that it would be likely that there would be more attacks? Or is there any way to figure that out at this juncture? I, I think we're in uncharted waters, Tony, and uh, we've not seen anything like this before, uh, an attack uh, on the, uh, uh, in the United States of this magnitude involving suicide bombers, involving commercial aircraft. Um, uh, this is, again, a major escalation. We have to be... Uh, uh, America, I, I believe we will know who is responsible for this uh, sooner rather than later. There are enough uh, uh, pieces to this that uh, we will put them together, in a, uh, I think, before long. And the response here has to be uh, strong and sustained. Uh, it has to be in coordination with our allies. This is not just an attack on the United States. It's an attack on the civilized world, um, and there's no single uh, uh, action here that will uh, be sufficient. Uh, uh, this will require, I think, a, a comprehensive and sustained effort to to root out uh, 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 what is obviously a, 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 a very sophisticated operation. Mr. Berger, earlier Senator Bro mentioned the fact that at this point it's hard to declare war because we don't know upon whom we should declare war. You've been through this before. You've seen terrorist attacks on American assets. You seem fairly confident this time that we're going to be able to figure out who did it. What pieces of information are there that would lead us to draw that conclusion? Well, I mean, this involved uh, dozens of people. Uh, Tony, uh, and a, an operation that's uh, presumably been planned over months, uh, a coordinated attack on multiple sites involving uh, American aircraft hijacked from American airports. Um, uh, this is not a single act where someone can get in a getaway car and, uh, and speed off. So I, I believe the combination of the uh, forensic FBI investigation as well as the intelligence side of this um, will in, in uh, not too distant future um, uh, have uh, a pretty good bead on, on where uh, what the source of this is. Sandy Berger, former National Security Advisor for President Clinton, Senator John Bro, thanks both for joining us. Now let's toss it back to our colleagues in New York. All right, Tony Snow in Washington, thank you. We are trying to keep an eye not only on the situation at the Pentagon, but also in lower Manhattan. The pictures you're seeing now uh, came around 10 o'clock this morning Eastern Time when uh, the Twin Towers, the World Trade Center, the symbol of American capitalism to many, came tumbling down one after the other. This after they were struck by two hijacked planes. Our Julia Raleigh, a Fox News producer, is on the phone with us now from Lower Manhattan. Julia, do they have a handle on the situation there yet? There's a lot of people who are standing around, John, who are kind of watching what's going on. There are people trying to fight the fires, but we're standing here just looking at flames and smoke billowing everywhere. The wind will start to blow, and the dust, it's about six inches thick where we're standing, will just start to swirl up in these dust devil type storms and blow everything everywhere and around. <laughs> From right where I'm standing, it doesn't look like it. The buildings uh, that you're talking about are not just the remnants of the Trade Center itself. You're talking about other buildings nearby. 
So the other towers of the World Trade Center, so Tower 1 and 2 are gone. And it appears for the moment, so is our connection with Julia Raleigh, our field producer, uh, reporting live from Lower Manhattan. Yes, the World Trade Center, once the world's tallest building, certainly the tallest in Manhattan, uh, crumbled today. There is very little of it left except a pile of rubble. And as you can imagine, all right, we have... Uh, we have now a link with uh, Mayor Giuliani, the mayor of New York City. Uh, let's listen in. That, uh, we're all undergoing right now is something that we've had nightmares about, but probably thought wouldn't happen. My heart goes out to all of the innocent victims of this horrible and vicious act of terrorism, acts of terrorism. And our focus now has to be on saving as many lives as possible. We have hundreds of police officers and firefighters who are engaging in rescue efforts in Lower Manhattan. I want to thank Governor Pataghi for the incredible cooperation and coordination, and including uh, deploying the National Guard that will be available to relieve our police officers and firefighters and emergency workers in the next couple of hours. Uh, the Governor and I just spoke to the President of the United States. The coordination with the federal government from the time of the first attack has been excellent, including closing off the airspace around Manhattan and doing everything that can possibly be done in the face of this barbaric act to make the city secure. And we will uh, strive now very hard to save as many people as possible and to send a message that the city of New York and the United States of America is much stronger than any group of barbaric terrorists that our democracy, that our rule of law, that our strength and our willingness to defend ourselves will ultimately prevail. And I'd ask the people of New York City to do everything that they can to cooperate, not to be frightened, to go about their lives as normal. Everything is safe right now in the city. And the people who are doing the relief effort needs all, need all the help they can get. And then, uh, Governor, thank you very, thank you, very Mayor. much for your assistance and your help and your support. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor, for your leadership through this crisis. This is uh, a vicious attack upon New York. It's an attack upon America. It's an attack upon the whole concept of freedom and our way of life. Uh, and we cannot let these at attacks succeed. Uh, first step has to be to make sure we do everything in our power to protect the people and to save the lives of those who, whose lives are still at risk and to help those who have been injured. And I want to commend the mayor and I want to thank my colleagues from Connecticut, New Jersey, Pennsylvania and the federal government have all offered and made ready uh, support to help us uh, deal with this ongoing crisis. Uh, the people of New York are uh, not only the, the freest and most diverse people in the world, we're also, I believe, the most capable of rising to meet the challenges of this type of attack. And right now, we want New Yorkers to uh, remain calm, to go about their business, to appreciate the fact that everything to provide for their safety is being done, to appreciate that everything that can be done to provide for the health and the needs of the people who are still at risk is being done, and that we will continue to work to make sure that we get through this uh, as strongly and quickly as possible. I want to thank the uh, federal administration. Secretary Thompson has been on the phone with me a number of times, as well as the president, uh, for what they are offering and prepared to do. Uh, and we're just uh, confident that, uh, uh, well, this is a horrible attack, and one that uh, is despicable and uh, really unthinkable in its magnitude. We will get through this, uh, and we will continue to have a great and free country, state, and society. Do we know the number of casualties at this point, sir? I don't, I don't think we, we really want to speculate about that. The number of casualties will be more than any, any of us can bear, ultimately. And I don't think we want to speculate on the number of casualties. The effort now has to be to save as many people as possible. And I don't, think, I don't think we will know the answer to that until sometime tomorrow or the next day. Were there large numbers of firefighters? There are a large number of firefighters and police officers who are uh, in harm's way. All right, it appears that for the moment we have lost our link to uh, Rudy Giuliani. You're looking at uh, live pictures of American fighter jets, U.S. fighter jets patrolling the skies over Manhattan now. This after the nation's air uh, traffic control system is in a total lockdown. No planes are flying over this great nation of ours right now. 
uh, thanks to the actions of some terrorists and hijackers who uh, commandeered the cockpits of, of four airplanes today and used them as flying bombs to take the lives of, of American uh, people. Let's uh, listen in while well, we are trying to reestablish our audio link to this news conference uh, involving the governor of New York there, George Pataki on the left, and Mayor Rudy Giuliani of New York City on the right, the uh, soon-to-be outgoing mayor. Today was supposed to be an election day, at least a primary runoff day in Manhattan for those who would succeed the mayor. Uh, that has been canceled. Major League Baseball has canceled all games for tonight across the country. Uh, games to be played this weekend by the NFL and other uh, sporting venues still up in the air. Uh, the uh, Professional Golf Association has canceled some of its upcoming meets. Uh, so this nation is going to be reeling for some time to come. Uh, but um, as the mayor said, uh, it's, it's a time for all of us to be together, to unite, and to try to fight this evil and this cowardice that has inflicted this kind of pain and, and damage on American citizens. All national monuments have been closed down in Washington, D.C. and elsewhere. The borders uh, between the United States and Canada, also the U.S. and Mexico, have been shut down. All employees at the uh, nuclear laboratories in New Mexico, they too have been sent home. It's a coordinated response plan led by the Department of Justice. It's been practiced before. It is in place. We go now to Tony Snow in Washington with new information. Tony. Thanks. Our Jim Angle is reporting that one of the reasons we don't know the whereabouts of the president is nobody has decided where he is going to end his day. There is a dispute going on at this moment between the Secret Service and the president's political advisors. The Secret Service wants the president to go to the NORAD facility out in the west that is, of course, as you know, in the mountains, completely secure, completely invul invulnerable to any kind of attack. On the other hand, political advisors saying that it would make the president look like, quote, a weenie, have urged that he return to Washington, get back to the White House, possibly address the, the nation from the White House, and, and try to conduct business from there. The Secret Service counters that it doesn't matter uh, that the president is back at the White House. They cannot absolutely guarantee security if a plane takes off from someplace other than the United States and heads toward our shores. We're going to have no choice but to blow it out of the air. So that's the debate that is going on. In addition, just to give you another sense of what has been going on at the Pentagon, uh, the death toll there may be much lower. In fact, there may not be a death toll. The casualty toll there may be much lower than originally feared for the simple reason that the part of the Pentagon that was struck today by an airliner was in fact undergoing renovation and as a consequence not all the offices there were occupied or James Rosen earlier had passed on a report interestingly enough that a couple of the offices in the that portion of the Pentagon uh, portions that were struck uh, were offices that deal with trying to deal with counterterrorism. One is called the Office of Homeland Defense. It's a newly created office that was slated to get a big budget increase, even though Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld has been talking about reducing expenditures. And also there was an office for uh, special operations and low intensity conflict. That is shorthand again for dealing with small wars with terrorists around the world. And that's the latest from Washington. Back to New York. Tony Snow in Washington. Tony, thank you. With more information coming in about the disaster response in New York City, we take you back to Email New York me. City Mayor Rudy Giuliani and New York Governor George Pataki sure. in the midst of their news conference. Let's listen. I don't think anything went through my mind other than uh, uh, making sure that we all remained calm and found an exit and just tried to figure out the most intelligent thing to do. Probably the same thing that went through the minds of uh, 10,000 other New Yorkers who uh, I could see on the streets and I really have to commend them. If you really want to know what New Yorkers are all about, you just watch the way in which they handle themselves. They didn't panic. They moved deliberately. They moved swiftly. But they didn't hurt each other. They helped each other. I and mean, these are just the most wonderful people in the world. Do we know anything thing? about the composition of that dust that flight this moment had? Is there any asbestos or any hazardous material in that dust? I, uh, I don't know. I don't know the answer. Mr. Mayor, there reports of a gas explosion related to this? Are you aware of that? There was a gas leak or possible explosion? We don't believe that. We, do, we, do, we, not, we don't believe that's the case. Mr. Mr. Mayor, can you tell us anything about the, where the planes come from, I, where uh, the, the aircraft came from? Bill Diamond reminds me that we've turned off the gas in the city in the city buildings, just to be certain. Can you tell us As a precaution. About where these aircraft came from? There was a report that may have been hijacked in uh, I don't. I don't. I, I, I think we should leave. I think we should leave that up to the federal government to uh, to rule yes we do have some information but I think we should leave that up to the federal government to release that in, that information our, our focus 
is on the relief efforts. And what about security for the Do you think there should be any retaliation on the part of the United States for what happened here in this country, both in New York, Washington, other places? First step right now, Marsha, is to make sure we do everything to help those people who need our uh, support, and their, whether they're injured or uh, still uh, trapped in buildings. Uh, the second thing is to make sure at the same time we're providing the maximum security against possible additional incidents. Uh, but clearly, this is an attack upon America. It's an attack upon our freedom and our way of life. And we must retaliate and go after those who perpetuated this heinous crime against the people of America. Mayor, this is Mayor, compared Mayor, to Pearl Harbor. Mayor, do you Mayor, think this Mayor, is going to be an act of war? Mayor, this has been compared well, I'll do both. I'll do this both. has been compared to Pearl Harbor. Do you consider this, this to is be a, this, is, this is a vicious, unprovoked, uh, horrible attack on innocent uh, men, women, and children. It's one of the most heinous acts, probably, certainly, in, in, in world history. And um, as the governor said, and, uh, and I said to the president, we fully and completely support him in any action that he has to take uh, in order to uh, make an example out of the people who are responsible for this. Is it an act of war in your mind? I don't know that I, I, don't know that I want to use those words. I think the president is the one that has to respond, and I think what he has to know is that all of us in New York support him and uh, support him completely in the efforts that he's going to have to make over the next couple of days, week, and to make a point that, uh, that people can't do this. You can't attack innocent men, women, and children. Uh, and ultimately, I'm totally confident that American democracy and the American rule of law will prevail. And the people of New York are going to help to demonstrate that over the next couple of days. How many people Anybody take Carol? responsibility for this? Any group take responsibility at this time? And what is the city doing to safeguard the citizens now that something like this has happened? Well, uh, first of all, I don't know of anyone that's taken responsibility for it at this time. And secondly, the, the uh, New York City Police Department is fully deployed, uh, not just in the rescue effort, but all throughout the city of New York, uh, offering as much protection and as much security as we're capable of for the citizens of the city. And uh, at this point, I believe that the people in New York City can demonstrate our resolve and our support for all the people that were viciously attacked today by going about their lives and showing everyone that vicious, cowardly terrorists can't stop us from being a free country and a place that uh, functions. And we'll do everything we can to make that point. Jennifer Steinauer, please. Just a housekeeper. Can you please, please tell, tell us what's going to happen to the New York primary? Uh, this morning, I, I issued an order suspending the primary across the state. There will be no primary today, and we'll reschedule it once we get through this. Jennifer, please. Can you please talk us through the municipal services right now? What's going on with the subway and the school courts? The subway, the, the, the schools, uh, the, the chancellor, uh, I, I, I commend the chancellor. He was on the phone a number of times with us. He coordinated very, very carefully what what would happen. He sorted it out, and he came up with a very good plan, which was essentially to keep the schools open, to keep the children in school so we didn't have a large number of children in, in the different boroughs that would be released from school. They're being, uh, they're being released, uh, not, I, I shouldn't say as normal, but basically on the normal schedule. Uh, if parents aren't there to pick up the young children, then the children will be taken to uh, a center and the parents will be notified to come and pick them up. The children who have metro cards who normally travel on the subway will be able to do that. The subways are functioning in four of the five boroughs. And uh, can we get an update, Joe, on how the subway's doing all, in Manhattan? All the lettered lines are working. And in Manhattan? Right. In Manhattan, lines, all the lettered lines All the lettered lines are working, including in Manhattan. And throughout the rest of the city, public transportation is, is normal. So the children should be able to return from school in the normal fashion. And if any children don't have parents to pick them up, then we'll hold them, let the parents know, and then the parents can come Mr. and pick Mr. Mayor, them. you mentioned you were on Barclay Street. What's the radius of damage that's been affected? Uh, how many other side streets around the world? I don't think we know yet. Uh, th that, the whole area of Lower Manhattan has been uh, very much affected by it. Uh, how, how, many, how, many how many police and fire are involved? How many police and fire are involved? How many NYPD off-duty officers that they come in? Or like all, all NYPD and FDNY uh, offices are on on duty now, and we're going to need all of them. And we're and again, thanks to the governor and uh, the way in which the state reacted, we will have uh, 15, 1600 National Guard to relieve them over over a period of time, so we can get some relief for them. Is anybody so, looking for someone that may have been in the World Trade Center or in and around that area? What should they do? How can they do it? We're going to give you numbers so that we can try to help coordinate that. Individual businesses have already done that. But we will, we will as soon as we can uh, find some time, 
from the uh, relief efforts, give you a number in which people can call and then we can direct them to the right place. Are the national reports looting or anything like that? Sir? Any lawlessness? There? there have been no reports of lawlessness, no reports of looting. Uh, as I said, we saw a lot of people that were, that were part of the uh, escape effort, and they seem to be conducting themselves in a very, very sensible way, a very deliberate way. They seem to be helping each other. So we, I don't think we have any reports like that at all. So the only National Guard we'll see will be in lower Manhattan, in the bombsite area. They won't be patrolling the rest of Manhattan. No, the purpose of it is to help with the, with the, with the relief effort. We're going we're gonna to need the help of the state surrounding areas with heavy-duty equipment. Uh, the, 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 the National Guard troops, some have arrived already, and we expect to have the, up to uh, close to 2,000 between the National Guard and the state police uh, uh, by later this evening. Mayor, Mr. bridges and tunnels will have to stay closed indefinitely? Bridges and, I think everything is closed for now. And then maybe in about an hour or two, we can give you an update on what the plan will be for tomorrow. We saw a lot of rightly injured people uh, walking out of the, uh, the area because obviously the emergency services were needed for the very seriously injured. Uh, people covered with dust, some people had difficulty breathing. Is there any uh, health advice that, to give to people who were caught in this thing who are not necessarily at risk of losing their life, but, but I think I, uh, dust? Well, obviously, if you feel, if you feel uh, uh, ill or you feel that uh, you've been affected by it, you should go to a, go to a hospital and get checked out. But if, if it's just discomfort that you feel, then uh, you can do you can do basically what we did, which to wash our faces off and, uh, and, and uh, get, get, test, test get rid of the clothes and them. get rid of the clothes and get to an area where you can breathe in fresh air. How many people were in the World Trade Center at the time of this attack? I, I mean, it was it was business had already started. It was so right before nine o'clock. I don't know. I don't know. Tens of thousands. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Approximately, so, someone just gave me a number of approximately 10,000, but that's, you know, that's a guess. How long will the city remain on a heightened state of alert? Until, until we're told not to, I mean, until the, the FBI and the police department and the federal government uh, tells us that we shouldn't. Right now, the city is on, should, should be on a state of alert. Now, that sh instead of frightening people, that should make people feel more confident that everything is being done to keep things secure. And again, let me emphasize that the reason for the National Guard, because I, I heard the question before, is to help with the relief effort, not because there's any fear of any other problems in the city right now. How is the Mr. Mayor, can you tell us about uh, the other public places, City Hall, one police plaza, when will Chief say you the return? I don't know yet. Uh, I don't know yet. Uh, ho hopefully soon, but I don't, I don't know the answer to that. And we also we, we heard reports that one police plaza was evacuated. Was that true? No. The command center is open. And it was never we have people in the command center right now. There have also been reports of, of large loss of life among the police and firemen who were sent there to rescue people. How accurate are those reports? I, I, th those, there is no question that we lost um, police officers and firefighters, and some that I know personally and all of us here know personally that we're very worried about. And we're not going to know the answer to that until much later. And I, maybe we should just close now and give you a briefing later. And I would just ask everyone, I talked to Cardinal Egan before, because he's at St. Vincent's Hospital. We, everybody should in their own way say, say a prayer and ask God for help and for assistance and, uh, and also ask God to give us the strength to overcome this, because I know we're, we're going to need strength to overcome it. And I want the people of New York to be an example to the rest of the country and the rest of the world that terrorism can't stop us. American democracy is much stronger than a vicious, cowardly terrorist, and we're going to overcome this. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank all right, so that the latest word from uh, the mayor of New York and the governor of New York, uh, George Pataki, and also Rudy Giuliani, the mayor, they're talking about uh, the latest in this horrific terror strike uh, in Manhattan, the World Trade Center obliterated by two hijacked airplanes. There you're looking at uh, the Pentagon where another hijacked airplane slammed into the outer south wall. The uh, Pentagon fire uh, coming at least under some amount of control now. At least you can see the building, although there is still fire burning on at least one of the inner rings of the Pentagon now. But that outer ring appears to, uh, they appear to have gotten the fire under control at least on the outer ring. Uh, the Pentagon is saying that the good news there is that uh, that part of the building was undergoing renovation recently and at this point had not been substantially reoccupied. So uh, the plane slammed into a part of the building that was largely not being used. Uh, you cannot say that, though, for the situation in New York 
where um, things were just getting underway at the World Trade Center, uh, the largest office building in Manhattan. The Twin Towers, 110 stories, have both fallen after two hijacked jetliners were flown into them, flying bombs that brought those buildings down. Our Jim Angle is in Washington and has a late reaction from there. Jim? Uh, hello, John. Well, what we have to report from here is about the president. Now, you know the president uh, left his uh, location in Florida, wound up uh, giving a, a short videotape speech from Louisiana. The problem here is that his political advisors would like him to return to Washington and take control in order to tamp down any sense of panic among the public. But the Secret Service does not want the president to return to Washington because they fear they cannot guarantee his safety. Now, they, the Secret Service would prefer the president to go to NORAD, which is in Colorado. It's a mountain that uh, has in. Uh, I, I'm, so, I'm sorry, the word just in is that the president has landed at an Air Force base in Nebraska. Uh, now, the, the, problem, the president is flying around the country while his advisors argue with the Secret Service over whether or not it's safe to return to Washington. Now, obviously, he will land at safe locations, Air Force bases, to refuel and to uh, figure out where things are. The president can do everything he needs to do from Air Force One, but the fact is his political advisors would like him to return to Washington because they want the president to be able to take charge in an obvious way to uh, eliminate any feelings of panic among the public and for political reasons so that he looks in charge. The Secret Service says, look, we cannot guarantee the president's safety if he were in the White House and an airplane, a hijacked airplane like those that hit the World Trade Center and hit the Pentagon, were to crash into the White House. We cannot guarantee the president's safety. They want him to go to NORAD headquarters, which, as I was beginning to explain a moment ago, is a mountaintop in which, uh, in the middle of which is built a secure area that is protected by metal doors several feet thick and was intended to be a place for officials to go and is housed uh, now, uh, now houses uh, a number of military installations. Uh, it was uh, intended uh, as a place for the president and officials to go in the case of nuclear war. It would clearly be safe from hijacked airplanes. That is where the Secret Service would like to take the president. His political advisors say, no, it is more important for the president to appear to be in charge, to make sure that the public is reassured that everything is okay, and that uh, they do whatever they can to keep any sort of panic from happening in the public. Now, meantime, the White House staff itself has been evacuated. They are dispersed around the region, I am told, and continuing to work by phone and email. Uh, and some reporters are being taken to an undisclosed location where they are to be given a briefing by an undisclosed official. So, as you can see, there are great concerns about going back to the White House, either for the president or for his staff. John? All right. Jim Angle reporting uh, from Washington. Thank you. Uh, yeah, that uh, NORAD facility in Colorado Springs is quite literally a mountain that has been hollowed out inside. Yes, perhaps the safest place for the president to go in a situation like this, but you can see why his political advisors, Linda, uh, want to make sure that the president is seen front and center, uh, not giving in to the terrorists who, after all, want to terrify America. We are continuing to keep an eye. This is, uh, this is the situation that you saw earlier at the Pentagon. A number of injuries there after a hijacked jetliner slammed into the outer wall. Uh, they have the fire, at least on the outer ring of the Pentagon, uh, fairly well under control now, but uh, fires continue to burn on the inner ring or rings of the Pentagon. It's not yet clear uh, how fully involved uh, those inner rings are at this point. Clarifying once again that the president is at Offutt Air Force Base in Nebraska right now. Uh, there are armed guards patrolling the White House. Outside the White House, as you know, the Capitol has been totally evacuated. It was earlier this morning that armed guards, actually the Capitol Police, actually physically went into the Capitol and grabbed leaders of Congress to remove them, to take them to a place of safety. So as it stands, government leaders are all in safe places as of this hour. It is 3 o'clock in the east, it is noon in the Pacific time zone, and America has been under attack this day, the 11th of September, 2001. A smoke cloud continues to billow from south of Manhattan, 
where you can see what happened shortly after 9 this morning. The second of two hijacked airplanes plowed into the side of the World Trade Center building you see there. The earlier tower already had been hit by another hijacked airplane. We understand uh, that uh, those planes from United and American Airlines. This is the collapse of the second tower that was hit. It was the first one to collapse, perhaps because the structural damage there was so much more severe and so much lower down. But the uh, first of the towers collapsed around 10 o'clock this morning. Not long after that, within 30 minutes or so, the second tower collapsed under its own weight. The structural damage too much for those steel columns to bear. Now, on a normal day, 50,000 people would be working in the World Trade Center. Perhaps as many as 10,000 more might be visiting or doing business there. We don't yet know how many of those people were able to escape before this conflagration rained down on them. Again, taking you just south of New York, this is the Pentagon. About 9.45 this morning, about uh, 30 minutes after the second attack in New York, a hijacked jetliner smashed into the south wall of the Pentagon, blowing a 100 to 150 foot hole into the side of the building and setting a fire that continues to burn at this hour. Now, all government buildings largely have been evacuated in Washington as a result, as a security precaution. The president, who had been scheduled to make an address in Florida, was hustled out of there, put aboard Air Force One, and flown to a secure site, Shreveport, Louisiana. He made a brief statement there, then got back in the air, and at last report was on the ground at an Air Force base in Nebraska. We are looking now live at these pictures from southern Manhattan where you should be on a normal day. You would be seeing the World Trade Center standing tall and proud above all of those buildings gathered there at the tip of Manhattan. Instead, all you see is that ugly brown cloud of soot, smoke, and dust. Uh, that is still emanating from the rubble left behind after this horrific day in America. In certain major cities, New York and Washington DC in particular, you may see fighter jets patrolling the skies. They've been scrambled to protect those who uh, who were not already hurt in these devastating accidents. Let us make clear what we have going on is the situation at the FAA. There is a national ground stop put in place. This means all flights are completely grounded. The soonest it might be lifted is sometime around noon tomorrow. For the meantime, the FAA is trying to track some 10 to 12 international flights uh, that were some bound for like Honolulu and other places. Those are still being tracked. There were some 40 to 50 domestic flights that were already in the air at the time of these terrorist attacks. They have all been safely grounded. They've all been accounted for. However, we do have four flights that have been lost. American Airlines Flight 77 bound from Dulles to Los Angeles. 77 passengers, six crew members lost. American Airlines Flight 11, Boston to Los Angeles, 81 passengers and 11 crew lost. United Airlines from Newark to San Francisco, Flight 93, 38 passengers and 7 crew lost. Also, United Airlines Flight 175 from Boston to Los Angeles, 56 passengers and 9 crew lost. We go now to Shepard Smith, uh, who has more information to bring in. Shepard? Linda, I'm outside the uh, Fox News studios here on the corner of 47th and 6th Avenues in, Manha in Midtown Manhattan. Uh, as all of this happened in the morning, uh, there is at least one bit of good news out of it all, and that is that it took so long for the second, uh, the second tower to be struck and then so long for them to fall. As a result, a lot of people were able to get out of the area and get away. Many of them headed toward Midtown Manhattan. The mayor of New York City and the governor announcing just a short time ago that much of transportation had returned to normal. But those of you who are familiar with Manhattan know that the, the lettered subway lines, he said, are working. The lettered lines and oftentimes uh, work their way up through the city and then out to the outer boroughs. The numbered lines are not working, we can presume, from what the mayor has just said. That would be the 1, 2, 3, and 9 line, which take you from World Trade Center all the way up the west side of Manhattan into the northern borough and on the east side of Manhattan the old IRT the four and five express trains and the six train which take literally millions of people up the east side of Manhattan all closed as well it's our understanding so a lot of people have stopped on the Fox News corner of the world to watch today trying to figure out where it takes them next a lot of these folks won't be able to make it home the bridge and tunnel crossings are still out 
And uh, suffice it to say, with 50,000 people who work in that building, another 10,000 who were probably doing business in there, uh, well, let's just put it this way. When the TWA flight fell out of the sky off Long Island shores, it seemed everyone in this city knew somebody who was involved in some way. And now we're talking about potentially 60,000 who may have been in that building. So many Manhattanites uh, have a lot of grieving to do in the days to come. Where, where will you go tonight? Have you, have you thought about how this is going to affect your personal life? I'm just going to take it a minute at a time. I'm really sure. Where were you when it happened? I was across the street, actually. Across the street from World Trade? Yes. Describe it for me. It's just pandemonium. It's scary. Did you stay there, and at, once the structure collapsed, were you still there? Uh, yes, I, I helped two people cross the street, and it just we were all escorted away once it happened. It's my understanding from talking to some of our correspondents and some of my friends, actually, who were down there at the time, that one of the amazing things to see was this group of people who lived and worked in other buildings who weren't affected, who were running out, taking off their clothes and making tourniquets and cleaning people off and calming people down, that it was really a remarkable sight. Did you, did you witness that sort of thing? Yeah, that's exactly what happened. People were helping everyone, and um, I escorted two women from one side of the road to the other uh, as the paramedics were arriving, and um, there was a lot, of, a lot of hurt people and a lot of panic. Having covered uh, so many tragedies in this country, uh, from the Oklahoma City bombing uh, to hurricanes and others, uh, there's a cycle that, that we as people go through. There's this initial shock, and there's hurt, and there's fear, and there's wonder, and there's trying to figure out who to blame and, and where to put your feelings. That all transitions when the pictures of, of people dancing in the streets overseas are shown on television, and people become angry. Did, have you thought about how difficult it may become to keep this place from getting really weird? You know what I mean? I know what you're saying, but I really haven't stopped to, to think about that aspect of it. Certainly, it's, it, it's a day that all of our lives have changed. Uh, to stand on the roof of this building and look south and not see those two towers there, realize how many people were in there at the time, and all that is going on at this minute, that building is still in flames. What microwave trucks and satellite trucks were up close enough to show you at the bottom were no longer accessible once the tower came tumbling down. There are no live pictures out of that area. But there's an enormous evacuation and rescue effort that's underway. People by the thousands not able to get to hospitals. Triage is set up at different locations. The United States military has sent in two aircraft carriers to launch and come into the port of New York and help with triage and rehabilitation of this area. The National Guard coming in. Right now, every single man and woman who is with the New York City Police Department and Fire Department is on duty. A man and a woman cannot work 24 hours a day indefinitely. So the federal government sending in reinforcements to help pick New York City up. Uh, inch by inch, uh, a long and difficult day and night ahead, Linda and John, and uh, the hope is that people will just remain calm and uh, help a neighbor. Shepard Smith, thanks very much. Uh, Shepard Smith outside our building here at the corner of 47th and 6th Avenue in Midtown Manhattan. Again, you're looking at pictures from earlier downtown uh, after this uh, horrific event unfolded. The World Trade Center there on fire. At that point, it was still standing. As we speak, it is not. Both towers collapsed in a cascade of smoke and dust and doubtless a, a tremendous loss of human life. Tony Snow has an update now for us from Washington. Tony? Well, John, one of the, we've trying to explain why the president chose to land at Offord Air Force Base in Nebraska. The simple reason is its head of what used to be called the Strategic Air Command is now called the United States Strategic Command. What is that? That's the command that involves all the military branches that deals with uh, such things as bombing runs, what we call strategic defense, which is long-reaching defense around the United States, which would involve everything from ballistic missiles to aircraft. So the president is there. They're having classified meetings at this hour, we presume, and we will find out later in the day whether he intends to return to Washington to go to the NORAD facility in Colorado, as Jim Angle has reported, or go to some other location. All of those things will be determined in the fullness of time. Also, Vice President Cheney is in the Operations Center at the White House at this hour, so that's where he is linking up. And now for more developments in our nation's capital, let's go to Brian Wilson, who's standing by near the Capitol. Well, Brian.
spirited away from this location and are being held in a secure bunker. They won't tell us exactly where that is, but they assure us that the House leadership and the Senate leadership are in contact with the President of the United States and that the government continues to operate. However, the Capitol grounds has been evacuated since early this morning uh, when the first attack occurred at the Pentagon. Uh, the Capitol has been evacuated. All activity now operates out of this location, 119 D Street Northeast, the Capitol Police building. Uh, we must also tell you there is one report that has been very disturbing. It's becoming very credible. There were reports from early this morning that we are getting from members of Congress and eyewitnesses that at one point this morning, a, a, a passenger jet came very, very close to the Capitol Dome. We have not been able to get any official confirmation of this, but I must tell you that there are many people who are reliable, uh, regular sources of information on Capitol Hill who are telling us they saw that happen. Other information on that is a bit sketchy, but the House and Senate it has been in recess. We're not sure exactly when they might go back to the Capitol building and continue the work of the people, but some members are saying they should do that. The other word we're getting out of here is from members of the Intelligence Committees, and they are angry. They say that the Intelligence Committee had no information about what happened, no advance warning, and they say that the Intelligence Community failed them in a major way. Tony? All right, we will jump in uh, as Tony is gathering more information. We have some sad news to report uh, as we are now starting to learn some of the identities of those who have been killed in the terrorist attacks today. It appears that a friend and a colleague here at Fox News has, killed, has been killed in one of the plane crashes. Barbara Olson, you know her as a very familiar face as a frequent commentator on the Fox News channel and other networks. She is also the wife of Ted Olson, the Bush administration's nominee for Solicitor General. He was also very much involved in the, uh, in the Bush effort working out the, uh, the contest over the vote in Florida in the presidential uh, election. It appears that Barbara Olson was on the plane that crashed into the Pentagon. She is believed dead. And we're very sad to report it. We're uh, giving you more information of, of exactly what has happened to the four total planes uh, that have gone down two American Airlines, two United Airlines, all bound for California, one from New Jersey, one from Virginia, but two from Boston. With that, we go to reporter Phil Rapley. He is in Boston with more information. Phil? Linda, Joe Lawless, who is the director of public safety here at Logan Airport, just spoke to the media for an extensive period of time a little bit ago, and he confirmed that two flights had left here this morning at 7.59, the American Airlines Flight 11, and at 8.14, the United Airlines Flight 175, appear to be the two jets that were driven into the World Trade Towers. They're both Boeing 767, so as you can imagine, the investigation going on here at Logan Airport is very intense. The entire airport has been locked down. It has been evacuated. A command center has been set up, and the investigation is being led by the FBI, along with the FAA. They are interviewing all the people involved in security here at Logan Airport. Now, the way it works here at Massport is that each of the airlines is responsible for its own security. So there are private contracting companies that are given that responsibility. Those employees are currently being investigated by law enforcement agencies as they try to find out how this could have happened, how both of these flights out of Logan this morning ended up involved in this terrible, terrible terrorist act. Now, also what's going on here at Logan is a crisis center, because more than 150 people have lost their lives in those two airplanes, so a crisis center has been set up for family members to come. There's a Red Cross there, there's clergy members there, there's also people from emergency medical services to try to offer any kind of support that they can at this time. Any passengers that were at Logan Airport have been taken uh, off of the grounds. They will be put up by Massport until this airport is reopened again. That will not happen until the Federal Aviation Authority gives it the okay. But meanwhile, Joseph Lawless says that the security here is as high a security as any airport in the country, that Logan Airport is as safe as any airport in the country. That may be more of a commentary about the status of security all over the nation than it is particularly at this place. As we said before, it's been, the, the investigation 
investigation is being led by the FBI at this point. Now, outside of the airport, the mayor of Boston has gone out and had a public press conference. He's urged the evacuation of the tallest towers in the city of Boston, the Prudential Tower, the Hancock Building. There's also been a press conference by the governor, the acting governor of Massachusetts. She says that it is uh, the National Guard here is at the at the beck and call of any assistance they can provide to people in New York. There also is going to be a primary election today for uh, the 9th Congressional District to replace the seat of the late Joseph Moakley. There was some talk early this morning by the Secretary of State that that election might be postponed, but now the governor and the attorney general have come out strongly and said that it must go on, that they cannot have terrorism dictate to a democracy. So that is the way that the officials here in Massachusetts are trying to deal with this crisis situation. But the, the city of Boston, as I'm sure cities all around the nation, are just shocked by what has happened here. And in fact, there was a rush hour at noontime as people were leaving to go home to their loved ones. So, Linda, that's, a, that's the report live at Logan Airport. I'm Bill Rapley, Fox News Channel. Bill, thank you very much. We have this just in from the Pentagon, a clarification of the military uh, mobilization. The Navy is sending two aircraft carriers to New York City uh, from based in Norfolk, Virginia. They are going there to uh, helpfully, obviously, to respond to any threats from the air or sea, but also to provide civilian assistance through hospital facilities and so on here in the New York City area, as it appears that hospitals in the New York area have been completely overwhelmed. Also, at the same time, the Navy is sending amphibious ships with Marines Marines on board to Washington, D.C. The carriers sent to New York City should arrive here by sometime tomorrow afternoon. Bill made the point in that report that all of these flights, curiously, were bound for Los Angeles. What might be the significance? But possibly only this. If you're trying to fly cross country and if you're trying to fly from east to west, you're going to be fighting the headwinds and going that distance, you're going to be taking the maximum amount of fuel on board possible. Uh, so if you are hoping to hijack a flying bomb, as these terrorists apparently were, you want as much fuel as possible to cause as much damage as possible when you bring these planes into their intended targets. And that may have been why all of these planes were bound for the West Coast. Forty-five people on board Flight 93 from Newark, New Jersey, United Airlines Flight 93. That plane went down apparently in a fairly wooded area about 80 miles southeast of Pittsburgh. Uh, those people have lost their lives, but it could have been much worse. Again, our uh, Brian Wilson reported credible reports of a plane passing very, very near the dome of the U.S. Capitol today. Whether or not it is that United Flight 93 from Newark to San Francisco is yet to be determined, but that is certainly a possibility. Somebody called from a cell phone who said he was a passenger on board that plane. He had locked himself in the restroom. He said it was not a hoax. They were being hijacked. But Flight 93 is no more. On any given day, the crash of that one aircraft uh, with 45 people on board would dominate the news. But in a day like this, when the twin towers of the World Trade Center uh, came under attack also from hijacked airplanes and when both of those towers came crumbling down and when another hijacked aircraft slams into the wall of the Pentagon uh, that plane crash south of Pittsburgh uh, is simply a footnote at this point and and that is an unbelievable comment to everything that's gone on today more international and in, uh, and national reaction Word now from NATO that they have evacuated everyone from the Brussels headquarters, but they are planning an, an emergency meeting there. No start time, but it should be very shortly. Also, in the United States here, FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, as part of this federal response plan that's been put in place uh, involving some 28 federal agencies, FEMA has uh, sent out eight urban search and rescue teams. They've acti activated them. They're going to New York City to search for any victims of the World Trade Center uh, accident, the terrorist attack there. Also, the head of FEMA, Joe Alba, who was at a meeting in Blue Sky, Montana, has been turned around. He's been sent back to Washington, and he is on his way as we speak. Once again, also some of the other government precautions. Of course, all the national monuments in Washington, D.C. have been shut down. People have been evacuated. They will not be allowed there, and there's no, no idea yet when they'll be allowed back at any time. However, at the Pentagon, 
which for the most part was evacuated when the plane crash occurred there. There is the National Military Command Center. That's in the basement of the Pentagon. Uh, personnel at last reporting were still there because they are heavily involved in coordinating a response. The National Security Agency, the CIA, they, those staff have been moved to an undisclosed location. This is all part of a national response, also part of the Pentagon being under what they call ThreatCon Delta. That is the highest threat alert uh, possible at the Department of Defense. Uh, they are taking precautions. They also have, as we have reported, they have the leaders of Congress in a secure location as they formulate a response. Uh, the president, as you know, is it off at Air Force Base in Nebraska. The vice president is safe. His wife is safe. Also, First Lady Laura Bush, they are safe, but they are be being held in locations that the Secret Service at this hour is not disclosing. 2,400 uh, people were killed in the attack on Pearl Harbor back in 1941, and Senator Chuck Hagel of Nebraska is saying, uh, quote, this is uh, the second Pearl Harbor. Uh, Newt Gingrich was on Fox News Channel earlier today saying uh, very much the same thing. Uh, there is a, a tremendous amount of pressure on our nation's military leaders to come up with some kind of a, a target for a military response. However, as you can understand, until you know who brought about this kind of devastation, it's really too early to be talking about a military response. You're looking at live pictures. This is still what's going on in downtown Manhattan. This is the view from north to south, looking toward the spot, looking actually toward the Statue of Liberty and the spot there on the right of your screen where the Twin Towers of the World Trade Center stood. And that until about 10 o'clock Eastern time this morning. About five hours ago, they crumbled. Uh, this after they became the targets of some madmen with a grunge against America. Let's go to Rick Leventhal, who uh, was there when all of this unfolded. Uh, Rick, it's good to see you still with us. Thanks, John. We did have some, some frightening moments out here earlier this morning. I was in my office uh, before 9 a.m. when I got the page uh, that, that a plane had hit the World Trade Center and, and I couldn't believe it. I, I, I thought there must have been some mistake and sure enough turned on the television and saw the video. Uh, jumped in a subway to come down here to lower Manhattan. The train stopped. Uh, I had to get out of Canal Street, which isn't too far away, but a lot of people uh, had to get out way, way before then, and, and they stopped the uh, train service. And, and, you know, as I was walking down here towards where the World Trade Center is located, the Twin Towers were still standing, and there were people on every single street corner uh, just staring up like, like they would be tourists. But these are, these are locals, these are residents who were standing there staring at these two towers that were on fire um, with holes in the sides of the buildings. It's one of the most recognizable uh, attractions in the world, the World Trade Center is. And, and it was a smoking hulk of wreckage uh, and again people just staring at it I can't believe that, that this is happening so we get closer and closer and uh, with my press ID I was able to get a, a block further west and basically one block to the north of the World Trade Center towers when police said you cannot go any further they stopped us there and this is before uh, the two two buildings collapsed and and it, it was chaotic there was there was uh, police and rescue personnel all over the place still trying to figure out what was going on that's when we uh, were, were hearing that there was a second plane that had hit the second tower uh, and everyone was trying to respond to that disaster and people were swarming towards the buildings to try and rescue the people who were in the buildings we then moved we our satellite truck parked a few a couple blocks uh, further south of us here on Church Street which basically runs right into the front of the World Trade Center buildings you can't see it now because of all the smoke that's still in the street from where the, the, the buildings are burning but we were there in the street virtually around the corner from the from the first tower when it collapsed and we saw hundreds of people running up the street at, right at us uh, many of them yelling screaming run the buildings collapsing I'm talking police officers in, included running for their lives because this building was coming down and what followed them was a gigantic cloud of smoke and debris perhaps a hundred feet high rolling up Church Street, rolling north, uh, as the building fell down and, and pushed uh, all of its debris up the, up the street. One, we took refuge inside the satellite truck, which was parked right there. We didn't know what was coming, what to expect. We jumped in the truck, waited for the smoke to clear. We got out, and some of the rescue personnel then began flooding back into this area. Um, shortly after that, uh, we heard that the second tower was coming down. And 
it was it was uh, very very uh, disturbing to say the least to hear that this second tower was was going to collapse right next to us. And again, a similar scene played out where where police officers and paramedics and emergency personnel and, and just women and children in the street who were ha who happened to be down here came running this way. Um, we too dropped our camera and ran north to get out of the way of the of the clouds of smoke and debris, which were actually rolling up the side streets as well. The, being pushed north and then up the side street. So each block that we passed, we saw yet more debris coming our way. Uh, a chaotic scene, to say the least. Since then, things have calmed down quite a bit. Uh, they've cleared the streets of, of almost all pedestrians, of all vehicle traffic, certainly, except for emergency vehicles, uh, police and fire trucks, and that sort of thing. We know that a triage has been set up right around the corner from us here. Uh, there was an ambulance staging area right next to us earlier today. Those ambulances were able to move down closer to the building. But we don't know if rescue personnel have been able to get into the rubble of the World Trade Center buildings themselves. Uh, I spoke with one uh, friend of mine who was right by the buildings um, who got close and, and saw blown out cars and, and rubble everywhere. Another guy who told me he tried to pull people out or tried to at least assist in, in looking for people who might be trapped said that one of the two towers are still some 20 stories standing. The other he described as a hole in the ground. Uh, right now, again, uh, things quite a bit calmer, very quiet, very serene out here almost uh, as, as people just basically wait to see what the next step will be. Again, uh, the mayor saying that, that rescue and recovery is the primary goal here at this point, but certainly a, a very frightening moment. And, and we'll push in now. Maybe we can see uh, there's a giant chunk of one of the two towers in the middle of Church Street in front of the building where the building used to be. I don't know if you can see it through the smoke and the haze, uh, but there is a large piece of the building in the middle of the street. Obviously, it's all been closed off, and again, the, the fire and rescue personnel on scene trying to, to get close to the building. But many of these firefighters believe they have lost coworkers in that debris because uh, after the uh, initial uh, strike, the two planes hitting the towers, uh, all these emergency personnel responding to the scene were helping to evacuate people who were still in the buildings and trying to clear people out of the area. And at that point, soon after that, is when the first tower collapsed. So there's a great fear that... Uh, there may have been many emergency workers trapped at the base of that building when it did collapse. And possibly the most disturbing aspect of all of this is videotape that I don't, I don't think we can show you. Um, but it's videotape of people who are on the very high floors of the World Trade Center. Uh, okay, apparently we can show it because we've, we've seen it. But uh, it's the most disturbing videotape I've certainly ever seen of people who were completely uh, without any hope. Uh, trapped in the building with flames behind them and above them and below them uh, leaping from high floors to their deaths below. Uh, no word from here on the numbers of deaths or injured, but certainly we've been hearing as many as 10,000 people, and it'll be a while before they can get to many of them. Back to you in the studio. Correspondent Rick Leventhal. Rick, thank you for the update. We have more information coming in uh, and to, as to the U.S. military response to this. Not only have some fairly innocuous places like any of the major national monuments been closed down, and, and even theme parks like the Disney World, Disneyland, they've been closed down too. But they also have closed the border between the United States and Canada, the border between the United States and Mexico. Uh, we are now just getting information that it is the USS John F. Kennedy and the USS George Washington that have now been deployed to New York Harbor. Uh, we also understand that there will be amphibious ships, guided missile cruisers, and guided missile destroyers that are all also being deployed. Where they will be sent, it's not clear right now. We are expecting a briefing from the Pentagon, actually not from inside the Pentagon, but from Pentagon officials. In a matter of a couple of minutes, that will clarify exactly what they're doing. But now, in addition to the Pentagon being at ThreatCon Delta, we understand that Navy installations all up and down the East Coast have also been put on ThreatCon Delta. That is the highest level of alert for the U.S. military. With the uh, aircraft carriers coming into New York to help with some of the hospital response, we take it now to correspondent Molly Falconer, who is at one of the hospitals in New York City that is completely overwhelmed. Molly? It's a hospital in chaos. It's been ground zero for the injured here all morning. We've been watching stretchers going in and out of the hospital. Some horrifying scenes. And right now we are seeing some of the emergency medical supplies. They're just overwhelmed here. So we've been seeing 18-wheeler trucks just being 
uh, brought in down the streets of Manhattan. As you can see, they're parked over across the street from St. Vincent's Hospital. That's a medical center that's handling over 100 of the dead, injured, and very badly burned here today. Um, basically, they ran out of supplies. They ran out of blood. They ran out of something called Silvadine, which treats burns. They have been raiding local pharmacies for more of that. They didn't have enough, so apparently now they've had more medical supplies uh, brought in. As you can see, the sirens are going up and down the street right here. They have closed off all of 7th Avenue. That's one of the main thoroughfares in Manhattan. It runs right by the hospital. It also runs all the way down to Wall Street. So they are using this as an emergency corridor to ferry up the wounded and uh, other casualties of this horrifying attack. We've been seeing uh, police officers coming up and down here. The mayor was speeding by here earlier today. Also, New York City yellow cabs have been commandeered to bring in doctors and nurses. We've been seeing them come up and down here going both ways on the street all this morning. Also, New York City buses are busing in loads of doctors and nurses. They are calling now, hospital personnel are calling for clothing because so many of the victims have had their clothing blown off them, that they need extra shirts, pants, shoes, anything you have. They're asking for it here at St. Vincent's. They're also asking for type O positive blood. Um, you can see behind me also uh, the crowds are just waiting here for words of their loved ones. There is a makeshift information booth. I don't know if you can see that sign. It's just hand lettered. Things are happening so fast down here that they're trying to get the information out as fast as they possibly can. They set up a makeshift almost card table and a yellow sign just stuck on the wall of the hospital to let people know where the dead and injured are today. We were supposed to have a briefing about this at about 3 o'clock. Apparently, hospital staff are just so overwhelmed that they had to push that back until 4 o'clock. And we'll bring you the latest word from that. As we know it, that briefing, again, has been pushed back until 4 o'clock. Hospital personnel just overwhelmed. They couldn't get it to us in time at 3 o'clock. But here's what we know. Over 100 injured, wounded, possibly dead, are inside St. Vincent's. They have commandeered everything from hospital corridors to the hospital gym to serve as makeshift ERs. The entire trauma staff is on alert. They have a disaster plan in action. I talked to a doctor or two who was in there this morning. They said that things are actually pretty calm, that people have been trained for this. And and they are doing exactly what they have been trained to do. They are dealing with uh, the casualties as best they can, and apparently that effort is going well. But the problem has been supplies. Those are being trucked in as we speak. We just saw one of uh, the pharmacies and food operations around here. They've been donating water. They've been donating sandwiches. That's just getting wheeled across the streets. As you can see, construction personnel are here to add more barriers to what is just sort of a, a siege mentality at the hospital. We've seen police lock this place down as if there is a bomb threat. There is not anything like that, but it is being treated as a scene of great trauma. Um, also, we should tell you that uh, Cardinal Egan was here and may still be here. He is the Archbishop of New York. He has been offering prayers for uh, all of the dead and wounded who have been streaming in and out of this hospital. He has been on scene along with other chaplains and spiritual leaders as well as uh, city leaders. We talked to the city controller, Alan Hevesy, earlier, who was talking about how there was hundreds of uh, firefighters and policemen who started running towards one of the towers right after one of the disasters and then they were not heard of again. He was down here to donate blood, but we are also hearing uh, about the fate of those firemen and police officers who ran towards one of the towers in a rescue effort. And as you can hear, uh, the dead and wounded keep coming in. There's more NYPD personnel streaming down this closed off 7th Avenue. We should also tell you that uh, this entire block area has been locked down. So if you have friends, relatives that you want to check in on. You have to call St. Vincent's Hospital. Listen in for the briefing later that they are saying now is at 4 o'clock or call Cornell Medical Center, NYU, or any of the other burn centers within Manhattan. There are over 50 that are handling the massive amounts of casualties. We'll bring you the latest as we have it. Back to you. All right, Molly Falconer, thanks very much. I uh, want to bring you the latest uh, bird's eye view of what's going on, at least in Manhattan, from our Dari Alexander, who is on the roof of our building here in Midtown. Dari? Hello. You know, I just have to stop for a second and tell you, I was downstairs earlier. I was, I was raised in New York. I am a New Yorker. I have to tell you that this is absolutely devastating, devastating to New Yorkers to see the two tallest buildings that you were tourist sites go down to be hit by planes, not by accident, and then to see them 
crumble. It is an absolutely devastating thing. New Yorkers think of themselves as being strong, invincible. To see the city taken under siege like this is just, it is absolutely too much to handle. I was downstairs earlier and I was talking to people who were standing all around Fox Central to get the absolute latest. And everybody is just in shock. Nobody can believe that this is actually happening. Let's just take a look once again, straight south at these two buildings. The smoke just billowing, smoke throughout the sky. The Twin Towers were a great place to get a view of New York City's skyline, to get a view of the harbor, the Statue of Liberty, something else that was in that building. I know we talked about banking and security and, and all uh, different businesses in that building. A famous restaurant, Windows on the World. I took a wine class there back in the early 90s. A fabulous, beautiful restaurant where people used to go to eat so they could see New York City. This was definitely a mainstay. People will not, it will take forever to get over it. I know a lot of people have been talking about the fact that some people knew some people who were in the building, others didn't know people in the building, but once again, this is something that everybody in New York feels, whether or not you knew them. Uh, the other thing that is just incredible is to think that there are warplanes flying all over the sky throughout New York City. And I mean, this is not an air show. This is serious. The city is under siege, and we are seeing warplanes fly across the skies every few minutes. All right, Dari, the Dari Alexander uh, there on the roof of our building. Thanks very much. Okay. Yes, uh, the entire uh, air system in our nation has been shut down. No airplanes anywhere being allowed to take off. Those that were in the air today when this uh, horrific uh, terrorist attack uh, went down, were ordered to land immediately. All right, we want to get more information as to who senior officials may think will be responsible, will be found responsible for this horrible act of terrorism. We want to go now on the phone to Lawrence Korb. He, is the, he was the, the Assistant Secretary of Defense under Ronald Reagan. He is currently at the uh, Council on Foreign Relations. Mr. Korb, thanks for being with us. Nice to be with you. We understand that at least three Palestinian groups, Hamas, the Islamic Jihad, the Democratic Front for the Libera Liberation of Palestine, they have all denied any responsibility for these terrorist acts. Some, uh, actually a number of terrorist experts have believed, have said that they believe it is the work of Osama bin Laden. What do you think? Well, he certainly has said he was going to, to do something, and so that would be logical to expect him to do it. We don't have any proof yet, but I imagine given the fact that people had to get on these planes and you know buy tickets and stuff, we'll be able to establish that uh, pretty clearly within a short amount of time. The, uh, I want to explain something to our viewers as they see this on the screen. Uh, Yasser Arafat, who is the uh, Palestinian leader, has come out also condemning uh, the attack and, and saying that he personally and his organization is shocked and horrified. So let us not misunderstand the pictures that we see on the screen. These are some Palestinians in parts of Israel celebrating the attack. We should make it clear that this is separate from the official response of Palestinian leader Yasser Arafat. Mr. Korb, a question about what we do in terms of a military response. People have already begin ta be begun talking about when we are likely to respond, how we are likely to respond. From your term as the Assistant Secretary of Defense, explain to us how something like this works in terms of a response at the Pentagon. Well, you have to find out uh, who did it and, and uh, you know, how you can get to them, but it's much easier said than done. Uh, we still haven't held anybody responsible for the blowing up of the USS Cole, the ship uh, in Aden. We haven't punished those who blew up the uh, Kobar Tower. That's the problem. It's not an individual nation. These are groups that cut across nations, and it's very, very hard to decide where to retaliate. They also hide themselves among, uh, among civilians. This is not a large army. This is a comparatively small groups of people, and that's going to be the frustrating thing. We're going to want to do something, and it's going to be very hard to do it. When I was in government, we never were able to successfully retaliate for those who blew up the Marine barracks in Beirut in 1983. We never really did uh, get, get those who did it. Right. I want to ask you about something that we saw today. Fairly quickly after we saw these attacks, we saw the leaders of the Taliban government of Af Afghanistan rushing essentially out to cameras to uh, condemn the attack. 
Even one of them said that uh, he believed it was impossible for Osama bin Laden to have any sort of involvement with it. One, if one were being skeptical, one might think that they were simply trying to save their own necks because uh, the United States government would be looking directly at Afghanistan for harboring bin Laden for so long. Well, there's no doubt about that. The problem you're going to face is that it's going to be hard to establish a definite link between these people and bin Laden. I mean, bin Laden, you know, doesn't hold group meetings, you know, in his basement once a week. I mean, these are people that are connected to him with several cutouts all over, all over the world. And as we saw in the recent trial here in New York City for those who blew up the uh, American uh, embassies in Africa back in 98, some of them said they were connected, others uh, did not, and we couldn't bring him uh, to trial. But there's no doubt that the Taliban government in Afghanistan doesn't want to be held responsible because if this were directed by them or they had any complicity, we would have every right to go and, and basically inflict terrible damage on them. And just to reiterate, the pictures that you're seeing on your screen today were taken in uh, Palestinian neighborhoods. Uh, Palestinians there celebrating this strike at America. Uh, as Linda said earlier, uh, Yasser Arafat, the Palestine, Palestine Liberation Authority leader, uh, condemned the attacks, but that is not preventing uh, this outpouring of great joy, if, if you want to call it that, among Palestinian people who doubtless see this as a strike against uh, the hated enemy, America. So these pictures taken earlier today in Palestinian areas. We take it back to Larry Korb, who's graciously joining us on the phone and helping us understand exactly how the U.S. military would formulate a response. Larry, even though Osama bin Laden wasn't necessarily considered a force during the Reagan administration, certainly you had procedures in place for how to coordinate a response to a terrorist attack. What were they? Well, obviously, but... There are things that you can do, but you have to know who to respond against, uh, right. and that's the, that's the problem. But I mean, in terms of sort of, you know, do you have the National Military Command Center in the basement of the Pentagon? Are they Well, yeah, leading? obviously. I mean, what, what you do then is you have the forces in the area. Most probably you would have ships with cruise missiles or planes with uh, cruise missiles that would attack. Remember, we did attack bin Laden after the blowing up of the embassies. Uh, in Africa in 1998. We did attack his camp. Right. Uh, so, yes, I mean, now we have forces all around the world. We have bombers that can fly from the United States uh, then attack any place in the world. So that's probably what we would uh, do if we found the people. But that's the problem you have in this new era, that these groups don't belong to any one nation, and there's, there's no real central headquarters that you can hit. Also, you generally, as I understand it, you, meaning the Pentagon, I mean leaders of the, at the Pentagon, have a list of response targets already prepared before an attack ever occurs against the United States. There's already a list that you, that you deploy uh, when given the go-ahead by the White House, correct? Well, that's right. I mean, you have a number. I mean, we have very good intelligence. Our technical intelligence is terrific. We know where these people are, and if we can make a link, yes, uh, then we can go ahead and, and go after them. The problem is making that link because... The United States uh, stands for decency in the world and, you know, innocent until you're proven guilty. So it, it's hard for us to do some of the things that I think the relatives of these poor folks in New York today are going to want us to do uh, because of uh, uh, the, the procedures that we follow. Right. Now, I, I want to take you back again to a statement of a, of a Taliban official, obviously the Taliban government being that in charge of Afghanistan. He said, quote, bin Laden does not have the facilities to orchestrate such a major assault within the United States. Uh, some other terrorism experts are saying that he may be the only person who has the kind of organization to orchestrate this kind of attack. Where do you stand? Yeah, yeah I think he's the only one. And re remember, we're not talking, I mean, he didn't buy missiles or anything like that. What they basically did was hijack four airplanes. Right. And he certainly has the wherewithal to, to, uh, to do that. Now, the ultimate go-ahead for any sort of strike, when it comes, if it comes, if it is determined fairly clearly that we have figured out who is responsible for this, how does the chain of command work? I mean, who gives the go-ahead, and uh, and where does it have to sort of does it does does originate from the top, from the commander in chief, the president? Right. Only the president can order military action, and then he sends the order to the secretary of defense, who transmits it to the uh, field commander. But only the president has that authority under under our constitution. Now, when you say he transmits it to the field commander, does he speak to Donald Rumsfeld? 
Yeah, the president. And then it goes to the Joint Chiefs, or how exactly does it go you know, down the? Normally, what the president would do is he would sign the order or direct the Secretary of Defense to execute whatever the, the contingency plan would be. The Secretary of Defense would sign the order, and the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff would transmit it through military uh, channels to the commander-in-chief of the Pacific, the commander-in-chief of our Atlantic forces, or whoever is the area commander, the commander-in-chief of the, the Central Command, for example, would have responsibility for that area. That was General Schwarzkopf's job during the Gulf War. He was the commander of the Central Command. Uh, Mr. Corbett, it's John Scott with just a general question. I mean, what are our options? We uh, lobbed some cruise missiles at uh, Osama bin Laden years ago. That didn't seem to have much of an effect. What kinds of operations just in broad strokes can we consider here? Well, I think you have to start, you have to stop these before these people get into the country, get onto your planes, or get these weapons, and it has to be done by the international community. As powerful as we are, the United States cannot do this by itself, because uh, without working with the rest of the world, we can't, we can't uh, get these people. And that's the, frustrating, that's the frustrating thing. You saw what happened when we sent the FBI to Aden to investigate what happened with the coal. We didn't get the cooperation. Unfortunately, uh, the world has to deal with this, and the United States needs to take the lead in getting the world to establish uh, guidelines about dealing with these terrorists. Because if they can do it here, they can do it, uh, they can do it any place. Let's say we can trace the, the perpetrators of this to some country somewhere in the world. Um, would you suggest to the president, if you were still advising him, would you suggest some kind of an armed invasion to go in and get whoever's responsible? Yeah, I would suggest going in and getting them and working through the local authorities if you could. I mean, because a lot of our friends around the world will be more than happy to help us. And so if the person is in country X, you work with the law enforcement and armed forces there to get them out and, 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 and bring them to, uh, to justice. Larry Korb, we thank you very much of the Council on Foreign Relations, former Assistant Secretary of Defense under the Reagan administration. Nice to be with you. Thank you once again. We take it now to correspondent Rick Leventhal. Perhaps the heroes of this day will be those who have been, for, been performing rescue on those who are trapped inside. Rick Leventhal is with one of those individuals right now. Rick? Countless rescues uh, performed by Bill Quick here with the New York City Fire Department. I know you were on vacation and this happens. Take right. us through what, what your call, your first call, and what you did after that. I drove in. I live in Long Beach. I drove in my car. I could see the smoke coming from the World Trade Center. I have a radio in my car. I can hear everything that's going on. Just mayhem. First plane hit. Second plane hit. The first time, uh, first time I got there, uh, I ran up to the building and a police officer said, I got people trapped down in the subway. So I went into the subway, went downstairs, got people up. People are bleeding, screaming, crying. And I just said, just come upstairs, go to your left, just keep going to your left. Just find the ambulance, go to your left, go to your left. Within two to three minutes after that, the first collapse happened of the, of the building. I don't know which building it was. It came down. I was outside. I ran behind a pillar. I, I got down. I got down on the floor. I co covered in my coat. I didn't have a mask at the time. I covered my coat. And I was... I was uh, trying to survive and it was total pitch black for like 10 to 15 minutes there was an EMT next to me he says he goes I think I'm burnt so I looked at him I said no you're not burnt you're just covered with soot hot soot and everything like that after that he just uh, he went on his way I went and got a mask I went back in the building and I went searching for more people and we found out that there was nobody else left down the subway and I'm here to update you all on the activities of the federal government in response to this morning's attacks on our country. As you heard from President Bush a short time ago, the federal government is acting to help local communities with search and rescue and emergency management operations, to take all appropriate precautions to protect our citizens, and to identify those responsible for these despicable attacks on the American people. While some federal buildings have been evacuated for security reasons and to protect our workers, your federal government continues to function effectively. We have a federal emergency response plan, and at President Bush's direction, we are implementing it. We began to implement it immediately after the first attack in New York this morning. We contacted American forces and embassies throughout the world 
and place them on high alert. The United States Secret Service immediately secured the President, the Vice President, and the Speaker of the House, and they are all safe. They have also secured members of the national security team, the President's cabinet, and senior staff. As you know, President Bush was in Sarasota, Florida when the first attack occurred this morning. Air Force One has now landed at Offutt Air Force Base in Omaha, Nebraska, and the President is in a secure location. He is in continuous communication with the Vice President and key members of his cabinet and national security team. Vice President Cheney and our national security advisor Condoleezza Rice are in a secure facility at the White House. I have just come from there. The Secretary of Transportation and other members of our White House senior staff are gathered at a command center there, and we are coordinating with other branches of our federal government. The Secretary of Defense remains at the Pentagon, and the Secretary of State is en route back to Washington from his trip to South America. President Bush is conducting a meeting of the National Security Council as we speak. They are meeting President Bush from his location and other members from different locations in Washington and other locations. As many of you have been reporting, the Federal Aviation Administration ordered all airports closed and all planes which were in the air were directed to land at the nearest airport. International flights were diverted to alternate locations outside of the United States. Transportation Secretary Mineta has directed the Federal Aviation Administration to suspend operations until at least noon tomorrow. So no airline flights will operate until at least then and until the FAA announces that operations will be resumed. Secretary Mineta has also issued orders controlling the movement of all vessels in United States navigable waters. The Federal Emergency Management Agency has activated eight urban search and rescue task forces in New York, and four of these highly trained teams are at work here in Washington at the Pentagon. Every federal agency has implemented continuity of operations plans to make sure the government continues to function effectively. While the markets closed today because of the situation in Manhattan, the United States financial system has continued to operate. Banks have been open all day. The Federal Reserve has operated regularly and continuously. The Department of Health and Human Services has mobilized medical personnel and supplies to provide help to local authorities who are working so diligently to respond and try to help the victims of these terrible attacks. President Bush has committed the full resources of our intelligence and law enforcement communities to identify and bring to swift justice those responsible for these despicable attacks. The Department of Justice is setting up a hotline for families who fear that their relatives may have been victims of one of these attacks, and we will be announcing that telephone number shortly. Our fellow citizens and our freedom came under attack today, and no one should doubt America's resolve. President Bush and all our country's leaders thank the many Americans who are helping with rescue and relief efforts. We ask our fellow Americans for your prayers for the victims, for their families, for the rescue workers, and for our country. Thank you all very much, and we will continue to update you as information is available and confirmed. So Karen Hughes apparently taking no questions. Karen Hughes, the senior advisor to the president, giving us uh, an update on the status of some of the most senior people in Washington. The president is uh, most recently landed at off, at, Air, off at Air Force Base in Nebraska. She said the president is at a secure location, but she did not necessarily suggest that he is on the base itself. One believes he probably still is. Uh, the vice president and the national security advisor, Condoleezza Rice, are in the White House in a secure location, probably that basement bunker there. It is not very often that this nation is brought to a standstill, but on today, it has happened. Many people here in New York City, in Washington, D.C., all over the country, staring at their televisions, 
unable to believe what they are seeing happening before them. You see it here on the corner of 48th Street and 6th Avenue in New York City outside the Fox News Channel headquarters. We have seen this site in many locations. People just simply in shock at what they're seeing. Who could have thought that an attack of this magnitude would happen in the United States of America? We have had officials planning for such an attack for some time, but many ordinary citizens thought that uh, something like this could never actually happen. So much security in place, so many times that defense officials and others have war-gamed this out and planned for an attack. But on this day, it has happened. No one able to figure out why, particularly September 11th, the year 2001. One person has mentioned that it was supposed to be tomorrow that, a, that an associate of Osama bin Laden was due to be sentenced in New York. And others have mentioned that they believe Osama bin Laden is perhaps the only terrorist with the kind of organization who could plan something this massive and this deadly. The United States government not confirming anything of the kind. The Afghan government, which has been accused of for some years of harboring Osama bin Laden, rushing to say that they have no knowledge of this and they condemn it. However, they have for years not given Osama bin Laden up to the United States despite repeated requests from Washington. Uh, they are also saying that they do not believe Osama bin Laden is capable of this. There may be many in Washington who believe otherwise at this hour. We're waiting for more briefings to come in. Uh, some planning at the Department of Defense. As you know, Secretary Rumsfeld is still there at this hour. Uh, others with officials in New York City, uh, we are going to bring those to you just as soon as they happen. They're going to be happening just sort of suddenly, and as they do, we're going to bring them to you here on the Fox News Channel. Uh, there are a, a great number of survivors you can see being carted away. This from um, the Manhattan, the lower Manhattan area, where our Rick Leventhal has been doing a, a great job of reporting all day. Uh, Rick is back with us now live and safe, we're happy to say. Uh, Rick, what's the latest there? Well, John, one of the things that you did not hear from firefighter Bill Quick, who I was just speaking with a short time ago, is I asked him um, after Karen Hughes' news conference began and we had to break away, I asked him uh, about the number of rescue workers on the ground when that building collapsed, when the first tower collapsed. And he said, in fact, there were hundreds of rescue workers at the base of the building tending to people who had been injured by falling debris from when the planes hit, tending to people who had been hurt uh, by rubble and, and were bleeding and, and dazed and wounded and, and, and disoriented, trying to help those people when that tower collapsed. And there is uh, a growing concern that hundreds, possibly hundreds, of emergency rescue workers, police officers, firefighters, maybe some very uh, high-ranking members of the city's fire department were killed uh, in the debris that fell from the first of the two towers. Uh, after that first tower collapsed, um, people did clear out of the area very quickly. Some people did go back before that second tower collapsed, so it's possible people were killed in that one as well. But certainly, uh, if there was a, a high death toll in terms of when the towers came down, it would have been after the first tower. We'll give you a look uh, south on Church Street where uh, the efforts continue to try and put out the fires that still burn in what's left of the Twin Towers. We're told that one of the two buildings there may be as much as, as many as 10 to 20 stories left standing. The other one, though, is a crater. It's virtually a hole in the ground. You might even be able to see, Adam, can you see the, the, the piece of the building? There's a piece of the building in the middle of Church Street. You can't see it right now because of the smoke and the haze. Uh, but we're going to, uh, apparently, Rudy Giuliani is now speaking to the mayor of New York. Let's, uh, let's head back to the studio and to the mayor's press conference. Do we have the mayor? We're attempting, Rick, to get the audio uh, connections from the mayor. They handled themselves with bravery. They handled themselves with dignity. They handled themselves in a way that reduced the loss of life. We didn't have panic. We didn't have people running and hurting other people. The people of New York City really distinguished themselves. And I just want to say this once again. New York City is a lot stronger than this. And we're going to overcome it. And the people of New York City are going to give an example of how you stand up to terrorism. You just don't be afraid, that's all. Thank you. Thank you. Five, six, seven, eight, nine. Rudy Giuliani, the mayor of New York there, um, making uh, uh, another statement about the, the response of this city. Linda, I'd just like to say I've been in this uh, chair now for about, well, it was just about exactly seven hours ago that uh, the first of these events started unfolding. What a calamitous day for America. And yet, uh, you know that somewhere in the world, uh, somebody is watching these pictures with great glee. 
watching the pictures of the hijacked airliner, the second one of the day, smashing into and ultimately demolishing the twin towers of the World Trade Center, uh, the symbol of capitalism to many people around the world. Uh, they want us to be scared. They want us to be afraid. As we heard uh, uh, President Bush's senior advisor say not long ago that our fellow citizens and our freedom came under attack today. Uh, they want us to somehow lose some of that freedom, and let's just hope and pray uh, that that doesn't happen. The United States most definitely will not allow it to happen. However, there will be a coordinated response, you can be sure. We are beginning to get more information about those who were lost uh, today. The numbers in the end may be in the tens of thousands, but we know for sure the number of people who were lost on the four commercial airliners that went down today. There were two American Airlines planes, two United Airlines planes. In honor of those souls departed, let us remind you of who uh, and how many were on those planes. American Airlines Flight 77, bound from Dulles, Virginia to Los Angeles, 77 passengers and six crew. American Airlines Flight 11, Boston to Los Angeles, 81 passengers and 11 crew. United Airlines from Newark, New Jersey to San Francisco, Flight 93, 38 passengers and 7 crew. Also, United Airlines Flight 175, bound from Boston to Los Angeles, 56 passengers and 9 crew. As we mentioned before, as we're beginning to learn more details about those who may have been on those planes, we here at Fox News have also learned that a friend and a colleague was lost on that airplane that crashed into the Pentagon. Her name is Barbara Olson, and you may have seen her many times on this network and others. Her husband is Ted Olson, also a famous face. He was uh, nominated by the Bush administration to be Solicitor General, was heavily involved in the Bush administration effort uh, during the contesting of the Florida vote during the presidential election. Barbara Olson made a phone call from that flight, apparently, before it crashed into the Pentagon. We have learned that she is presumed dead, and we say that with great sorrow. And we will learn, I'm sure, in the coming hours, many more people who we know, who you know, around America, who were involved in these accidents and who may have been lost. Uh, there we see her picture. We're sorry to say goodbye to a friend and a colleague. We have been given some preliminary estimates about how many may have died in the World Trade Center attacks. Uh, according to Congressman Jim Moran, who was part of a briefing much earlier today, his first estimate uh, that he was given was perhaps 10,000 people. Now, as we learn from World Trade Center officials, the, uh, the buildings, the two skyscrapers, were at full capacity this morning when the two planes slammed into the towers. Full capacity means at least 50,000 people. It will take some time, many hours, if not days, before we can determine exactly how many people were lost in that attack. There is a coordinated response underway. It's uh, called a federal response plan. 28 federal agencies involved. This is a plan that has been around for some years. Uh, it was updated last year after the Oklahoma City bombing, many years after the Oklahoma City bombing. And now, unfortunately, it has been put into place. The Justice Department leads it, basically. The FBI leads the investigation. But as you can imagine, all federal agencies all, uh, and all personnel involved with the federal agencies have all been called in for help. Federal Emergency Response Agency, FEMA, actively involved. They have now act activated uh, eight urban search and response teams in New York City to search through the rubble that you have seen of the collapse of these towers on your screen. Uh, they're being activated and dispatched to, uh, to search through the rubble for any survivors. The hospitals in New York City have been uh, completely overwhelmed by the wounded. In fact, some of the wounded have now been evacuated across the river to New Jersey. Uh, also, the hospitals in Connecticut are on complete standby. The Pentagon is at the highest level of alert. It's something called uh, ThreatCon Delta. Usually it's at ThreatCon Normal, but today it was escalated to ThreatCon Delta. As the Secretary of Defense continues to operate from that building, trying to coordinate what, if any, uh, military response will be necessary. We do know a little more clarification from the Pentagon. Originally we had been told that two aircraft carriers had been dispatched from Norfolk to come to the New York Harbor. That apparently has been clarified. Those aircraft carriers have been sent out of their base uh, for their own protection, but they are not being sent to the New York Harbor. Other ships uh, are being sent to the New York Harbor. They have not been identified as of yet, but uh, preliminarily we have been told that they are being sent here to help not only with protection, but also to help with the massive rescue response to the wounded. We bring in with me my colleague, John Gibson, who's gonna be joining us for the next several hours in our coverage, John. 
Uh, amazing job uh, you and John Scott have done. This is a national disaster and a national tragedy, and uh, I think the country now moved forward on two levels immediately, or three, uh, the huge rescue effort that's going to go on down at the World Trade Center. As many as 10,000, an estimate. 50,000 people were in the building at the time those planes hit it. Uh, no one knows exactly how many people may have survived the collapse of those buildings or, or lie there dead, as well as the hundreds of fire workers and police workers who were, who were at the base of the building. Our own Dan Cohen was there as uh, two of them. Uh, first, the, the first one collapsed and Dan was helping triage people and moved to the second one and it collapsed on top of them. And as uh, Linda mentioned just a while ago, perhaps the first face on this national tragedy is uh, Barbara Olson, uh, 46 years old, who's appeared on this network very many, many times in various political discussions. Uh, the tragedy of Barbara Olson's death is going to be repeated over and over and over in the next few days as more faces uh, as we look at this plane uh, hitting the trade tower this morning. Uh, as more faces are placed uh, with the statistics. In addition, there is a question, as Linda was talking uh, with Larry Korb earlier, how did this happen and who do we blame? Uh, certainly one of the areas that uh, somebody's got to look at is uh, who's flying these planes? Uh, does anybody really think an American pilot was at the yoke flying them into the trade towers? Or was someone trained to fly heavy jets and fly them into the World Trade Center? And if they were trained, who trained them? In what countries? And are those countries to blame for training people to fly these planes to then carry out these attacks on the United States? S certainly there are many countries in the Middle East who don't like us, who fly heavy jets, who have to train people. Iran does. Syria does. Iraq does. All of them are potential candidates for who trained these pilots. We're going now to a NATO press conference uh, on the effects of this attack. Being, uh, this would probably be going on at The Hague? Uh, actually, this is in Brussels. They have actually uh, evacuated the building there, but the leaders are standing by. They just finished a, mission, uh, a meeting. Let's listen. Uh, uh, defense and Security Organization, which remains alert, and I can assure you remains resolute and determined as well. Um, Laurent Zekini, uh, Le Monde. Uh, Lord Robertson, I'd like to, to repeat um, one of the questions. The fact that uh, the Pentagon, the headquarters of the uh, American defense, has been hit, do you consider it as a, a sort of an act of war or not? Well, I'm not in a position to make decisions about what is an act of war. An act of unspeakable violence took place today. Uh, and this is a moment where people are reflecting on the nature of that tragedy and standing firm against that kind of violence and with the people who have suffered from it. Uh, what happens thereafter about it will be a matter for alliance consultation, but I don't think that it would be right or proper to jump to any judgments this evening. I'll take two more questions. Gentlemen at the back, please. Uh, the Secretary General, do you consider Article 5 to be in application uh, all, all, um, also for terrorist attack or only for state attack? Uh, well, that is a matter that was considered and del deliberated upon at the Washington summit two years ago, and you will be able to get from your files what uh, the communique of that summit meeting said on this specific issue, but I'm not willing to go into any of these uh, areas this evening. This will be the last question, please. Uh, Angus Roxburgh, BBC News. Um, do you have any initial thoughts about who might lie behind this, these acts of terrorism? The Americans don't know, we don't know. Um, but the clear message to whoever it was is that they will have left a trail behind them. Uh, and they can be assured uh, that they will be found. Uh, and uh, the international community, the whole international community will be united. Uh, in condemning what they've done uh, and making sure that they're not in a position to do it again. Thank you very Thank much. You it will be all. The message from NATO, obviously, that they are all standing uh, strong and together with the United States uh, trying to figure out exactly what has happened. It's very early on, obviously. They can't, they can't coordinate any sort of NATO response until they figure out 
with some fair degree of clarity who is responsible for this, but nevertheless, uh, NATO there saying it stands with the United States, even as they have evacuated their own personnel from the uh, NATO headquarters in Brussels. We have with us on the phone former Secretary of State Lawrence Eagleberger. He served in the Bush administration. He's actually uh, with us from Charlotte, uh, North Carolina. Charlottesville, Virginia. I, I'm sorry about that. Mr. Eagleberger, we thank you very much for being with us. Your, uh, your first thoughts as to who might be capable of coordinating this massive terrorist attack? Well, you have to start out with the normal uh, conventional wisdom, which is Osama bin Laden. Uh, the point being, I think it's now very clear that this took tremendous planning. It was in its own way brilliantly done. The timing was perfect. They did everything very, very professionally. It took money, it took training, it took time, and you have to ask yourself who is capable of that, and you start out with Osama bin Laden. I, you know, we may never know for sure. What we do know is that terrorism in its starkest form has attacked this country now, and I do think it is as close to an act of war as you can get in this sort of a situation. Uh, Mr. Eagleberger, if you would stand by for just one moment. We have just sure. gotten the first footage of that commercial airline crash in uh, Pennsylvania. It was just about 80 miles from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. The first reports were that this is the plane that was part of the coordinated attack. This plane was supposed to be commandeered toward Camp David. Camp David, of course, being the retreat of the President of the United States. It never made it there. It crashed in Pennsylvania, 80 miles from Pittsburgh. However, there was a significant loss of life there. Back to you, Mr. Eagleberger. We thank yep. you once again for being with us. Who is going in for the briefing? Of course, Mrs. Clinton, as the former First Lady, does in fact have her own Secret Service contingent. She doesn't normally have that detail with her on, at the Capitol, uh, or at least it is very, very uh, nondescript and discreet uh, because she wants to appear like the rest of her colleagues to be a little more than just an average U.S. senator, if there can be such a thing. Uh, but as you see, more and more lawmakers streaming in for this very important briefing, perhaps for them the first definitive information as to exactly what's going on. And yet earlier when some of them uh, came out to talk to us, it was very clear that the information that they're getting is very spotty. Obviously the investigation is still only in its first few hours. And the most critical information, sure to go to the president and the administration, lawmakers waiting for any insight, any information. And John, as to your question about talk of retribution, at this point there is across the board uh, decrying of all of this, but as to retribution, lawmakers particularly careful not to make any overt suggestions and lay blame. There are obviously a lot of suspicions that this may be something uh, from uh, Islamic fundamentalists, someone from the Arab world, or the types of terrorists who have uh, tormented the U.S., whether it was in Yemen when the USS Cole was bombed or elsewhere, uh, but they're also cautious to say it's still very early and that type of speculation uh, could prove unwarranted, notwithstanding all the signals that they are very suspicious that that's in fact where the blame may lie. Carl Cameron, live on Capitol Hill. Carl, thank you very much. The first plane hit the first World Trade Center tower shortly before 9 a.m. More than seven hours later, there are still flames. We have correspondent David Lee Miller on the scene. David? Hi, Linda. That's right. At this hour, the fire still continues to burn. You can take a look behind me. You can see a great deal of black smoke, a huge plume of black smoke, black smoke that you can see throughout all of lower Manhattan. We are told by one firefighter source that a building identified as uh, Trade Center number 7 is in danger of collapse. We are told that engineers have gotten as close as they can to the building and that this building is on fire and that there is a chance that this building could give, give way. And we are told that if it does, they expect that it would collapse in a southerly direction. The uh, World Trade Center towers fell uh, northerly. This would fall in the opposite direction. Uh, right now, they are doing their best to try and contain the situation. Emergency vehicles are on the scene. The streets to lower Manhattan are effectively sealed off to all pedestrian traffic. The only thing allowed down here are a few uh, media vehicles and, of course, firefighters, police, and EMS. Now, Mayor Giuliani held a news conference a short time ago. He said that as many as 200 people have been critically hurt. In total, right now, 600 taken to area hospitals. The big question, though, at this hour, how many people are actually entombed, are trapped 
in the rubble. Now, we believe that a great many of those who are trapped are some of the emergency workers themselves. I was here shortly after 9 o'clock this morning. Police and fire were racing to the scene, and that, of course, soon thereafter is when the buildings themselves began to give way. I was a few blocks away. One of the buildings collapsed. I ran, as did uh, a number of the police and fire uh, who were in the nearby streets, but a great many officers, New York's finest and New York's bravest, were trapped inside. A number of people uh, fled uh, thinking that they were not going to get out of here alive. Now, if you take a look at the streets in Lower Manhattan, they are littered now with women's shoes, and that's because so many people here fled the scene, women fled the scene, they discarded their high heels, and they just wanted out of here as fast as they could. Now, um, we are told that the scene at the St. Vincent's Hospital has received most of the injured. If you take a look at the hospital itself, outside, there are dozens and dozens of gurneys. Most of them are still empty. There are nurses, doctors. I even saw a priest, and they are bracing bracing for a very busy night. And one, one interesting aside to all this, when I was here this morning, there was a great deal of disbelief about what it had happened. It slowly began to turn to shock. A lot of people were crying, and now with each passing minute, uh, more and more people are outraged, and they are demanding some type of retribution. Back to you. David, just hang on a second. We're going to go now to Neil Cavuto uh, downstairs uh, for an update on the uh, uh, New York markets, and I guess Neil, maybe the world markets uh, reacting to, to all of this. You're right, John. Uh, they, uh, no surprise, uh, never opened today. And they're not opening tomorrow. The New York Stock Exchange, the NASDAQ, the American Stock Exchange. I might uh, throw in the New York Mercantile Exchange, which was housed in that uh, left tower there, the one that was on smoke, not the one that was hit by that plane, uh, Tower One, will be closed tomorrow as well. This is the first time in stock market history they have been closed this long in the event of a national disaster. But the New York Stock Exchange saying it will not open for business. This is as much technical as anything else. The lines that allow for something called cross-trading between the various exchanges in the future markets, this all seems arcane, uh, are down because the World Trade Center is no more. So there is no effective way now to trade uh, stocks or futures. Uh, you can't trade in the metals. You can't trade in the oils. And the better part of valor for a lot of these guys earlier today, those who had connections to foreign markets, was to bid up the price of oil and gold, John. And in fact, those were rocketing today as really one of the few places or a couple of the few places to put their cash. But the financial markets, as much really represent representative of, of symbolically what's going on here will not be open tomorrow either so whoever committed this heinous act today if the the gist was not only to cause tremendous physical damage and obviously a, a tremendous loss of life they have also cut the financial uh, capital of the world to the core it will not be open for business indications are now we're told from new york stock exchange officials that they will try for thursday morning at the normal time but keep in mind this will affect global trading because everything pretty much hinges on the big boy in town new york again the major exchanges closed today they will be closed again tomorrow neil the 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 exchanges the major corporations that are in that building must know something about the survival of their own people is any word leaking out from those companies that had hundreds if not thousands in that building, what, what they think or know about the fate of their employees? Well, you know, it's a good question, John. I wish I could tell you because I have a lot of close friends, many I've known for the past 20 years in my reporter days, having frequently gone to those two towers um, who I cannot contact, and I've tried the better part of the day to get in touch with them. We've gotten no word from Morgan Stanley, Dean Witter. We've gotten no word from a lot of folks I know at the New York Mercantile Exchange who trade in, in the, the oils and the futures markets that set the price of, of even the gasoline that we get at the pumps many times. Uh, no word from our folks at uh, Cantor Fitzgerald, the big financial services firm, or Keith Barrett Woods, the big financial services concern, or Allstate Insurance. No indication as yet um, how far or extensive the damage was or how uh, people we've routinely had on this network and on my show over the past five years of this network and many years before that uh, are even alive. So uh, when these huge institutions, which play a vital role in the world capital markets, are not being heard from, you will always fear for the worst. You hope for the best, but you fear for the worst. And I got to tell you, John, I have many, many dear and close friends and associates and contacts 
none of whom I've heard from today. You know, and uh, we're going to hear a lot more about this in the next uh, couple of days, and we're hoping for the best for everybody. Uh, Linda. Also this, there is movement from the President of the United States. He apparently has wrapped up a National Security Council meeting that he was conducting via phone at Offutt Air Force Base. There you see Air Force One in the air. He is headed back to the White House. We learned from Karen Hughes, senior advisor to the President, that Vice President Cheney and National Security Advisor Condoleezza Rice were already at a secure facility inside the White House, as are other senior White House staffers. Apparently, it has been decided that the President will go back there, join them as they continue to formulate a response to this. Another key player here, the Secretary of Defense, uh, Donald Rumsfeld, he is not at the White House. He is at the Pentagon, even though there was a plane crash earlier there today. His office specifically not affected, so he remains there. But again, after finishing up a National Security Council meeting via a secure phone at Offutt Air Force Base in Omaha, Nebraska, the president now is en route back to Washington, D.C., presumably headed toward the White House to that secure facility where Vice President Cheney and National Security Advisor Condoleezza Rice are already waiting. Linda, uh, joining us now, uh, Senator James Inhofe of Oklahoma, who is on the Senate Armed Services Committee. Senator, thanks very much for joining us. Uh, we, we evidently didn't know this was coming. Does that mean we won't be able to find out who did it? Well, for one thing, I, I hope there's a wake-up call here, John, because, uh, you know, ever since the, in the last 10 years of the decimation of our military, along with that is the intelligence budget. So we don't have the intelligence that we need. And I think that that's going to be a response to th this tragedy, is that we're going to start rebuilding both our defense system and our intelligence. You've got to keep in mind that anyone who would fly an airplane into the World Trade Center would also deploy a missile uh, at the United States. We're dealing with that kind of a mentality. So I hope this serves as a wake-up call to start a massive rebuilding of our defense system and our intelligence system. Senator, it is, uh, it is not... Uh, it, earlier we heard from the uh, chief representative of the Palestinian Authority in the United States who said they didn't have anything to do with it. Maybe you could say, well, gee, it would be kind of tough for the Palestinians to learn how to fly a 757. But it is, uh, it's pretty easy to identify what countries could train people to fly a 757, to fly it into the World Trade Center after it had been hijacked. Uh, th that list uh, comes to mind to nearly anybody. Is that who we're going to be looking at? Well, we don't really know. You, 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 people talk about bin Laden. They talk about the obvious ones out there. One of the things that I would recall to your attention is the footage that you had on Fox News of the Palestinians celebrating uh, the death of these thousands of Americans just a few minutes ago. And uh, as to who has the capability, you know, you can hire that, John. You, you can, uh, there are people out there on the market uh, who can do that. This was well thought out. And it's one that was the professionals uh, executed. Well, so what happens? I mean, do we sit here and say, okay, we've got to investigate this and figure out who it is, and then we'll send FBI agents around the world and gather up the suspects and have a two-year trial and, like Ramsey Youssef, put somebody in jail? Or do we launch our military might? No, we launch immediately, but you don't know who. People say, is this war? Yeah, it's an active war, but you can't declare a war until you know who the adversary is. We don't know who the adversary is right now. The first thing that has to be done is learn who the adversary is. It's either going to be state-sponsored or not state-sponsored. At least this would be my opinion. And your response would be different in, in each way. So, uh, yes, we need to act immediately. I think you're going to see that we have a president who's on his way back to Washington as we speak. He is going to be very decisive as soon as we launch everything we can to determine who it, who it is and who's responsible. All right, uh, Senator James uh, Inhofe of Oklahoma on the Senate Armed Services Committee, thanks very much for joining us. Uh, right now we're going to Professor... Professor... Professor Barry Levin, he's of the University of California. He is a renowned terrorism expert as they, of course, the main job here at the White House or at the White House right now is to figure out who might be responsible for this massive act of terrorism. Professor, thanks for being with us. You have obviously uh, done a lot of study on uh, any organization that, that could be responsible, that could have the kind of, or that could have the kind of uh, network that would carry out something like this. Who do you think is prime suspect number one? Well, there are a handful of organizations. I think, obviously, Osama bin Laden is, is at the top of the list. Uh, let me just say that we have to look at a couple of things. We have to look at who has a motive. There are tons of people throughout the world who do not like the United States. Uh, so there, there are a bunch of those kind. But who would have the opportunity and the means? That narrows it up a bunch. And I think one of the things that we've been seeing over the last 
couple of decades has been a decline in state-sponsored terrorism and an increase in these uh, s smaller autonomous but very well funded and expert organizations like bin Laden. That being said, I'd like to point out that we've been having um, an air attack going on against Iraq for some time. It hasn't gotten a lot of coverage, but we've been doing uh, overflights uh, practically daily now. So certainly that regime would also possibly have a motive, but right now it's pure speculation. Uh, the thing here that I think uh, points to uh, a Middle Eastern connection is the fact that we've seen similar activity like this in the past. Let me give you an example. About a decade ago, there was a plan to blow up nine American airliners over the Pacific. That was thwarted by our law, law enforcement and intelligence community. In addition, recently, we've been starting to see an uptick in the anti-American rhetoric, and importantly, too, and this was something that we've noticed throughout those of us who monitor this stuff, that American-related targets were hit in Israel. The Sparrow restaurant was uh, a heavily trafficked tourist destination in a part of Jerusalem that had Americans there. And All right. I Professor, I mean, I, I understand that, but you have to really narrow it down to which organization. I mean, we're, we're putting pieces together here. Whoever planned this has to have people, number one, who can probably fly planes, but people who are so skilled that they can, they can hijack not one, but four commercial airliners at once. They can get through extensive airport security in Boston, at Dulles Airport in Virginia, at Newark Airport in, in uh, New Jersey. What kind of organization is that well coordinated that can do this? Well, I, I think we, we have organizations, but the fact of the matter is they have offshoots. So you can have someone who might throw somebody a million dollars and say, learn what you have to learn to attack the great Satan and try and keep enough distance so that it's hard to find out who it is. Well, so, well, let me take you back to this plan when you were talking about it a decade ago, and I'm, I, I remember what you're talking about. There was this plan to co coordinated to blow up nine American airliners over the Pacific. It was thwarted. Who was behind it? Uh, fundamentalists from the Middle East okay. were, 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 be, were behind that. Um, you know, it, it, additionally, look, th there are a lot of people who don't like the United States, and I think right now, certainly bin Laden's at the top of the list for someone who has this kind of visceral hatred and the kind of money and planning and professionalism behind him. We go to Colonel Bob McGinnis, who is with us in Washington, D.C., retired military officer, to explain a little bit more of what the military does here. Colonel, thanks for being with us. Thank you for having me, Linda. Let's go through some of the, uh, of the plans that have been put in place by the U.S. military. Number one, they have deployed a number of Navy ships to uh, deal with search and rescue, to deal with uh, triage. What exactly happens there? Well, Linda, you've seen a host of things happening around the country that normally you don't see. You don't see F-14s, uh, you know, flying around Washington like you did today. You don't see uh, DEFCON 4, where all the military installations across this country and 140 nations around the world have been shut in, and they're looking out, expecting imminent attack. And that's the sort of thing that uh, the military is prepared to go to. Now, in the basement where Secretary Rumsfeld and his chiefs are sitting, they're looking at all the intelligence that's available from the CIA. Uh, uh, the Defense Intelligence Agency, etc. Now, what's unfortunate here is that we've obviously had a failure of human intelligence, which, of course, as you heard earlier, has been cut back radically over the years. Now, that failure, of course, is going to hamper our ability to quickly identify, except through forensics, perhaps, who it is that we ought to go after. You've heard about Osama, Osama bin Laden. You've heard about the, the Palestinian leader who spoke. Uh, the markings, though, the symbolism here of striking the Pentagon, striking the World Trade Center, and perhaps striking Camp David if that was the uh, target, that sends a clear message perhaps to those of us that are watching uh, some of what's happening between Palestine and Israel. And having just come back from that part of the world, I will tell you, tensions and you know the dissatisfaction with the U.S. is it the highest I've seen it in three decades. Colonel McGinnis, uh, what dissatisfaction? I mean, what is it that everyone is so ticked off at the U.S. about? Is it the Israeli-Palestinian problem or something uh, deeper, wider, farther, more widespread? Well, well, John, that's part of it. Clearly, we give over $3 billion to Israel every year. The Israelis have been using our modern weapons to kill uh, Palestinian leaders, and ostensibly, they've been going after even some of those that are connected to Palestinian uh, or Hamas leaders in, in Palestine. Now, the other part is, of course, there's dissatisfaction, even according to polls and leaders in Europe, about 
the whole issue of national missile defense, about... Uh, but you're not saying that, that other dissatisfaction no, about no. missile defense would, would lead to someone... It's, uh, someone from northern Europe to, no, uh, to hijack planes no. and attack us, are you? John, John, all the markings are that this is a, a fundamental Islamist uh, circumstance where you have hundreds of Islamic groups, and many of which are very radical, but as some previous guests have indicated, they don't necessarily have the money, they don't have the wherewithal, as you pointed out, John, on 757 flights. You know, it takes the deep pockets of uh, Osama bin Laden and the cooperation perhaps internally within the U.S. of sympathetic organizations that could provide the mechanism. But the security of our, our airports is seriously in jeopardy here because obviously at least four breaches, significant breaches of that security ha have taken place in to okay. enable this to take place. Colonel McGinnis, hang on just a second. I should tell everybody that as we watch these pictures and discuss this and what happened, that President Bush uh, is in the air from off at Air Force Base. Uh, near Omaha and is on his way back to Washington and he will address the nation tonight we do not have an exact time but when the president is okay. back on the ground in Washington okay. he is going to address the nation about today's four terrible terrorist attacks uh, three of which actually uh, struck the targets that they were intended uh, one of them the hijacking that wound up in a crash in Pennsylvania evidently did not uh, get the intended target, although we're not certain what that target might have been. Maybe Camp David, maybe the Capitol, maybe the White House itself. It ended up in Pennsylvania in a crash. Meanwhile, two planes struck World Trade Center. One more struck the Pentagon. We now have to figure out how those planes were hijacked, how they were piloted, who did it, why, and what we do about it as a nation. We are due to have some more information uh, literally in the next couple of minutes uh, from American Airlines and United Airlines, obviously involving those four airliners that were hijacked and all crashed. More than 200 people were aboard those planes. They have all perished. Many more believe dead at the attacks on the World Trade Centers. We will have live reports in just a moment. And I'm John Gibson, along with uh, Linda Vester, as we continue to cover today's ter terrible events. Terrorism hits America, hits it at the World Trade Center. T the both towers hit by hijacked airliners, piloted, one assumes, by the terrorists. There you see the picture this morning from about 9 o'clock. A 757 hitting one of the World Trade Center towers. Those, both of those trade centers later collapsed. Also, one more hijacked airplane struck the Pentagon and one more hijacked evidently did not hit its target and ended up crashing in Pennsylvania. It was thought perhaps it was headed towards Camp David, the presidential retreat in the mountains of Maryland. The President of the United States is in the air. He is on his way back to Washington due to arrive at the White House to join his Vice President, his National Security Advisor, and other top staffers who are in a secure facility inside the White House. He will coordinate with the Secretary of Defense, who is currently in the basement of the Pentagon. We go now to senior correspondent Rita Cosby. She has more late-breaking information from Washington. Rita? Linda, Fox News has learned that American Airlines, which had two of its planes hijacked today, was just fined only two months ago for $99,000 from the FAA for failing to apply appropriate security measures on six of his flights. Now, this is significant because two of those flights departed from Boston's Logan Airport. Today, two flights that were hijacked left from Boston's Logan Airport. One was an American Airlines flight. Another was a United Airlines flight. Now, in the screening, FAI special agents determined last year that American Airlines transported unaccompanied luggage. Also, they failed to check passenger IDs. Remember, unaccompanied luggage is when they were supposed to associate a bag with the particular passenger. They said that they did not do appropriate checks to make sure that uh, bags were associated with a particular passenger. They also failed to ask proper security questions. This is obviously significant because a lot of focus is already on the FAA and also particular airports and airlines as to how these individuals may have gotten on board these planes. The other thing that's significant, we're told that the ground stop, of course all the planes are now grounded domestically in the United States. They're all on the ground at this point. Several of them, international flights, are still flying to the West Coast. We're told just a handful are still in the air.
but there's no word that there are any problems on board those flights. But the ground stop will be effect until noon Eastern time tomorrow at the earliest. It will not be lifted before that. And after that happens, they are saying, the FAA, that there will be indeed many extra security measures in place. And certainly American Airlines and United Airlines will be looked at very heavily. And as Fox News has learned, American Airlines was just recently, just two months ago, fined for failing to apply appropriate security measures, allowing improper passengers on flights, not checking properly, and also with luggage as well. In addition to this, law enforcement sources are telling me that all the focus is still right now is the prime suspect, and again, they stress just a suspect, but all signs they say are still pointing as to Osama bin Laden as most likely being the candidate behind this, him and his group al-Qaeda, which has been behind a number of additional attacks. They are saying that this group, and particularly Osama as the mastermind, are really the only ones that seem to have the specificity, the sophistication, also the coordination to carry out this type of attack. Um, Law enforcement sources are saying no one has claimed responsibility, which is typical of the case when bin Laden's group has been involved in all the prior attacks that they believe he's been responsible for. He has never claimed responsibility, so I believe they're seeing a pattern of sophistication. And they do know that he was training pilots, was training suicide pilots, in addition to other types of suicide bombers, so he certainly had the capability to carry this out. But at this point, nothing is firm, but that's where all signs are pointing towards, according to law enforcement. Rita Cosby in Washington. Rita, thanks very much. Let's go now to James Baker. Uh, former Secretary of State who joins us uh, from Washington, D.C. Mr. Baker, we are looking at the people who survived this thing on the video, but uh, there may be upwards of 10,000 people who did not. It is a huge, huge number. What does the United States of America do? Well, it's a terribly tragic event. Uh, in my view, it takes, it moves us into probably uh, uh, another era, one that we've uh, feared for some time would get here as far as our vulnerability to terrorism is concerned and some of the things that we're going to have to do is to beef up particularly our human intelligence capability so that we're able to penetrate these groups uh, we've let those uh, we've let those slide ever since the mid 70s and somehow we've always been too it's always been a little offensive to us to do the kinds of things you have to do to uh, be a, a clandestine spy and, and penetrate those groups. We're going to have to get back into that messy business. We're going to have to beef up our security measures. It's, I just heard a little bit of your program before you came to me, and, and it's quite remarkable uh, in, my, in my view that these people were able to get on these airplanes, uh, pass through security, get their weapons on there, take control of the airplanes, get into the cockpits, and, uh, and uh, in three out of four cases, uh, fly the planes into the targets they intended to hit. It is amazing. Mr. Baker, uh, I hope I'm not the first one to tell you this. We are going to learn over the next few days many people we know have died in this thing. That's right. No, you're not the first. I'm very aware of, of uh, my, my close friend and Ted Olson's beautiful wife, Barbara, who died in the crash at the Pentagon. Yes. Um, and that's very, very sad to me because, uh, because she was not only a friend and colleague, she was someone with whom I spent uh, a very intense 37 days down in Florida this year. Yes. Uh, look, we, we, we have had other terrorism incidents strike the United States. And, you know, some big numbers of people, dozens, uh, many dozens, hundreds. But this may turn out to be a few thousand. Well, I think it, well, in my opinion, it will. We don't know that yet. We've had, of course, uh, we've had other, uh, other um, strikes at U.S. interests here recently that, were, that created a lot of casualties. The, the bombing of our embassies in Kenya and Tanzania, the bombing of the Kobar barracks in Saudi Arabia. We've never had one like this on the soil of the United States, nor particularly one as, as massive as this. We've always been able to roll up uh, well, other attempts. Well, my question is, let, let's just say hypothetically you could figure out it was Osama bin Laden. Mm -hmm. uh, he is being harbored by the Taliban. He had to have somebody help him train these pilots. Not, and not any old Cessna pilot can go fly a 757. Mm -hmm. They had to somehow spy and figure out how to avoid security. They had to do a lot of things that involved probably a lot of countries. Should we strike a list of countries who were involved? Well, it depends on, on how much uh, direct proof we have of the involvement of the countries. Uh, if, if we have direct proof 
that uh, that these actions were supported by state-sponsored uh, terrorism policies in other countries, then then we may very well we may very well want to do that. A lot would depend on what we find out. I'm, I've always been of the view, quite frankly, as terrorism has begun to build and as the risk to the United States has increased, that we ought to take a hard look at the uh, provision of U.S. law that says we uh, don't, don't assassinate anybody. If we've got somebody out here masterminding an attack that kills 10,000 or 5,000 or 3,000 or whatever it is, innocent Americans in America, and it seems to me that it uh, it calls for rather drastic. You, you would uh, just to put it bluntly, you would target individual leaders if if, if, if you could es establish that they had a connection to to the act of terrorism. If you could establish that they had a, a connection to the to the specific action to the terrorism, you establish that without any question, and you were in a position to deal with it to deal with them uh, in a surgical way so that you're not killing other innocent civilians in the process. James Baker, a former Secretary of State, uh, speaking to us from Washington, D.C. today. Thank you very much. Fox News has just obtained new footage of the collapse of one of the towers of the World Trade Center, as you know. First one commercial airline, then another slammed into those two towers this morning. A short while later, one tower collapsed, then another. This now home footage, home video footage, we want to show you. I live. I hope I live. It's coming down on me. Here it comes. I'm getting behind a car. It's uh, incredible. Okay, I have to go find people who need help. I don't think I'm one of them. You okay, sir? Okay. Can I just get a toot off your respirator? Yeah. Can I get a toot? Okay. I'm seeing a couple of clean breaths. Uh, that's good. Uh, okay. Back to you. It is a terrifying scene, we are told by those who operate the World Trade Center that this morning shortly before 9 a.m. Eastern Time when the first plane slammed in, into one of the towers that the building was at full capacity meaning that somewhere around 50,000 people were inside those two towers we don't know a number yet of how many people were hurt there you see the second plane slamming into the second tower it did not take long for a chain reaction of events including a massive fire inside each tower to occur and then one tower collapsed than the other. Now we know that uh, part of the World Trade Center complex, Building 7, is also on fire at this hour. It is in danger of collapse. We have a correspondent there. We will be checking with him. There is also a tremendous disaster all around Lower Manhattan. 10,000 or more emergency rescue personnel have been brought in. They've been called in. All taxi cabs in New York City have been commandeered to ferry rescue workers down to that area. At the same time, the Navy has dispatched a number of ships to New York Harbor to help with a rescue operation. Hospital emergency rooms around the city and beyond completely in chaos. We are going to go momentarily to a, f a former ambassador to NATO, but before we go to Ambassador Robert Hunter, let me, uh, let me introduce on the phone Kelly Quill, who was an eyewitness to both uh, Kelly Quayle. I'm sorry, Kelly. Coyle. Coyle. Kelly, Kelly Coyle. Uh, you, you saw both planes hit both towers, and you saw both towers come down. Uh, t tell me about it. I went to work this morning. I worked for Solomon Smith Barney, and we're located at 7 World Trade, on, and I'm on the 43rd floor. And we were just sitting there today, and we saw the first plane hit the building. And at that point, I, I really did not know what was going on. I, I, it didn't look like an accident because it looked like it was a direct, you know, it, that they were aiming it right at the World Trade Center. But then there, were, it, there seemed to be like explosions. So people didn't really know. And there was a lot of debris hitting the windows. People panicked, but they, they stayed put. And originally I thought that we stayed put for about five minutes and then, and then the second attack hit. But uh, now I find out that it was actually 18 minutes, so it's 
funny, you know, how time flies. Okay, now, Kelly, uh, plane number one hits, plane number two hits, and then there's a lot of fire. Uh, and Mass hysteria. People running down the stairs, uh, just... Right. To get out. Kelly, I apologize to, for breaking in. Uh, Prime Minister of Israel, Ariel Sharon, now speaking about the terrorist attacks. Let us go there now. Any assistance at any time. The government of Israel has declared a day of mourning tomorrow as we bow our heads and share in the sorrow of the American people. טוב, תודה רבה לכם. All right, it was very brief, but uh, you got the essential message there from Israeli Prime Minister um, Ariel Sharon, excuse me, basically saying it stands, uh, it stands with the United States and in a, in a show of solidarity tomorrow in the state of Israel, there will be a, a national day of mourning. Ambassador Robert Hunter joins us now. He is the former ambassador to NATO. He is now with the Rand Corporation.